consignation support. Then you select the digits. The basic thing, you can select the nasal cannulae. If the patient is not improving the saturation, then the step you can go one step up is the fixed nasal mask, very tight fixed nasal mask. Here you are going to give, you can give the rate around from five to 10 liters per minute oxygen with the oxygen saturation or concentration is around 60, 50, 60 percentage of oxygen concentration. If you are unable to maintain the saturation, then you go up one step up, you call the non-rebreathing face mask. Here you can uh, give the oxygen concentration is around 90, 95%. The rate you give usually 10 to 15 liters per minute. Before you are connecting this non-rebreathing face mask, you have to inflate the reservoir before with the oxygen, then you connect it to the patient. Okay, by these are the few um, methods or gadgets you are using for breathing difficulty, breathing difficulties to oxygenate the patient if their oxygen saturation is below 95 in air. Sorry, I got stuck to moving the slides. Okay, here the next slide shows you how you are going to uh, deliver the oxygen while uh, wearing your surgical mask. You can apply the face mask over the surgical mask or you can apply the uh, surgical mask or the face mask here by using the non breathing uh, bags or just face mask oxygenation, right? Especially these slides show you managing the COVID patients. Sorry, again, I have got struck to share my slides. Okay, here, how are you delivering the oxygen in a newborn babies? Here, you can see uh, you might get some exposure by this, uh, we call the neopuffs. This is again the TP's resuscitator, we are delivering the oxygen uh, through the neopause and uh, in especially newborn babies. Here, what, uh, how you are supporting the babies here is... You Excuse me, madam. Sorry. Slide share with our name, madam. Okay. Is it okay now? No, madam. Yeah. Okay. Now okay, madam. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here you can see. Uh, how you are oxygenating the newborn babies or smaller child. Uh, this is, we call the TP's resuscitator. This is uh, having some advantages than the self-inflating ambu bags here. 
you are setting up the inspiratory and expiratory pressure and uh, you are not over inflating or damaging the lungs here there is a knob and face mask you just using by using the knobs you can deliver the threads here these are the cpap support here bipap and cpap supports uh, you can give oxygenation in breathing difficulties okay uh, back to our uh, these equipments we are using in the airway management airway and breathing management the how you are giving ventilation or breathing support to the children here you can see the different sizes of self inflating we call them the bags and according to the weight you are selecting these bags especially in newborn babies we are using 200 250 ml of ambu bags in all the child around 500 600 ml volume in adults we are using around 1000 2000 ml volume ambu bags here these ambu bags are fixed to the appropriate size face mask and there is always keep the reservoir bag by using reservoir bags you are giving the uh, high concentration oxygen here the other advantage is once you remove the mask you can connect these sample bags to the et tubes or tracheostomy tubes by giving the ventilation here this is a you call the gadget tps uh, pediatric uh, resuscitator here the mainly the uh, pediatric anesthesia they are using this gadget here uh, in ambu bags you have a special valve to exhale the carbon dioxide and the pressure if you are exhaling the pressure there is a pop off valve to support here the disadvantage is we don't have a carbon dioxide uh, exhaled um, escape uh, place here so but there is a, this is the um, uh, oxygen connection tubes and some extending tube connected to the bags here there is a small hole here you can occlude when you are giving the press here but you can slowly uh, open up this uh, side and you can exhale then and there the carbon dioxide here here the tp is resuscitated here when you are comparing the ambu bag the self inflating with the tp you can give high concentration oxygen by using the tp resuscitator uh, when you are handling ventilation in children here you have to um, maintain a good seal when you are giving ventilation when you are ambuing mostly you are giving half of the volume into the um, uh, ventilating the child so the uh, concentration here comparing the ambu and the tp resuscitator tp resuscitator is better around 100% you can give the oxygen concentration okay uh, as we see first slide when you are giving ambu ventilation always you have to maintain a good seal to give a appropriate uh, oxygenation so you are connecting your ambu or tp resuscitator with the face mask then the selecting the correct size of face mask is very important to seal a uh, good seal you are you should not touch uh, damage the eye so that not extend beyond the chin and giving a good seal and tight seal to cover the nose and mouth Uh, how you are going to place the face mask and the self inflating bag to this child here we use the c and e method here you should cover as we mentioned earlier you should cover the mouth and nose and then you have to um, keep your thumb and index finger to maintain a good seal and other two fingers to lift the chin and open up the airway don't give a pressure over the soft tissue okay always 
when you are giving uh, ambu ventilation, how you should check whether your ventilation is effective or not. When you, one person is handling with the ambu wing and the sealing, uh, correct sealing is very difficult. So one person is doing the by-handed your thrust and the other person is giving the ambu wing that is easier and more effective. Always see the chest rising, then you are giving a good uh, ventilation. So if you are unable to maintain the oxygenation by giving the basic uh, skills or basic measures, giving the ambuing or applying some airway supports and using the adjuncts and giving the ambu ventilation. If the ventilation is not picking up, then you might need to, uh, you need to think about whether the, uh, the child need intubation. Next step. So uh, how you are going to prepare for intubation? Always you need a good team for the intubation, minimum four members. That's a team leader, the experienced person. Then the one nursing staff is responsible for making appropriate drugs and IV access. Then the nursing staff is res take responsible for appropriate equipments and adequate equipments and fun with the functioning or not. And one running person. These are the steps you need to think when you are planning for intubation here, the pre-oxygenate the child before intubation and whether the child needs required pressure when you are intubating and uh, some drugs uh, and the equipments already in advance you should make uh, ready and uh, the person, if there is an experienced person is there in an emergency always uh, field person handling the intubation is better. Then the applying cricoid pressure is not very clear, but if you are practicing, if you are familiarized, you can use that. Okay, how you are pre-oxygenating the child? Give a high concentration oxygen and uh, by giving the ambu ventilation, good sealing quickly you can oxygenate the child and uh, after oxygenating the child then all these your equipments and everything get ready for intubation as i mentioned what are the drugs you need to consider for supporting intubation here the, the sorry the sedative drugs okay the drugs the sedative drugs or any induction agents, muscle relaxants. Uh, not always, sometimes you need, if a very unconscious child, you can straight away go for intubation. If the child is having some spontaneous breathing and struggling, you need to think about uh, giving these uh, muscle relaxants and induction agents. And uh, if the child is uh, in cardiac arrest or in a shock stage, you have to keep the drugs ready for resuscitation. Adrenaline or normal cell lines if necessary, always keep all these drugs ready. And equipments in advance, check uh, the blade straight, blades, laryngoscope, as we discussed, the, the smaller newborn and children having some anatomical differences, we are using the straight blade for easy intubation. Uh, and in older child, we are using the curved uh, blades, laryngoscopes. Here, the ET tubes, different sizes, puffed and uncuffed ET tubes, and the suckers get ready. And to monitor, um, always keep the pulse oximeter ready to uh, support. The, when selecting the endotracheal tubes, these are the formulas we are using. The uncuffed tubes, the ET size is H divided by 4 plus 4. The cuff tubes, we are H divided by 4 plus 3.5. Mainly we are using in children uncuffed tubes if you are suspecting any aspiration to support the aspiration situations, you are using the cuff tubes. Commonly in a term well grown baby, good weight, we use 3.5 mm ET tubes. In a infants, we usually Select the four millimeter into tubes. Always you need to check whether the lip level 
they are so another formula right the it length how much you are going to insert into the child that is age divided by 12, 2 plus 12 uh, or a tube size right length okay this slide shows you how you are going to intubate a child here whenever uh, whether you are a right handed or left handed always keep the uh, your laryngoscope in your left hand because the groove inserting the ET tube is your right side. You lift, uh, always apply from the right side corner of the mouth and lift the tongue and you visualize it, right? And then rather than rotatory movements, you are lifting, right? Lifting the lower jaw and visualize the uh, pharynx here. Uh, as we discussed in children, their epiglottis is very floppy and blocky. So you are inserting a straight blade below the epiglottis and lift here and you can visualize the vocal cords clearly. In an older child or adults, we are using the curved blade. Here you are placing the tip of the blade into the valiculate and lift it and see the pharynx, visualize the pharynx. Once you lift it, uh, nicely you can see the v-shaped vocal cords once you see the vocal cords you keep ready your et tube apply some gel lubricate it and quickly insert the et tube that's a groove in your laryngoscope blade through that you uh, just uh, lateral to that you quickly insert it and once you are Place the length is correct, the lip level. You quickly remove your laryngoscope and um, plaster it and secure the tubes. After your intubation, you should make sure whether you are correctly intubated or not. How are you going to correct it after inserting the tube? Uh, um, you can auscultate and see whether the yeah, entry is good, not in the stomach, or that is in the both axillae. You AI entry if the AI entry is good, if the child is smoothly breathing and saturation picking up, heart rate picking up, and you can assume you are correctly intubating the child. And uh, you can check the carbon dioxide monitoring device whether the child is exhaling the carbon dioxide and make sure there are no leak in the uncapped tubes and secure the tube is very important because in an emergency you should make sure after appropriate incubation length take the length and you plaster it very nicely then uh, you can make sure by doing a chest x-ray after incubation uh, as we mentioned that pre-oxygenating child when are you going to consider pre-oxygenating before and after incubation quickly because you should not allow the child hypoxic always Think about the oxygen saturation, maintain about 95 and quickly oxygenate. If there is a failed incubation, you have to go back, pre oxygenate, and then you go for an intubation. Okay, nasal intubation. This slide shows you how you are going to handle the nasal intubation. Okay, if there is a failed intubation, again go back and uh, pre oxygenate with the bag and mass ventilation and uh, you if you need help better call for help and get an experienced person to come and support you and consider there are other airway adjuncts you can alternatively uh, try when you are in a situation unable to intubate we are going to discuss uh, applying laryngeal mask airway uh, or you can consider to using an introducer with the ET tube uh, to facilitate your intubation. Finally, the surgical airway if you fail the intubation. This algorithm, you can see, these are designed mainly to prepare uh, to take some decision when you are dealing a difficult situations. You can be anticipated. Only these pathways are considered to facilitate you, right, when you are handling the situation. This is what we discussed so far. We have nicely placed here. 
the rapid sequence induction and you can direct laryngoscopy and intubation. If you are succeeded, continue your ventilation. If you are failed, call for help. And if you could able to manually ventilate the child, you continue pre oxygenation. Then, if you are unable to ventilate, then think about pre intubation or laryngeal mask ventilation. Or finally, if you fail, uh, surgical airway. Okay, this uh, vortex. Yeah, here, this is uh, the philosophy here is to train the staff to skill in airway management and how we are, if we fail in one situation, how are you going to handle right from the green zone, then the blue zone and the top arm, uh, sorry, bottom, you are thinking about the surgical airway, right? Here, the green zone safe, then you are considering the non-surgical airway management by face mask and using adjuncts and ventilation support. In endotracheal intubation and ventilation support, if these are failing, finally, the, you think about the surgical airway. How you are going to uh, insert a laryngeal mask? Next few slides we will see. Here, you are having a tip here. First, you deflate the tip and apply some gel here in the back of this area. Here, then you quickly push the slide down slowly. Here, this uh, show you with the support of your finger, you are pushing posteriorly and nicely you feel a resistance. Then with the finger support, you have to push down quickly and place it in the uh, pharynx or larynx, right? That is supporting the, uh, if you are unable to intubate, you can consider to insert a laryngeal airway mask. Here are some gadgets you are using in a uh, uh, situation with the video, laryngoscopes and supporting for the failed intubation situation. And finally, uh, you go for a surgical airway if you are unable to maintain the oxygenation, check your stomach and connect to the uh, self-inflating bag and oxygenate the child here. Uh, that is the end of this uh, airway breathing management uh, lecture here. In summary, as you know here, the, this is the initial step in managing pediatric emergencies. We need to uh, be very uh, familiar with that and practice the basic skills. And uh, if in, during internship, you can learn more in uh, practicing these basic skills bag and mask ventilation and uh, how to select the mask and tubes and then if you need help don't hesitate to call for help always call for help uh, when you are managing in emergencies you need a team rather than managing alone so if a failed intubation what is your backup plan the laryngeal mask airway or surgical airway if uh, don't afraid as you need ventilate the Child, right, and always check whether your intubation, ventilation, or airway breathing management is supporting effectiveness by checking the oxygenation of the child. That is the end of the lecture. Um, thank you. The next lecture will be by Dr. Brinda. He is going to discuss with you regarding the cardiac arrest. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Pradeep is going to do uh, the cardiac arrest le uh, next lecture.
Hello. Yeah. May. Good morning. Uh, I'm Pradeepa, uh, one of the intensivists uh, in LRH. Uh, because of the poor connection, I want to, I'm going to keep my video off, otherwise I may not be able to do this one. So this, this one is regarding the cardiac arrest. We will be discussing about the shockable and the non-shockable rhythm as well. So if you have any questions, just put in the chat box and at the end of the lecture, we will answer. Hello? Hello? Can you see the uh, slides now? Yes, sir. Can see it. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. So. Okay. So what we have gone through up to now is that, that you are you have covered the basic life support. And uh, next that we uh, have covered the AI skills as well. Now we are coming to the point that we are going to do the cardiac arrest in general so that you are you will be in a, a hospital setup the most of the time that you have to do the uh, advanced life support rather than the basic life support and uh, which will be basically divided into shockable and the non-shockable rhythm. So we'll be looking at into it's what are the shockable rhythms and what are the non-shockable rhythms and uh, how what is the algorithm to it and how are we going to handle and briefly we are discussing about what what you will do in a covid situation so this is a algorithm which says that whenever the child who is found to be collapsed or that child is not breathing and not having a heart rate that we will be going into the arrest pathway or the arrest algorithm so where you will be have to decide which pathway I'm on, whether it's a shockable rhythm or a non-shockable rhythm. And in current context that we need to make sure that we are doing all the precautions, especially wearing the PPE and all the personal protections to make sure that we are, we will be protect ourselves. Meanwhile, we are resuscitating the child. So we'll be looking at one by one. So first we will look at that, the non-shockable rhythm pathway. So when a child who is arrested, then you will have to, you will be having a non-shockable rhythm means that what are the non-shockable rhythm we have is either asystole, what is asystole? That means a flat line or the pulses electrical activity where you will see the typical ECG pattern on the screen. But when you see the pulse, there is no pulse and no proper heart. So in that situation, first priority is that you're going to start the CPR. Okay. So quickly check the pulse and then you have to start the CPR. Okay. So check for the pulse, no pulse, no breathing. So you start the CPR. Okay. The questions that we probe already have gone through in the system so that we are to check the pulse. If the bigger kid that you will check the carotid pulse, if the infants there or a neonates that you need to check the pulse in the brachial artery or the femoral artery, femoral artery rather than going for this one. And meanwhile, you are checking to make, make sure that you're opening the airway and see when the child is responding. And meanwhile, you see when the child is breathing as well. Look, listen and feel whether any signs of respiration. In the absence of respiration, in the absence of the heart rate or a pulse, you need to start the chest compression. So how are you going to do the chest compression? So from the previous lecture, you know that how to give the breaths. So here that you need to give the two breaths. But how are you going to do the chest compression and where are to place the hand? So place the hand in the middle of the chest, the lower part of the sternum, lower one third of the sternum. And you need to push at least one third and make sure that you need to relax adequately that you have already learned from the previous lecture 
and make sure you keep the elbow straight. And we need to get to achieve about 100 compressions per minute. So you need to make sure that you are giving at the rate to achieve at least that rate. Okay. So if you give 15 is to two, so if you go in a cycles, you read up to about five cycles, five to six cycles, or even yeah, six to seven cycles to reach at to that particular date. Okay. So what are the techniques you will do? So you can do the single-handed technique or you can do the double-handed technique. But especially in a bigger kit is usually you will prefer to get into the double-handed technique with a straight elbow. That will give you a good chest compression. So you start at the chest compressions. What do you need to do now? So first priority, you start the CPR. So you have to start the CPR with you are give, given the breaths and also we are giving uh, chest compression now. While that CPR going on, what are the things we need to do? So we need to know that what's the next thing is that we need to know what's the underlying rhythm is. So to find out the rhythm, you need to connect to the monitor. So usually we have a monitor in the, uh, the defibrillator monitor in the board setups so that we will connect the defibrillator monitor to that so that we can identify what the, uh, what's the rhythm underlying. So you connect to the monitor and select the leads and to make sure that you increase the gain so that you can see the ECG pattern. So what is gain means that you increase the size of the ECG. Next, what you do is to, you now have to stop the CPR for briefly for the 10 seconds and to identify the rhythm. So you can see in the screen, what is there is the flat line. If you see the flat line, that means the child is in the AC storm. So sooner you notice that the child is, has no electrical activity and the no pulse, immediately you have to restart the CPR and ask them to continue in a 15 is to two ratio, 15 chest compression to two breaths ratio to continue the CPR. So while continuing the CPR, now you need to make sure you need to get a, establish the IV access. Most of the time, the, pa the, pa the patients may not be having IV access. Okay, so you get ready with the IV access, get if, if possible, get an IV cannula. So if you don't waste your time, to get the IV cannula so many times. If you can't get it, go for an intraosseous line. So whatever the way, if you are, if you could get an access, check the blood sugar, check the, check the blood gases, and also do the serum electrolytes and uh, to see, to identify the cause. Meanwhile, ask the nurses to prepare the adrenaline. That is one in 10,000 dilution. And we, we are going to, Give it as a dose is 0.1 ml per kg and with the flush. So adrenaline boluses need to be prepared. So that comes to equivalent to one mics per kg, 10 mics per kg of adrenaline. So now you by usually in the setups that you it will take about two minutes or even longer. But if you could able to do that, so you can. You, you confirm the ACE stall for the rhythm check. So by the end of the two minutes, you post the CPR and confirm that is is ACE stall and immediately restart the CPR. And what we are going to do it now is that you are going to do the, give the adrenaline as soon as possible. You already have IV access, you can give it earlier, but if you don't know the rhythm, then wait for the two minutes to do it. So now you have given the adrenaline and always make sure you are giving a good flush following the adrenaline bolus because it need to go into the circulation effectively. Meanwhile, now you have restarted the CPR during the second two minutes window, you need to make sure you are assessing for the 4Hs and the 40s. So main thing is you need to assess is that whether that you are ventilating properly, whether the 
bag is connected to the oxygen, whether you are giving adequate oxygen to the patient, and are you getting any saturation reading? It's in an as an error setup, you may not be able to get the exact saturation reading, but you need to make sure you are giving adequate oxygenation. And how how do you confirm that? You need to make sure that you are connected to the patient. And meanwhile, you need the oxygen is adequately open and also the chest is, you are with the breath, you are achieving an adequate chest expansion. And meanwhile, you don't know that whether the child is hypovolemic, so you need to give a tolus of 20 ml per kg of fluid and also make sure that the temperature is normal. If the child is very cold, that you need to make sure that you are warming up the child to the normal temperature. Right. So, and the hyperkalemia and the, the, all the electrolyte ab abnormalities, you can look it into your blood gas reports. And the T's, main two T's that you can address in the, even though it's a four T's, so the main two T's that you can address in the bedside is pneumothorax. So listen to the chest, yeah, whether it's a AI entry is equal, anything suggestive of the pneumothorax. And also you can, check whether you can, if any suspicions of the pericardial effusion, you can drain it, but it's very difficult in an outside of an ICU setup because that you need, you need to have an ultrasound scan in the bedside to check whether it's a pericardial effusion. So pause for the rhythm check at the two minutes. So, so that if you see any electrical activity, what you have to do, so that doesn't mean child is having a, so that's what you see in the screen is a normal electrical activity. That's sinus rhythm. But that doesn't mean child is having a cardiac output. So in that instance, what that rhythm is called as pulseless, pulseless electrical activity. So if we have a normal sinus rhythm in the ECG leads, but you can't feel the pulse. Then again, what you have to do? You have to restart the CPR again in this situation. So restart the CPR. And in that situation, again, the pathway is same. You need to make sure that you have an IV access and administer the adrenaline, one in 100,000, 0.1 ml per kg. That is equivalent to the dose of 10 micrograms per kg of dose, followed by the flush. And make sure you are continuing the uninterrupted CPR two minutes. Only reason you are going to stop the CPR is for the rhythm check Okay, in the non-shockable pathway. Okay, so every time you are, you are continuing the CPR, meanwhile, you are stopping every two minutes to assess the rhythm and every second cycle, that means every four minutes, you are going to give the adrenaline if the child's pulse is not back. Okay. Meanwhile, if you have an operator, the, the competent operator is there, could intubate. So you can use, go for an intubation. Or if you have, if you don't have anybody who can intubate, just maintain the airway, either means of uh, or a pharyngeal airway, or a laryngeal mask airway is available, you can use that. But remember, you don't need to intubate a child who is having a cardiac arrest, unless if you are really, really comfortable enough to do it, because the aim is here to oxygenate the child. As long as your airway is open, you can keep the child, may ventilate. Meanwhile, you can continue the CPR. So don't get panic, you can't intubate. So it's just a matter of maintaining the airway until the senior person coming to the role and doing an intubation. So maintain the airway, make sure adequate chest expansion, don't get panic because you can't intubate, okay? And other thing is that consider intraosseous, okay? So if don't waste your time to IV access to delay the adrenaline dose, so sooner you get the IV, uh, IV access, you can give the adrenaline dose. So again, so you continue the CPR, Every two minutes, do the rhythm check. Once you see the rhythm, if it is sinus, you check the pulse, pulse also present, then you stop the CPR. And put the person 
patient into the recovery position and continue the monitoring and you might have to talk to the ICU and to transfer this child to the ICU as well. So we see info notified early. So this is that what we have to do is that make sure that you dedicate a person to do the rocks and that person have make sure every second cycle, that means every four minutes that you have to repeat the adrenaline. So because it's the situation is going to be really chaotic, that's like really difficult to see that like people are like people may be going everywhere. So it's easy to forget. So it's a team allocation is really important so that the one person will remember, okay, this is the time to give that money because as the resuscitation goes, things go, things will go unnoticed. So this is a summary of a non shockable rhythm. So non shockable rhythms are pulses, electrical activity and AC store. And you have a, the if you have a, a flat line that is called AC store, if you have a normal ECG pattern, but there is no pulse that is called as pulses electrical activity. And what you have to do is that you have to give the adrenaline and every second cycle you have to continue. Meanwhile, you have to assess the OHS and the phones. So that's moving to the shockable rhythm. So this is a defibrillator. So in general that you have a different, different defibrillators, but the principle is the same. They have a monitor. So that can be that, that monitor will uh, display the ECG pattern. And uh, that usually we, we can select the leads, but why, what the leads that we have to usually select is the lead two. And uh, the rest of the things, like if you need to shop that you can select there for the juice, the amount we need to do. So each and every machine have number one, number two, and number three. So one is stands for the on of the machine, like machine switching on the machine, and then you can select the leads and stuff. And number two is essentially for the amount of energy you can select. And the number three is to charge. And then there is a separate button to deliver the shock. Okay, so we will coming to this one by one. Okay, so when you assess the rhythm in your ECG, so when you are going to assess the rhythm, so if the patient is collapsed, then that you make sure that there is no breathing and there is no rest, no uh, heart, so that you have you have started the CPR. And while giving a CPR, you are going for a rhythm check. So while doing that rhythm check, if you see a ventricular fibrillation or a pulses VT, then that's most like more that is going to the shockable pathway. Okay. So usual dose of shock is four joules per kg. So for example, if a 10 kilo child, you are going to give a 40 joules of energy as a shock to this child, right? So you continue the CPR and we will look into how we are, what is the standard precautions we have to have in the child who is we are going to deliver the shock, how we can make sure we deliver a shock in a safe way. So no breathing, no pulse. The patient's now receiving a CPR. And now we are doing a chest compression. That's for the recap that we are doing a chest compression. So that like effective chest compression is to achieve the 100 beats per minute at least. So that you need to give at least one third to have to go in. And you need to give adequate relaxation. So that's the time that the coronaries will be perfused. So now you are attached to the defibrillator while the CPR continuing and you have, you are on the monitor and you have selected the lead. Okay. What's the lead that you are selecting is lead two and increase the size so that you can see what's is going on. So don't jump into the conclusion 
if you see this pattern of ecg in the screen while you are connecting because you are not stop the cpr to assess because when you are doing a cpr also you will see the ecg pattern exactly same as like this sometime but that doesn't mean actually this is in the vf okay so you need to stop the cpr to assess so first you connect it second that you need to make sure that you are select the leads and also you need to make sure you are selecting the energy as per child's weight okay if you don't have the weight calculate the weight as per the apls recommendations and or if you have a previous value of the weight the known weight go with that weight okay so ideal weight calculate that go for ideal weight or if you have a known weight go for a known weight and you will set it for the closer value so if you say that if you got the 40 joules as a calculated value the closest value in the machine is 50 you will go for a upper limit upper margin that is you go for a 50 instead of the lower one if it is a lower one is 20 and the upper one is 50 you will select the 50 instead of uh, selecting the lower energy so now you have to pose the chest compression to identify the rhythm now you can see in the screen there is a fibrillatory waves white complexes going on so that is clearly a ventricular fibrillation right so if you see the ventricular fibrillation you already know a patient is not having a pulse you can check if you want but most of the time if you see the wave like this unlikely you have a pulse but as a routine always when you're shocking stopping for the chest stopping the chest compression check the pulse look at the monitor and see what the rhythm is so this is ventricular fibrillation so immediately the your command will be recommends the cpr in 15 is to 2 so two breaths and 15 chest compression and now you have to deliver the shock so make sure you are going to do it in a safe way so while the person who is continuing the cpr you need to make sure the energy select is correct okay so energy select is there and the next thing is you need to charge so make sure that you have have the paddles and take applying gel keep it separate don't bring it close make sure off oxygen and everybody stands clear and we are pressing a charge button so once you press the charge button that is in number two it's yellow so if you press that button and you will hear a beep sound so once that means that is charged okay so after that what you do is you do the safety check again so make sure that oxygen is off everybody is clear and you do the safety check again okay and now you have charged now it's time to deliver so deliver the shock so what's the things that we used to have uh, as a So what's the things that we need to have as for, like we used to have a standard safety check. So head to head to toe, what you do is that off oxygen, head clear, middle clear, legs clear, off oxygen, I am clear and others clear. So that's have to come so that tick all the boxes so everybody is safe, okay? Head clear, middle clear, legs clear, off oxygen, I am clear, others clear. That comes as a loud command before you are delivering the shock. So now you have delivered the shock. So you have to immediately recommence the CPR. So what is in the non shockable pathway is essentially you need to, sorry, shockable rhythm is. After the shock, you need to continue the CPR, but with the second shock, you are going to give the adrenaline bolus. Okay. So make sure for that you need to have IV access. So you get IV access, you get the investigation, check the blood sugar, check the electrolytes. If you have a blood gas, do the blood gas. And also you send other investigations as possible. 
Meanwhile, you prepare the adrenaline and next rhythm check. So with the next rhythm check, if you have the poster chest compression and check the pulse and the rhythm, if the rhythm is still VF, then you have to deliver the shock again. So prepare for the shock. So we come into CPR while you are preparing the shock for gain. So again, we have to go through the same steps. So make sure that the lead is two and also that views are select, uh, selected is correct. And uh, so your safety check. So safety check number one. So head clear, middle clear, legs clear, off oxygen, I am clear, others clear, charge. So you are charging now. So now you get a beep sound. So now you have to de de deliver the shock. So before delivering the shock, again, the second safety check you do, what you do is, okay, again, head clear, middle clear, legs clear, I am clear, others clear, and off oxygen, I am delivering the shock. So shock delivered, and immediately what you have to do, restart the CPR, okay? So we have restart the CPR. Now we have given a second shock. According to our algorithm, we need to give the adrenaline bolus, okay? So now we have given the adrenaline, then what you have to do is meanwhile, you have to check for 4Hs and 4Ts, okay? Hypoxia, make sure the oxygen is connected. Hypovolemia, you give some boluses and all the fluid bolus and also hypothermia, it is a hypothermia, check the electrolytes, whether it's a hyperkalemia, which is causing it. And also whether it's a tension pneumothorax and also consider the tamponade as a, one of your differential diagnosis. And meanwhile, while the resuscitation, if you have a safe operator is there, you can always go for an intubation. Okay. Once with the third shock, what you have to do, you need to give the amir drone as well. So then you have to continue the CPR every second minute that you are checking the uh, rhythm. If the rhythm is still a shockable rhythm, you deliver the shock and every second cycle, you'll have to continue the adrenaline. Okay. So most of the time you have a one of the senior with you when you are doing this one so that, but everybody will be anxious and really a panic environment. So make sure that you are going in a structured way. So it's worth having a thing posted or like printed algorithms for the shockable and the non-shockable rhythm in your emergency area. So main aim in the shockable rhythm is to uninterrupted CPR only. We are we allowed to stop the CPR in two instances. One is to deliver the shock or a charging, otherwise for the rhythm check. So I made on third after the third uh, third shock that we already discussed. So this is the summary of the rhythm, the shockable rhythm, and uh, you deliver the shock, and then you have. Uh, with the second shock, you are delivering adrenaline. With third shock, you are delivering the amine drone. Every second loop, you are continuing the adrenaline. If the child has the returns of spontaneous circulation, you need to put on a recovery position and continue the post-resuscitation here. So now, that the because of the COVID environment, we need to make sure that the CPR is given without a delay, but make sure you are protecting yourself because it's an aerosol generating procedure. So make sure you are wearing a PPE and uh, consider intubation if possible as early. And, uh, and uh, they might have the other issues. So mainly that all these secretions well is going to be everywhere. So make sure that every person in your team will be having this uh, PPE. And every time you are disconnecting the circuit, make sure you are switch off the oxygen and then disconnect rather than while having a flow and you are disconnecting. So for example, if your ET tube is connected to the patient with the oxygen and you are bagging, and when you are stop and disconnecting, what you have to do is you have to make sure you are stopping oxygen and disconnecting. And when you are reconnecting it, Connect it first with the bag, with the ET tube, and then start the oxygen. But when you are doing it practical, practically, it is really important that, that somebody have to actively look into those things when you're doing it, 
right? So, but I'm sure that everybody have a separate protocol for the COVID patients at these days. So again, after the, the post, uh, after the management is definitely needed a post resuscitation care. So you need to look into that. So make sure that airway, breathing, circulation, and everything to be monitored. So this child ideally have to be monitored in an ICU setup. So that concludes the election. So any questions? So, so the two questions from the screen is, uh, number one is that uh, the, there was a previous question which is asking why it's lead two, that because that lead two is a common lead that we can identify more, most of the electrical changes so that if your lead two is abnormal is most of the time you will be seeing there. So any, most of the changes you can see there. So that's what is the standard. We are universally using a lead to. Number two, the question is, why is the role of adrenaline here? So the que question is good because that is, because the heart is not working. You are the one is actually pumping, but the unit, it's basically adrenaline for the peripheral ac action. So it's adrenaline is going to, get at least some constrictions to that uh, the vessels so that it's for the vascular tone so that you can deliver some blood, at least some blood to the perfusing organ, right? But if at all the heart starts sensing it, it will stimulate the heart's chronotropy so it can improve the heart rate. So worth giving a chance so that you can, if the heart is all sensitive, then it's like start working so with the Adrenaline push, it can start working back again, or it can be the peripheral vasoconstrictor. Okay, so nowadays there are studies going for a vasopressin in uh, resuscitation as well, but there is no, there is we haven't changed any with that algorithm yet, so we have to follow this one. Next one is the other question was basically that we have asked for the, uh, when we have to, do we have to stop for the charging? It depends on what sort of a defibrillator you are using. What, most of the time we have a pads rather than the, the pedals rather than the pads. So it's very difficult is uh, to see that whether we need to, uh, whether we have to stop the CPR for that. So. I, in our setup, I would recommend to stop for the charging as well because it's brief, because uh, it's what is matters is safe. Because the people tend to, what they have to do is that sometimes they keep the pedals close together so that can spark as well. So always make sure that in our setup, we are stopping for the charging as well. But in an ideal setup, if you have a pedals connected, then you, you don't need to stop for it because you can even uh, while the resuscitation going on, you can just charge it. You can only stop for a uh, shock only. So in an ideal setup that it is, you need to stop for a defibrillation and all for the rhythm check. But in our setup, we, will re we are still recommending to stop for the charging as well. For the other question was that uh, the, the, what are the ways for the intraos is? I think that usually the common sites are that the tubular tuberosity just about one to two centimeters below the tubular tuberosity medially that you can use it. If you don't have a proper intraosseous needle, you can use the large bore needle, but we use it for the blood donation purposes. That's a big needle. So you can use it as well. And the adenosine, there is no place in a cardiac arrest. So unless the, the Amio drone, you can use it because that's a rhythm controller, but the adenosine, there is no place in the cardiac arrest. Again, even the atropine, there is no clear place for that one as well. Okay. The de decision to continue the amiodrone is depends on your response and how re refractory your 
the shocks are for that the, the ventricular fibrillation, but it's very difficult to comment on that part because it's the if the patient is not responding to the shock means it's very unlikely that patient is going to respond to your uh, MA drone. So, but anyway, worth having a ch uh, ch chance. So that's what we are giving one dose. But you can start an amiodron infusion. It is really, really uh, resistant. But chances of that is working is really, really uh, low. Is correct to auscultate for a heart sound instead of the pulse? It's very difficult in a very chaotic situation. So the presence of heart doesn't mean that you have a adequate perfusion. So if you have a very poor perfusion circulationally, then if you can't feel the carotid pulse, for the benefit of the doubt, if you are in doubt that you definitely start the CPR, and once you get the proper uh, rhythm that you have, you can stop it after that. It's worth starting a CPR rather than not starting it because it's a uh, it's a life saving thing. So how to check an ARV in a COVID positive child? The ARV checking is same. The main thing is that you need to make sure that you are wearing your base personal protective equipments. Okay. Can we defibrillate as it shows when no seniors around? Things there is nobody is near, so it's there is it's as a house officers you should be competent enough to do the defibrillation. But don't worry, most of the time at least one senior is available around you. So to the main thing is continue the CPR so that you are perfusing the organs, so that even if you can't really do the defibrillation if you are not comfortable with that you can wait for the seniors but the as a house officer what we did was that we or like the most of our parallel batch means and all the people what we do is we will learn how to defibrillate so rather than depending on your seniors these are the mandatory skills to develop so make sure you are competent enough to using it rather than depending on the senior for these things so there are major decisions you can depend on there, but this sort of situation, it always get familiar with the machines, get familiar in the models or mannequins, how to give the shocks. So when the real setups comes, you should be able to. I would say you don't need to intubate a patient, but if you are, if it is a shockable rhythm, giving a shock will be life-saving. So I don't delay the shock until the senior is coming. So because that senior can guide over the phone if they are far, far away. So you can still believe that I think that uh, any doctor is even uh, is competent enough to deliver the shocks. Don't get panic. If you have to give the shock, make sure the rhythm is a shockable rhythm. Don't give a shock for the asystole. But if the patient is in a shockable rhythm, definitely don't delay the shock. Okay, so that concludes the session. So this will be a slow, small 10, 10 minutes break. So we'll be back at uh, 10.30. Any other questions? There are a few questions, Dr. Uh, there's one is, uh, what is the maximum number of adrenaline doses you can give during the resuscitation? There is one. Yeah. Yeah. So there are the there is no limitation for the number of uh, uh, adrenaline doses because that it's a matter of how long you are continuing the CPR. It depends on the underlying reason why you are having a cardiac arrest as well, right? So always continue give the C, uh, adrenaline every second cycle, right? And uh, the main thing is if your reason for the CPR is for example, if you're having a child who is having a drowning and have now on a cardiac arrest, one until you normalize the temperature, you're not sure this heart is going to come back or not. So you need to continue CPR in a longer time for those instances so that you need to give more adrenaline doses in that situation. So it's, there is no limit. And the question is how long you can do the CPR 
So in general, it says that you can continue up to 20 minutes, but there are instances you have to continue the CPR longer if there is a correctable causes. So especially in the instances of if you have a, a really a hypothermic child, until you normalize the temperature, you, are, you can't really call it as this patient is not going to recover. So that you need to do all the things to make sure that you are normalizing a temperature while you are at least to, uh, have a reasonable temperature only, you can go, uh, you can safely say this child's heart is not going back. So duration is generally will have a, but it's very difficult to say it is uh, as, a, as a general recommendation for all. Right. Next question is, is it correct to auscultate for heart sound instead of pulse? I think the recommendation is pulse rather than auscultate. You can auscultate for the heart, but it why, what if that if you have a like sometimes that if you have a like a pericardial effusion, so you very have a very muffled heart sounds. So it's you don't you may not be hear it, but that doesn't mean the child is not having an adequate cardiac output. So if you can't feel the pulse, I would recommend to go for a pulse check rather than the heart. You can check the heart, but if you don't have a proper pulse, that if the child is not if a, in a collapsed child, I would bid for a starting a chest compression rather than waiting. Right? They may be having a small heartbeat, like a one or like a around 10 to 20, but it's not effective enough to produce the cardiac output. So aim is to maintain the cardiac output here. So why we need to maintain the cardiac output? Perfuse because that window we need to make sure the organs are perfused at least to minimize the hypoxic damage. So that the better thing is to start the CPR. If you can't feel the pulse, if you check the pulse appropriately. But if you can't, for the benefit of the doubt, the recommendation is to start the CPR rather than we're waiting. Okay. Right. Okay. Next question is, what is the pediatric dose for amiodarone? Amiodarone is that uh, 5 milligrams per kg. So it is, uh, as for, that is in the, uh, our, protocol as well. It's here that with the algorithm also that you can see that it says the dose. So you don't need to memorize the dose. What you have to do is you need to make sure that you have a, a, a you have a algorithm which is printed in the website. So if I'm a house if I, like house officer who is starting as an intern, I would make sure that I have a, the printed charts or the printed charts in the in my emergency room. So that will save my life and save my time as well as the thinking pattern because most of the time what will happen is that your brain stops working when you are in an emergency. So you are, you are doing most of the things in your reflex. So if sometimes even a very minor things you are, you maybe tend to lose, like lose from that part. So what the best thing is to do is to make sure that you have the things which is pasted close to there so that most of the time, the common error is that you forget something that 4Hs and 4Ts have to be checked. So, and that time, even as a consultant, still, I may not be remember the 4Hs and 4Ts in a real emergency setups because that your brain freeze. So, we will, in our ICUs, what we used to do is we will have a emergency algorithms printed and they are in the, with the defibrillator machines. And also if it is sometimes pasted on the wall, so that will be at times life saving as well. Next question is briefly, uh, uh, in situation of drowning, do we, uh, do we do the same resuscitation method? Yeah, yeah. method, the, the resuscitation method is the same. The problem is that uh, the, how long you continue the resuscitation and what's the rhythm they have. So in a drowling, sometimes they have a shockable rhythm. So you might have to do the shock uh, repeatedly until you get the temperature normal. So the, the moment you get the temperature to the normal level, sometimes their heart will be back and they will be walking and going home. So you will be doing a resuscitation for about a 30 or 40 minutes in a child who is old or already having a drowning from the cold water drowning, especially they have a temperature is like 30s until unless you bring the temperature to the 32 and above to the point their their rhythm is not going to back to normal 
right? Sometimes those are the instances you will have to do the prolonged uh, resuscitation. I think it's important to not to electrocute yourself, no? If you are in a case of you know drowning. Yeah, yeah. In case of drowning, is basically that like usually like better to have a resuscitation properly going on and like make sure you are temp you are adequately monitoring your temperatures as well and they have like. Worked out. Yes. Okay. Uh, next question: uh, Do we have to sedate the child before delivering a shock, like in adult ALS? So this is uh, this is a problem in the pediatrics. So the pediatrics, what is common cause for the cardiac arrest is basically respiration. So most of the time they will be collapsed. So and uh, the rhythm of shockable rhythm also very rare. So ideally speaking, this child is already flat, and then child is not having any signs of life at that time. I like it's very like getting uh, getting the things delayed for a uh, sedation i don't think it is recommended thing to do but there are instances the patient is half away half away like a ventricular ventricular tachycardia in a child who is like pulses pulses they are or that like a severe supraventricular tachycardia which is causing a hemodynamic instability in that instances you are going a defibrillation definitely you have to give a Sedation, make sure that the patient is adequately sedated, a either a fentanyl or a ketamine. If the patient is intubated, that you can use a fentanyl. If the patient is uh, awake uh, and not airway is not protected, then the ketamine would be the uh, drug of choice. But in that situation, there, are, there is a place of sedation. But in a pediatric arrest, most of the time, the patient is already collapsed and unconscious. So in that situation, I don't think that is there is an indication for it. Uh, sedation clearly, but may most of the time if we intubate it, we will start the sedation as well. So it's you you can start the sedation and stuff with that. But I think the priority is if the shockable rhythm go for a shock if in a child is already unconscious. But if the patient is half conscious and child is moving, that child is unlikely to be in a cardiac arrest. Uh, so usually that will be going as a non-cardiac arrest, but child is having a hemodynamic instability. In that case, if you are giving a shock, if you have to give a shock, the doses and everything is going to be different from that instance. But in, if you are giving a shock for a different indication in the awake child, or you think the child is, even though the patient is like sedated, but child's underlying uh, sedation will be like inadequate in a child who is intubated already, then better to consider some sedation. Right, the question is, okay, I think uh, we better go for a tea break. Uh, right, so the lecture will start in now the five minutes. 10.35, please come back. Okay, thank you, Dr. Bhatti. Yes. Thank you.
are you there sir michael sir yeah i'm ready ah, okay so we can start you can hear me no yes sir can you yeah so yeah yeah that is screen yeah let's see So camera is pointing upwards, not your. Ah. Okay. Yeah, meet us. Screen. Can you hear the screen? Isn't it? Yes, coming up. Can you see? Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Michael Jens, uh, consultant pediatrician, uh, PCU LRH. and uh, i'll be doing the next session uh, it will be a interactive session on breathing difficulties uh, so we'll go through some cases here and try and work out how to manage uh, a few patients with uh, common uh, conditions with breathing difficulties so when we go through this uh, cases we'll try always try to use a systematic approach and uh, in this program the the approach we'll be using is uh, the triage airway breathing circulation uh, disability exposure measure monitor rss uh, method so this will be done in detail in a lecture uh, in the afternoon uh, this approach so uh, when a patient we always go through the airway breathing circulation and we have to assess and manage what will kill the quickest if there's a airway problem we have to assess that and sort that out and some of the uh, the to save the child's life so uh, so our main uh, thing that will be session in this lecture will be breathing even though we are going through abcd approach so just a little reminder so in breathing of course we are looking at two things effort of breathing and efficacy of breathing so in the effort of breathing we are looking at respiratory rate rhythm accessory muscle use recessions noises flaring of the nostrils and child's position in efficacy of, of breathing we are seeing how effective the breathing is so looking at chest expansion yaw entry saturation tracheal position abdominal breathing so uh, in the lecture in the afternoon we'll the the, uh, the lecture will be going through this in detail how to recognize a uh, serious ill child so we just a reminder because it's the breathing lecture but in our cases we'll go through the triage position a b c d approach so we'll give the cases and go through that approach so uh, uh, there's about uh, almost 1000 participants so when we go through the case just uh, uh, i'll try and ask some questions and even if you can't answer the questions in the chat box just in your mind or on a piece of paper try and answer the uh, the uh, the, que the questions that i asked and then we'll go through them so that it will be easier to remember so a uh, first case is uh, supun it's a one and a half year old child who had a runny nose and uh, noisy breathing and had a barking cough so on arrival to hospital he is clinging to the mother and uh, when he is disturbed the breathing sounds become more harsh so this patient a one and a half year old child with barking cough and noisy breathing uh, there's a video here but unfortunately the doesn't the sound doesn't come up so when we listen to the video he is having a strido and the child doesn't look uh, very ill they are not very toxic has have a, a strido it's quite a loud strido so anyone uh, what do you think the diagnosis is very quickly anyone can put up in the chat box so yeah so very good we got a lot of answers so a croup so viral croup this is a typical picture of a viral croup so viral croup uh, generally you uh, it's not a very serious condition most of them are mild or moderate but occasionally you can have a severe croup so what we are worried about is a severe croup so when we look at this child we we look at uh, we go through the triage position a b c d approach so remember that any child with a strido uh, there is a partial upper airway obstruction so always we take that as a red patient category 1 patient who should be seen immediately so if you ever have a, a strido patient it's a partial obstruction of the airway it's very dangerous see them quickly so this patient uh, we have to see quickly uh, and we have to position and these are the if we look at the airway there's a strido we breathe in there's recessions rate is 50 minutes saturation 94 pulse 162 but child is happy and crying in between 
So uh, just in your minds, I'll give you one minute. All of you in your minds, think of what are the inter interventions we'll do in airway, breathing, circulation, and disability. If you want, you can put it in the chat box. Otherwise, if you have to, uh, to, uh, takes time to chat, uh, to, uh, to type in your mind or write it down in the paper, what you will do for ABCD, I'll give you one minute. And then we'll go through. So while you're uh, going through a little bit about the triad, so like I mentioned, any child with a upper airway obstruction, uh, anyone with strido, it's a it's an emergency. See them quickly, and always these children who are red, uh, who are categorized as red patients or category one, or need to be seen early, call for early, and it's always important uh, to how to position these patients. So. In uh, children with apiave obstruction with strido, you have to position them in the most uh, comfortable position. So that is uh, in a position that they are most comfortable, most likely be mother's lap. So somehow soothe the patient, don't let them cry. Don't let them become irritable. If the, they cry, their partial obstruction might go into a complete obstruction, right? So, so have you all worked out uh, in your heads what we should do in Yahweh breathing circulation? Okay, you've got someone typing. So, okay. So remember, we'll go through the things. So, like I said, this is a Yahweh obstruction. So call for help. It's a red category one, red patient, call for help. Call your seniors. So child is in a bit of distress. Ration, so their heart, uh, heart Respiratory is high, saturation 94. So give some oxygen. So in very important practical point in this child with a strido, if you go and push the oxygen by force onto the child, it will start crying and worsen. So get the mother to hold the oxygen, keep the mother uh, child on the mother's lap, don't disturb the child. Give some oxygen. And uh, how you can give oxygen is you can give with the uh, saturation low, you can give with a mask with an unreachable bag. Don't go to put a nasal prongs, it will disturb this child and uh, make the strider worse. So in a viral uh, group, the, the, if they are very distressed like in this patient, we can try with some nebulized adrenaline. The dose is 1 in 1000, uh, 0.4 ml per kg, ml per kg up to a maximum of 5 ml. So that especially if you have a severe, a severe viral group, you can Use some nebulized schedule. So this patient is quite tachypneic with recession. So you can try some nebulized adrenaline, which will reduce the dis uh, distress. So the specific treatment is oral dexamethasone. This will reduce the inflammation. Dose is 150 micrograms per kg. So don't forget to monitor. Put on the saturation monitor. Monitor and see your response. So if they are getting better, if their respirates are coming down, recessions are getting better, heart rate is coming down, then you are happy. But if it's not working, get help. You might need to re re nebulize with nebulize, uh, nebulize with adrenaline, or if they get not getting worse, they might be going to a partial, uh, going to towards a complete obstruction. So most children with this management will get better. But make sure, as if you are near house office, they are not getting better. Make sure your seniors come. Make sure you get if they are going to complete obstruction. Call the people who will can take over the airway. So always very important to reassess. So it's. Uh, Okay, so it's very important. So dexa dose is 150 micrograms per kg. So there are uh, various trials saying 300 micrograms, 600, 150 is okay. You can repeat the dose if there's uh, poor response. Someone had asked the dexamethasone dose. And other things, don't worry about these doses. Uh, when you weigh a dose, check the BNF. Always look for maximum doses. So don't try to remember doses. So it says, uh, if child not take it, can we give IV steroids? Yeah, if it come to the IV steroids, you can give, but most of these children, you can manage with the oral dexamethasone. Okay. Okay, so we'll move on to the next case. So this is a viral group, quite, it's, if you think of it in a very simple way and go through this ABCD approach, call fail, pre-SS. If you're getting into trouble, get your seniors, you should be okay. So, in the viral group, the child is uh, generally generally quite uh, well. Uh, 
generally child is quite well uh, but in this case if you have epiglottitis it's a different picture again this child uh, they are 2 to 6 years of age and it's a very acute onset so in the viral proof it, it's a slow onset viral things they progress slowly but in bacterial infections there's a rapid progression acute onset high fever uh, you might have a soft strido virus in the viral proof it's a light there's a loud strido you might have difficulty in swallowing so you might have drooling of saliva might be unable to speak or swallow and they can deteriorate rapidly they can be toxic pale looking they might have peripheral shutdown so very dangerous condition uh, condition so this is a picture of what they look like this wait in this position tripod position so never ever go to examine their throat so if you examine their throat they these are having a partial upper airway obstruction they might arrest so be careful don't go to disturb them don't examine the throat this is a picture of what it looks like but you don't go to look but see what it looks like so if this patient comes ill looking highly high fever toxic patient with a uh, with a soft strido so this is the patient we looked at the soft strido ill patient uh, respiratory is high there's distress saturation is low high heart rate a bit drowsy so i'll give you one minute uh, how think how you are going to manage this patient a b c d think about uh, triagein what category will they will be uh, what are the things you will do so i'll give you a quick think about it and then we'll go through so if you have any ideas you can uh, put it in the chat box I'll give you about 30 seconds we got so call help inform seniors anesthetist ent surgeon very good intubation yeah so good we got some answers that seem to you so again like i said before this is a upper airway obstruction so it's a red patient category 1 very dangerous patient call for help and uh, who do you call for help we got some answers it's there are specific people you should call for help so there were some answers in the chat box call the anesthetist call the ent surgeon very important so one says to intubate so remember you can't intubate this patient in the ward or in the in the uh, etu you need you can't give the anesthetic drugs you can't put a cannula you can't disturb the child so this child has to go to the theater so in the, the this child you will need to take over the airway by a very skilled person by the anesthetist e ent surgeon will have to be there so they when they do this if they give anesthetic they can't give anesthetic drugs iv you have to give with gas induction so you have to inform the theater get this child to the theater and again like in the previous uh, uh, case don't disturb the child keep in the most uh, comfortable place so call for help i think a lot of you all have answered this call the anesthetist intensivist ent call the help call the theater get the theater ready so till you do that you can uh, give some oxygen so don't push the mask onto the child's face get the mother to hold the mask don't upset the child keep the child in the mother's lap buy some time you can try some nebulized adrenaline like we did in that the case that might relieve symptoms but again don't disturb the child don't go to put iv cannulas don't hurt the patient you might go into arrest so of course if you have pain relief we have got some emla on uh, after child is free of pain you can try uh, if you have the facility you can try cannulations but better if you take to this child to the ot and after gas induction the and the anesthetist can take over the airway have a look at the throat look if there is epiglottitis or bacterial tracheitis and take over the, the airway once they have taken over and secured the airway they will put a iv cannula and take the blood for blood culture full blood count crp and start some antibiotics so if it's epiglottitis it's a hemophilus influenza you will start some uh, third generation cephalosporin right uh, so this is a very dangerous case most of the things you have to do is uh, you to remember the things you don't have, you don't do so don't disturb the child keep in the correct position call for help so don't if you go to intubate this child in your ward or etu you, you probably arrest so call the help and do it in this way so quickly any any comments or questions before we move on to the next case so the question is uh, without interval is it good to have uh, iv cannula it's better not to do is uh, unless you have good pain relief if you put the iv cannula child starts crying 
uh, you might go into a, into a full respiratory arrest. So get uh, your anesthetist and get your full team and try. So very rarely this patient, if they arrest in the, in the if they arrest before the help comes, then of course you'll have to get the cannula in and manage the arrest. But try to prevent the arrest. Another case. Uh, Ah, this is a question. What is emla? That's yes, a good question. Emla is it's a local anesthetic. It's like a cream. You keep it over the hand where you're going to cannulate, and that will give some pain relief. So that when you cannulate, there is no pain. So uh, not freely available, but uh, other drawbacks. It takes about uh, 30 for mi 40 minutes to act. So some basically it's pain relief. So this is another key. Can we intubate and then start IV capturing? Yes, you have to take over the airway first. So what's going to kill this child first is the airway. So when priority is to take over the airway, then only give antibiotics. If you get, try to give the cannula first and the child goes into a rest, then yeah, you'll be almost impossible to uh, ventilate, intubate and ventilate. So first it is secure the airway in this case. Okay, some good questions are there. So only thing we are have to finish in half an hour. So shall we go to the next case? So this is a three-year-old child, uh, it's a four-year-old child. And uh, after eating peanuts, he has this rash and this swelling. Yeah, this rash and this swelling. And as a, if uh, you hear the sound uh, that he makes, he's making a strido. That is, uh, she's making a strido both in inspiration and expiration. So this is, uh, actually uh, anaphylaxis with, uh, laryngeal, with angioedema. edema. So you can have a strido, you can have hoarseness, you can have aphonius. In this case, the child had a, a strido, but you can even have a wheeze, uh, even a wheeze of the severe spasm, you can have a silus test. But in this, we have a strido, a payave obstruction. So if you see this patient, uh, this is, there's a strido, there is distress, high respiratory rate, saturation low, the conscious level is normal. Just looking at this uh, triage positioning, Yave breathing circulation. What are the actions you will take? Uh, take give you 30 seconds. Quickly we'll try and work out how you manage. So we have got to answer to its allergy. It's uh, more than any, it's an anaphylaxis. Uh, so allergy itself is not a very danger, but anaphylaxis is, is a very dangerous thing. You have to manage quickly. So again, it's a red patient. Okay. Triage category one, immediately you have to see, keep in the most comfortable position. And uh, we have had an answer to treat with uh, informed seniors, this answer. I am medically incorrect. I, yeah. So I think you'll have got the answer. So we'll go through that quickly. So like I said, it's a category one session. So call for help. Uh, give some oxygen. Don't upset the child. And specific treatment is I am medically. So one in thousand, high concentration, 0 0.01 ml per kg, small volume. High concentration, small volume, I am medically. That is the drug of choice. So life-saving, very important. Give to the left lateral thigh. It's absorbed quicker there. So this child, of course, is having a strido. So you can nebulize with adrenaline as well. That is, will help as well. And uh, get a cannula in. So uh, sometimes they might have a shock as well. So if there's a shock, you can give fluid bolus. But if there's no shock, you don't need to give. So generally, we give steroids. And some of the answers say IV uh, clofenrevin. I will uh, clofenrevin as well. So uh, IV steroids, they won't act immediately. And they are not life-slaving. Then uh, it's doubtful. Uh, they are placed in anaphylaxis, but routinely we will give. Uh, but for the life saving thing, it's the ABC and call for help and the IM medrillin. So, of course, if there's allergen that you can uh, remove, remove it. So, we'll accept the answer the clofemine and steroids, but the, it's doubtful that it's life saving. Your life saving thing is your Yahweh breathing circulation and your IM medrillin. See if there's any other. So there's a question here. So what do we do? First oxygen or adrenaline? So remember in a, in a 
in an emergency, you have to do take what will comes to the hand first. So if you think of the IM medal, it will take two three minutes. No, so while someone is put getting the adrenaline ready, it's you put the oxygen on. Whatever comes to hand first. So you won't be just waiting till the IM adrenaline is even to give the oxygen. Give the oxygen. So whatever you can do quickly, do. So there will be several people entering. One person get the oxygen, another one get the IM adrenaline. But remember, the IM adrenaline will take a few minutes, isn't it? The oxygen will take a few seconds. So do whatever you can as quickly as you can. So that's the answer. Oxygen or adrenaline first. Obviously, oxygen will be easier to give. Give the oxygen first. So they had asked about IV adrenaline. Don't give IV adrenaline unless you have a pediatric intensivist or ICU person there at your stage. You give the IM adrenaline and call for help. You can keep on repeating the IM adrenaline till help comes. As a house officer, don't go to give IV adrenaline. So they are given by the experts, either anesthetists or the a consultant or the intensivist will give it. You don't give it. You can go into arrhythmias. So, do we consider if we can stop? Uh, yeah. So, try and avoid intubations because this will be a difficult intubation. So, if you can, this is a stride of the airway is partially. The question is, can you consider intubation? Uh, if the, if you go into further airline, yes. So if there's it's a partial obstruction, but child is maintaining, so you try and reverse the obstruction by giving the IM medrelin, nebulized adrenaline, giving some oxygen. But if they go into complete uh, obstruction, then you'll have to uh, intubate. But again, you'll have to call, it will be a difficult intubation, so call the experts. Uh, so Rima, it's a good question. When do you repeat? You repeat IM medrelin every five minutes. Now the question is, uh, Left lateral, can we give to the deltoid? It is better to give the IM material to the left lateral thigh because the absorption is seven times quicker. So this is an emergency. You want to give the, get the adrenaline quickly. So you give it to where it's absorbed best. So left lateral thigh, nowhere else. So you will be using uh, the insulin syringe. In this uh, question, when you, what's the type of syringe, will you use the insulin syringe? How you give? Good, lot of questions. So, you're interacting. So, basically, think of it simply uh, A, B, C, D, mainly I am adrenaline. If there's stridor nebulized adrenaline is the case, if there's shock, give steroids. You can repeat the adrenaline every five minutes, call for help. If there's a complete obstruction, get the, um, you may need to intubate, but again, you'll need help. Shall we quickly go into the next case as uh, we are running out of time? So, our next case is a 10 month old child who's had cough and cold for three days. And uh, on the fourth day, he's uh, having a difficulty in breathing. And uh, when we examine, there is bronchi and Krebs. So this is a classical picture of a, a bronchiolitis. So children less than one year old come in with uh, mild fever, cough and cold, wheezing, difficulty in breathing. Uh, first time wheezing, this is classically a bronchiolitis, less than one year of age. So this patient, uh, when you look at, uh, you can see if you can see the video, but uh, in this, the child is breathing fast as intercal subcostal recessions. Uh, saturation is 88 in near. Child is drowsy. So there are some uh, audible sounds, recessions are there, respiratory size, saturation row, pulse rate is high, child is drowsy. So think about how you'll manage this uh, triage positioning Yahweh breathing circulation. So quickly think about 30 seconds and then we'll go through. So the question from the field, can we give, card, without card, can we give administrator? So I am medrini, life-saving, don't worry about cardiac monitoring, your child will like die before the cardiac monitoring. So the previous question, you don't need cardiac monitoring immediately, so give the IM medrini, but you can get the monitor, don't delay the IM medrini in the anaphylaxis for the previous question. Is it good to give adrenaline for allergy without confirming L effects? For allergy, of course, it's not a it's not a life threatening thing. So you don't have to give adrenaline for allergy for the previous one. So I think I've answered the other question. Adrenaline every five minutes for the previous one. Okay, so the present diagnosis is bronchiolitis. 
and we have got some answers on yeah so some good answers so there so so bronchiolitis so if you look at airway breathing circulation so bronchiolitis so they might have a lot of secretions and nasal blockage which will make it difficult for the child to breathe so we have to clear out the secretions and give some oxygen so in bronchiolitis it's a mainly supportive therapy so give oxygen so we have to uh, there are various ways of giving oxygen we can give nasal prongs mask mask with reservoir bag so uh, the amount of oxygen we can give we can step up according to the child's condition so uh, if you have a very ill child uh, who's not responding to oxygen by mask mask with reservoir bag we can step up and give heated humidified high flow nasal oxygen that's hhf nc or cpap right so uh, depending on the case basically you have to give oxygen so you can try with the nasal prongs is not better you can try mask if the child is bad you can try with res reservoir bag see whether their rates and recessions are coming down with their pulse rate is coming down if there's poor response we can go for uh, high flow oxygen with this machine heated high flow oxygen so other option is cpap but remember in, in children they don't tolerate cpap so well so we go for high flow oxygen with the heated high flow oxygen with next is with nasal cannula so give some oxygen so clear the airway give oxygen and maintain the nutrition so if the child is uh, taking orally better to give oral feeds if not you can go for ng feeds if that is failing we can give iv fluids so this child always monitor and see whether they are getting better so if they are getting worse they are getting exhausted call for help early don't let them rest so you had a rest lecture in the previous lecture so uh, always better to prevent their rest rather than learning how to manage rest properly don't let them rest so this is if they are giving oxygen and they are getting better and their conscious level is getting better heart rates are coming down child is more active alert you are happy but if you are giving oxygen the maximum amount of oxygen still the saturation is low respirates are getting low and child is getting exhausted drowsy call for help early you might have to intubate so if they are getting worse always uh, electively intubate them don't let them going to respire rest don't let them going to cardiac arrest so bronchiolitis is very easy mainly it is supportive give oxygen and monitor if they are getting better fine if they are not getting better call for help early consider whether they need to uh, escalate and whether they need to be yeah uh, we taken home so there is no proven benefit of physiotherapy or antibiotics uh, some questions we'll just go through that for we go to the next case uh, so there's a question why uh, can we use uh, 3% saline yes uh, 3% saline sometimes we used to clear the thick secretions but again remember uh, there is uh, uh, the research shows that there is not much benefit we are doing it but there's not much evidence so we can sometimes we use it to to clear the secretions if they are uh, thick secretion yeah so remember there is a trial, trial of bronchiolitis again if it's pure bronchiolitis there is no place for bronchiolitis sometimes we are doubt whether it's a asthma or or, or, a, or a bronchiolitis so sometimes we nebulize and see so hypertonic saline we use sometimes to clear secretion but there is really not much evidence for its use so there's a question what about salbutamol again if it's a pure bronchiolitis salbutamol will have no place again question antibiotics there is no place in for antibiotics in bronchial uh, bronchiolitis it's a viral infection uh, cross by sensitive virus so if there's a secondary bacterial pneumonia if we suspect that only antibiotics no place for antibiotics in a simple bronchiolitis it's uh, uh, very very uh, in even secondary infection as is quite rare so again do they have salbutamol receptors they may have you can even have at birth but for bronchiolitis nebulizing with salbutamol is now there's no place uh, what is the place for ribavirin in bronchiolitis again it's uh, uh, bronchiolitis is self limiting condition you give oxygenation and uh, mainly supportive care there, there's not much uh, uh, very, not much place for the use of ribavirin there are certain indications in very preterm children uh but uh, not for routine use recovery okay lot of questions i think i answered them all so basically bronchiolitis a b c open the airway clear out secretions give oxygen monitor maintain hydration and make sure that they don't uh, if they get in better be happy if they are not getting better call for help and consider stepping up so next one is asthma so 
uh, what there are various types of uh, severity asthma what we are worried about is the severe and life threatening asthma so you have to identify this so remember in the life threatening they will be exhausted they might have poor respiratory effort silent chest hypertension their conscious level may be depressed or they may be agitated so the acute severe one they are too breathless to talk of feet and their respiratory rates and heart rates will be high for their age so uh, over 5 years more than 30 30 to 15 2 to 5 years group heart rate more than 120 over 5 years uh, 130 to 2 to 5 years. so if you any of these uh, things in a child with acute exacerbation even one of these criteria is acute severe if you have one of these criteria then it's a life threatening so the, like, those two you have to identify and call for help quickly so if they have an asthma uh, in this call for help and uh, if you go through this patient who is having a wheeze uh, recession high rate uh, saturation low so this is child is a is a, looks like a uh, speak single word so this is acute severe asthma so this one call for help and re- remember always to prop up these patients even the bronchiolitis sometimes you can prop them up so when you prop up their ventilation is better so prop up call for help uh, give some oxygen what are the other things we will do is think about and jot it down or write it down Yeah, but the previous question, there was a questions about nebulizers in salbutamol. There is no place for nebulization in bronchiolitis. Uh, no place for maxalfate in bronchiolitis. Uh, no place for antibiotics. Uh, Hypertonic saline we use, but there is uh, not uh, much proven benefit for the previous question. So, for this one, uh, what we'll do is uh, so. So, right, this is uh, child who's tachypneic saturation level. So, call for help. and give some oxygen so how you give oxygen if it's a saturation a give the high flow oxygen with a 10 meters with a non breathable bag uh, and this is a acute severe asthma so you have to nebulize so don't uh, delay nebulize with salbutamol and improvent nebulize back to back that means uh, continuous nebulization one after another don't stop while you're monitoring nebulize back to back three times with with uh, salbutamol while giving uh, salbutamol ipratol and start steroids early so if they are very ill you need to and can't take orally you will have to give hydrocortisone but even our very ill children they can tolerate totally we give we can manage still with prednisolone right so even the acute severe asthma if most of them with you give, prop them up give them oxygen nebulize salbutamol ipravir three times uh, give some steroids generally with three back to back nebulization these children improve you will see their respirate coming down uh work of breathing recessions getting less saturation picking up then only they you only have to tail off nebulization it is actually quite easy to manage right? but occasionally you give back to back nebulization uh and uh, uh, they don't improve so if they don't improve you have to go to second line drug so the second line drugs there are three options maxalfate iv salbutamol iv amenophilin so uh, at the moment maxalfate is uh, one of the most popular drugs so we in our unit we use maxalfate and we find it very useful in children who don't get better with back to back nebulization so the other option in some units they use iv amenophilin as their second drug some units use iv salbutamol but you can whatever your unit is using you can use but remember you have to know the side effects so maxalfate you can get hypotension you can get respiratory depression so make sure you monitor the blood pressure make sure they are hydrated well and Uh, iv salbutamol you can get arrhythmia so make sure that you have the ecg leads on make sure that their potassium is normal iv amenophilin make sure they are not on any oral theophylline so if you have on oral theophylline you can't give a low in dose of amenophilin and again you have to look for the side effects arrhythmias so monitor this patient so most of them even the maxalfate or the if they don't respond to back to back nebulization they will respond to the second line drug very very rarely only they will get exhausted and need intubation it's very rare thing but if you are getting worse call for help get the experts because the intubation is a, is a very difficult decision to take it is said to take one by the most senior person so call for help early so there are some questions we'll go through those uh, so question is how long should we nebulize continuously so 
if you nebulize uh, with salbutamol ipravent, it generally takes about 20 minutes. So back-to-back -back three nebulizations should take one hour. So at the uh, you can see at the end of one hour whether they have improved or not. You'll be monitoring continuously, but at the one hour, at the end of one hour, take your decision. At the end of one hour, if they are better, you can tail off nebulization. If there's no improvement, you can go for second line drug. So the question about the prednisolone. So what the dose of prednisolone give? So generally prednisolone is given as a daily dose. But if there are children, if it's a large amount of tablets and they, they can't tolerate, then you can go to a BD dose. But generally it's a daily dose. So they'd asked uh, what question was about the dose of prednisolone uh, after the initial dose. Uh, in back to back, do we use uh, both salbutamol and ipravent? Yes, in acute severe asthma, we use uh, ipravent and salbutamol both in fact. Like, both of these you can use back to back three times and it's recommended. So, acute severe asthma, you have to hit it hard and somehow get the patient well as soon as possible. So, use both. So, Patients who are on back to back, do we give IV hydrocortis? So if you can, IV hydrocortis. So if you are, uh, can't tolerate it orally, you can give IV hydrocortis. Huh? But if you are already in oral, you can give uh, oral prednisone because they both have the same onset of action and same duration. There's no difference. The only difference is if you can't tolerate only, we give IV hydrocortis. Otherwise, you can manage with oral prednisone. The child develops apuxis at home uh, till, till they reach what are the measures we need to be taken. So if they are an inhaler, you can give the inhaler and uh, better if they are acute severe asthma to come in the ambulance. Uh, if you go, call the 1990 ambulance, they will give oxygen and bring the child. So if they are an inhaler, you can give the inhalers. Uh, if they get the acute severe at home till they come to hospital. Can we, uh, can we Add prevent uh, initially after the second stand. So the better to if it's acute severe asthma, better to start prevent with the first uh, first nebulization. Don't wait to hit hard at the beginning. Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, next, how do we ass assess for other causes uh, like uh, pneumothorax asthma? Uh, uh, pneumothorax asthma emergency. So it's an important thing. So uh, if you are giving back to back nebulizations and not improving. Uh, always assess to see whether the diagnosis is correct. Make sure there's no pneumonia. So you might need a check x ray. You look clinically for focal lung signs. Look for a pneumothorax. So the pneumothorax, you should be able to diagnose uh, clinically, especially tension pneumothorax. So if there's a tension pneumothorax, there'll be a deviation of the trachea and the mediastinum to the opposite side. There might be hyperresonance. Uh, there might be reduced air entry. So look clinically for your pneumothorax. But it's rare, but look for it clinically. So if there's So dose of prednisolone in children is uh, one to two milligrams per kg. This question is dose of. What is the place for leukotriene uh, modifiers? There's no place in acute CVSA as, as for leukotriene modifiers. Time's up. Yeah. Quant in the uh, time is up. So we'll go to the. So uh, very quickly. Uh, discuss with their features of CVDs, look for long duration symptoms, previous attacks uh, needing uh, IV or ICU therapy and poor response in the current episode. So saturation is a good indicator of the severity, but always remain trends are better than single observations. Okay, so I think the foreign body we have done, just we'll just do pneumonia. So this is a patient with uh, pneumonia. So basically, call for help, high flow oxygen, like in the bronchiolitis, step up oxygenation, IV can love, uh, take your bloods and IV antibiotics. So, so remember signs of in breathing difficulty, signs of depression, look for increasing recessions, increasing respirate, increasing pulse rate, fatigue. So if you are having these things, call for help and get your seniors to come and see if the child's airway needs to be taken over. Otherwise, don't let the child rest in the ward. And always monitor the children and if they get in worse, call for help. Okay. I think most of the questions were answered during the thing and as we are running out of time, I think we better go for the next uh, lecture, isn't it? 
Good morning, everybody. Uh, can you can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, actually, uh, we'll start uh, topic the status asthmaticus discuss today, and uh, uh, some of the these things uh, is uh, I, I I can get some help from uh, Dr. Michael Jans because he has discussed some of the uh, some of things that relevant to me as well. Then uh, we'll discuss some uh, initial theory part first, and then go to the management. Uh, then uh, asthma, uh, asthma is an inflammatory disease. It's actually uh, is cast, uh, cast by airway obstruction, and uh, this airway obstruction can be due to airway hyperresponsiveness, bronchospasm, and airway inflammation, which causes mucosal edema and mucosal plugging. Uh, Then uh, airway, uh, when we get the airway inflammation, uh, it is uh, when you take uh, this thing is an It's uh, this uh, airway inflammation is there. Then there is airway hyperresponsiveness. Then airway obstruction uh, uh, there, and then therefore the clinical scenario is uh, consists of this this inflammation was in airway hyperresponsiveness and airway obstruction. This uh, ultimately gives rise, gives rise to the clinical picture of bronchial asthma. Then what is status asthmaticus? Actually, uh, this status asthmaticus is progressive worsening airway, of, uh, airway bronchospasm and uh, respiratory dysfunction due to asthma. Then uh, this is the uh, uh, this is the scenario in uh, uh, respiratory dysfunction, which uh, which is uh, usually it is unresponsive conventional therapy. And in, as uh, initially as uh, previous lecture. Uh, as mentioned, then initially, usually uh, these things are responsive to your initial treatment most of the time. But uh, in uh, some patients, in few uh, few percentage, they they may go in, uh, they may not respond. Then uh, they will go into con uh, the unimprovement, and uh, there is con uh, uh, gradually deteriorate the condition. Then uh, they might go into progressive respiratory failure. And may need even ventilation, yeah, but but the, then go, may can go, may go into death even death. Uh, one day the cartoon uh, uh, cartoon artist who get uh, cartoonist get uh, got this uh, stereo asthmaticus at uh, his uh, childhood or uh, childhood, and uh, how this is how he could remember. Uh, this uh, scenario, he thought uh, the the elephant was on his chest, and that uh, that that uh, gives uh, uh, the idea how, how difficult this uh, bronchial asthma is, how to how how difficult to breathe it, breathe it. Then uh, that there's uh, we we may feel very heavy chest, tight heavy chest because of that we it is difficult to breathe out usually. Then uh, that is the experience of the cartoonist. Uh, I, I I would like to uh, take you to your advanced level. Uh, you you might remember the, the there is Oisel's equation. It's uh, this is a very famous uh, during uh, even your advanced level in physics. Uh, you might remember this uh, equation. Then uh, there is a relationship between uh, resistance, uh, length of the tube, and the diameter. There is a diameter and the, as well as this is. Uh, viscosity this is viscosity uh, length and the diameter there is a relationship to uh, resistance and uh, length and uh, length and viscosity 
it is uh, uh, proportionate to the uh, uh, resistance but uh, radius uh, it is inversely proportionate to the resistance then actually uh, radius is inversely proportionate uh, not only the, the this is uh, uh, fourth power of the radius inversely proportionate to fourth power of radius then uh, you 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 can work out that if you uh, if you have the uh, radius if you have the radius the resistance will increase by 16 volts because it is uh, 2 to the power 4 2 to the power 4 is 16 therefore it will go up by 16 times uh, uh, then uh, there you can you you know that you can understand that what is the, when there is uh, status asthmaticus when the bronco is passing the there is the uh, use of uh, bronchodilatation from if bronchodilatation we can do the thumb bronchodilatation you see little bit there is huge drop of uh, res re resistance we increase by one uh, by two they uh, drop by 16 times even in increase by a little bit there is significant drop of radio resistance uh, there it is in other words it is again same that uh, there we have to do some bronchodilatation there is some bronchodilatation then uh, there is increment of uh, resi reduce reduction of the resistance then in in pathophysiology this is normal airway this normal airway the normal airway you, you we, we can re, uh, breathe it breathe in and out uh, normally but in asthmatics, they have airway, they have the hypertrophic uh, air, uh, intimal layer, hypertrophy, the mucosal hypertrophy, and as well as they have uh, bronchial, bronchial muscles, that uh, muscles in the bronchi, then they are, they, they are very, uh, very sensitive and they can go into bronchospasm. At the same time, there may be some secretion in the airway, but not to the low airway, but it is in bronchiole and upper, upper level in uh, bronchi uh, bronchi uh, and then uh, from bronchi to bronchiole level but uh, not the very low way right? that alveolar duct and alveolar sac alveolar the respiratory bronchioles those things we don't have secretion but in uh, upper upper airways that upper airways is uh, above uh, respiratory bronchioles we have secretions then, uh, then the secretions are blocking. You can see the secretion can be blocked. And yeah, we, when we have a mucosal hypertrophy that can, uh, then hyper, mucosal hypertrophy that can again obstruct the airway. Then again, uh, if you have uh, bronchospasm and constricting the airway lumina, then uh, we have smaller airway lumina. Then therefore, there is resistance to airway. Then you, you can remember the previous slide. When we uh, apply Poisson's equation to this uh, uh, this scenario, then you know that we, we are, we, there, there is huge increment of airway resistance. When we go to the attack, then when we get the bronchospasm, when we go to the attack, then uh, there is significant uh, bronchoconstriction, uh, significant mucosal hypertrophy, significant amount of secretion that causes more and more reduction of airway lumina. Then you know, then there is huge increment of uh, airway resistance. Airway is huge, then uh, there is uh, significant uh, air trapping and uh, go into a attack, uh, stasis asthmaticus or uh, exacerbation of bronchial asthma. You can understand this thing. Then when we go to the uh, acute exacerbation bronchial asthma, as, uh, I, uh, as I uh, heard in the last part of uh, Dr. Michael's uh, lecture, then uh, he, said, he, he explained that there is uh, in, in, in early, earlier that we can uh, into three parts in the mild to moderate asthma, then there is severe asthma and life threatening asthma. In mild to moderate asthma, then uh, there is respiratory, with the, we can, there is respiratory apertis there, saturation maintain then there is uh, uh, usage of minimum of use minimal usage of accessory muscles and they talk in and feed in well then uh, the wheeze may be uh, uh, audible 
uh, but uh, we can uh, we can give some medicine and send them home uh, we can uh, quickly but we can uh, prescribe some medicine or prescribe inhalers in they have if they have yeah, using inhalers we can ask them to use rescue and as well as uh, uh, preventive medica medication and we can send them home but in severe and life threatening we have to treat because severe one can go into life threatening then uh, severe one is progressive then uh, we have to we have to act quickly in uh, severe one uh, then at, at, we have to identify whether we are in the mild to moderate form severe form or life threatening if it is we are identify severe then we have to act quickly we have to act uh, nebulization and uh, then we can we have to start uh, we start uh, steroid and we can we have to uh, do it quickly very important that there is increased respiratory rate and there is uh, they are breathless they have uh, made difficult difficult in talking and then uh, then use accessory muscles it is very important use accessory muscles they you, you can see that they are using abdominal muscles they are using uh, intercostal muscles they are subcostal muscles and uh, as well as neck muscles to breathe then you can you know that by looking at this child they are labored breathing then they are breathing with difficulty you have to observe child's abdomen chest and abdomen then uh, and the neck the neck you can see uh, muscles they are, they are working and uh, then you can see uh, intercostal muscles and subcostal muscles they are working then uh, you they, then uh, you 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 know that this child is in trouble then abdomen is uh, moving like going fast then you you can count the respiratory rate respiratory rate is high using necessary muscles and uh, when we check the saturation saturation may be low then uh, you may call it as cv asthma then at, at the, this patient we have to act quickly then next category and uh, that dr michael clearly mentioned that uh, here uh, we have life threatening attack then we have uh, that uh, his last sites uh, there are uh, last few sites there are this very important site there is uh, poor respiratory effort, uh, poor uh, consciousness exhausted then uh, we know this this we are in trouble then uh, at that point may we may not hear any uh, breathing because to have you know that to have wheezing you have to have is more uh, constrict then how do you get wheezing that uh, it is due to turbulence of the flow uh, from the uh, respiratory tract when we have turbulent flow from the respiratory tract we hear wheezing to have turbulent flow they are we have to have some flow with uh, there if there is no flow uh, no turbulent flow no sound therefore we get uh, silent chest uh, if, uh, when there is uh, when there is uh, turbulent uh, when there are turbulent flow and this then we have to uh, uh, we have to identify it very quickly then uh, we have to act because this is life threatening and uh, if we no, do not do correct things at this point we may lose the child then therefore we have to act quickly uh, in CV asthma as well as life threatening asthma then we have to identify what is severe form? What is a life-threatening form? Then, uh, then there are the, in management of uh, bronchial asthma, uh, it says asthmaticus. There, there are things to do. Then some, some of the things we can do in the in, at home, in mild to moderate uh, exacerbation, we can we may we may may use uh, salbutamol uh, MDI or salbutamol inhalation at home plus uh, some and we can use uh, bronchodilate uh, rescue uh, rescue and as well as preventive medication at home and then uh, it might respond to those treatment at home that home management but if we get uh, get get uh, get in worse then we have to admit the, uh, they are coming to the uh, uh, hospital in hospital actually uh, we, we have management that we can do it in the emergency department and as well as we can do this management in the intensive care. If we do in the emergency department, then uh, we know uh, we can do uh, nebulization and give an uh, oral, oral steroid and uh, then go for IV magnesium sulfate. We'll discuss this in the uh, next few sites. And these things we can do in uh, uh, emergency department. If there is no improvement, we have to see uh, revisit our diagnosis and this thing. I will discuss that as well. Then we may go to ICU management. And most important thing you know, at your level, you have to uh, make sure that uh, the, we are 
uh, we have to get uh, call uh, we have to get call uh, seniors and get uh, help from your seniors it is very important to call for it is very important call for help then uh, 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 it is uh, we have, when we uh, we get this uh, situation uh, child we there is uh, general things we can do these are we have to do uh, definitely we have to get iv access and we, are, we have to continuous monitoring of this child respiratory rate uh, saturation pulse rate and even cardio cardiac monitoring we can do at the same time uh, then uh, if the child uh, need further care that even further uh, further care then uh, that time we, have, we may have to insert a catheter and central access those things but it is not for all the children but for we, according to the care we are going to give uh, we should uh, give these general things we have to apply this is not for all uh, but uh, for children if we are just uh, we are going to just nebulize and see then we don't have to put iv access if we are just nebulizing then we can nebulize and see at emergency department but uh, if we are going to uh, give further management then we may need and we can see the child and then we may need uh, iv access as well but monitoring is important for every child in respiratory rate, uh, pulse rate and saturation. They, those things should be monitored and respiratory effort. Those things uh, should be monitored uh, irrespective of the uh, degree of the disease. And oxygen, it is most important. We have to give oxygen in each and every, every child who admitted to the uh, admitted with asthma. Then we have to give oxygen. Then nebulization also should be give, give the, it should be oxygen driven nebulization. Then uh, then there be there is in uh, there is child have may have mucus plugs in their way and uh, there may atelectasis that means collapsed alveoli. Then uh, because of these things uh, there is. Uh, uh, VQ mismatch, then uh, their child, child develop VQ mismatch and hypoxia uh, because of this uh, uh, mucus plug-in and atelectasis, then uh, uh, we have to give all the, all the children with SRS asthmatic was oxygen is must, then uh, we have to give oxygen for these children. They have, there is uh, compensatory uh, hypoxic pulmonary waste constriction and uh, causing this thing. And then uh, if we, uh, then uh, we can see that uh, when we go down, there is some areas that uh, when you go down, there is uh, uh, there is uh, there is uh, lot of uh, heterogeneity. That some some of the airway uh, is uh, uh, fully open, some are fully collapsed, some are partially collapsed with the various degrees. Therefore, the, the you can see this uh, the alveoli are in different 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 sizes. Therefore, uh, it is. Uh, uh, it, it is uh, we have to we have to uh, we have to uh, understand that there, it is not the same. This is the same pressure applied to the area. That it is different, different, different places. We can get different, different, different uh, alveolar sizes. Therefore, the oxygen uh, delivery also difficult. The VQM is different, different, different parts. Different, different uh, oxygen delivery. Therefore, uh, when we give uh, oxygen. We, this, uh, we can give oxygen and then and there is uh, some relief at the same time when you give the nebulization we have to make sure that we are giving oxygen because then there are some alveoli they are fully uh, distended and obstructed they they are collecting carbon dioxide because there is uh, uh, you you may you may know that uh, oxygen when you get the oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, oxygen has uh, uh, carbon dioxide at enormous diffusion capacity. Therefore, uh, carbon dioxide ex, uh, it can release the carbon dioxide into the uh, alveolar air very easily. Therefore, when we uh, obstructed alveoli, it is obstructed alveoli is filled with carbon dioxide. Obstructed alveoli is filled with carbon dioxide. Therefore, when we uh, when we give bronchodilatation, then uh, there will be release of uh, oxygen uh, carbon dioxide into the uh, bronchi. And uh, that, that, that locality, that locality of that lung, uh, there is a high concentration of carbon dioxide. When there is high concentration of the carbon dioxide, there is high reduction, there is a significant reduction of uh, oxygen. Therefore, uh, oxygen level is, uh, uh, oxy there is, high, there is uh, relative hypoxia at, at the alveolar level. Therefore, uh, you have to give oxygen before you give the nebulization. It is very important.
then uh, uh, the fluid it is uh, pa patients are these patients are not eating not drinking properly therefore there is some the relative dehydration will be there with the patients and at the same time uh, they are because uh, uh, because of the illness there is high evaporation therefore uh, there is reduction of the uh, some fluid level in the body therefore the, uh, they need a, a appropriate fluid resuscitation not uh, we have, we should not give a huge amount of fluid they, they, that may go in, that may cause further problems but we have to give adequate amount of fluid because uh, dehydration is also a problem overhydration is also a problem Therefore, we have to give adequate fluid, adequate fluid for these children. Then uh, corticosteroid, that steroid is a cornerstone. That steroid is actually, it is a drug. We are going to, we are going to come back this process that we know that in, from the beginning, this is, this is inflammation. This inflammation causing these problems. Inflammation causing this uh, airway, airway obstruction, inflammation of the airway, edema, and those things are almost all things are causing the inflammation. We have to we have to stop this process. To stop this process, we have to give steroid. Therefore, steroid is the mainstay of the therapy in uh, in uh, status asthmaticus. We have to give steroid. We have to give steroid to hold the progression of the disease. Then uh, then uh, the, the suppress. Uh, uh, cytokine production, uh, then there is uh, yeah, mucosal edema, and, and then uh, nitric oxide uh, synthase production. That that all all these things are uh, can we can hold all these things, and we can reduce this the all the all the part that all the pathogenesis of this uh, pathophysiology that uh, that things that are gone wrong, uh, we can uh, correct with steroid. Therefore, we have to give steroid. Uh, for status asthmaticus, that is the drug, drug of choice. Then, uh, but problem is that to the uh, steroid act, it will take some time. It will act at least it will take about at least uh, two hours to act, two hours, and to get the maximum effect, it is four to six hours to get the maximum effect. Therefore, we have to uh, we have to give steroid at the beginning, but we don't get the action immediately. Therefore, we have to give other care to maintain this airway. Maintain this airway, we have to give other care, but steroid is must. We have to give steroid at the beginning. Then uh, what is the type of steroid we should give? That we can give IV steroid. At the same time, we can give oral steroid and even uh, inhaled steroid as well. But in IV steroid, uh, that if child is having life-threatening or acute severe asthma, it is very difficult to give oral steroid. Because, uh, we, we, then we have to give IV steroid. And if child is mild to moderate and in the early stage of acute severe, then may, child may get oral steroid. But in acute severe asthma and life threatening asthma, we can't give oral steroid because this uh, respiratory difficulty. But in early early phase, we can give uh, oral steroid. Then uh, that uh, rate of action will be same because it will take two two hours to act. At, uh, even give the IV or oral form. Then. Uh, then, uh, then other thing is in inhaled corticosteroid. That uh, inhaled corticosteroid. Uh, then we have uh, even in adult and even in older children, we can give MART therapy, that uh, maintenance and uh, reliever therapy at together. That we can give the butanide and formidable condensation for mild and moderate exacerbation. So mild and moderate exacerbation, we can give more therapy and get some control. But in severe acute severe asthma and life threatening asthma, we we should get uh, institutional therapy. But uh, we can give this more therapy. But in uh, other other others, we can give oral or IV steroid. Then uh, what is type of steroid? In the steroid type, there is no consensus. There's no consensus what is the best steroid is, but. Uh, there some people that you some people use IV methylprednisolone, it is common use agent. Uh, then uh, then others uh, can, we can use even dexamethasone, hydrocortisone or dexamethasone. Then uh, IV methylprednisolone that, uh, that we have to give at initial dose of two milligram per kg followed by 0.5 milligram to one milligram per kg uh, uh, dose IV every six hourly. And we can even use hydrocortisone over dexamethasone. It is uh, there is no consensus between uh, steroid to what is the what is the best steroid is. 
and uh, as, as i mentioned earlier there is it will take about two to three hours to uh, reach the effect uh, for the steroid therefore at, at least one hour then therefore there is no one hour is very big uh, very, very 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 long time when you consider this uh, ill child then uh, therefore it we have to give it but the effect is effect to get the effect it will take some time there are uh, we had to continue uh, steroid until the this exacerbation is resolved because it is the drug we, we are going to come back this disease process therefore we have to uh, give this drug till the end of the acute exacerbation until the end of this inflammatory process therefore we had continue uh, continue with steroid there are some side effects you know that we can get the hypoglycemia hypertension then sometimes then we'll, when we give uh, steroid for a long time they will give some agitation and all then uh, they, those those will be the side effects of this steroid but we have to give steroid then uh, salbutamol that is uh, you know that is uh, salbutamol is uh, beta 2 agonist then uh, it's uh, this uh, sim this is a sympathetic agent uh, you, you uh, i think uh, dr dr michael discussed into some some extent how to give it how to nebulize it then uh, then inhalation that in in acute cv asthma and uh, status asthmatic there is limited use in uh, limited use and especially in status it is limited use and we have to go the frequent continuous nebulization. We have to use continuous nebulization as uh, we have to use uh, at least two uh, different different uh, uh, resp respirator that then we can give to uh, continuous nebulization. That important thing is we have to give oxygen driven nebulization. We should not give uh, with, uh, 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 nebulization without oxygen for children with status asthmaticus. We have to give this with oxygen. We have to remember it. We should not give uh, give nebulization without oxygen. As you can remember, there will be a uh, uh, distribution of uh, trapped carbon dioxide uh, in 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 low airway. Then, therefore, uh, there will be developing of uh, hypoxia said because of the hypocarbia. Lower level hypocarbia may cause hypoxia. Therefore, we should not give uh, salbutamol alone or salbutamol alone. We have to give with oxygen. Actually, uh, then if if, we, uh, if uh, this nebulization fail or we can undo nebulization, then we there is a choice of IV salbutamol infusion and that uh, it, it it we can start with one one mix per kg and then we can gradually increase up to ten. Usually, we can, in in, in uh, non ICU settings, we may go up to uh, up to three four uh, micrograms per kg. Then uh, there are side effects of uh, salbutamol. There are is uh, the, the sinus tachycardia or palpitation, even ventricular arrhythmias we can get, uh, tremors and uh, those things we can get. But uh, usually the salbutamol side effects are transient. When we take this drug out, then uh, they will resolve it on. And uh, cardiac effect, then uh, we have done some studies. Then, but uh, in, there are some effect, but uh, it is again transient. They, they will uh, if we get correct dose, correct uh, correct amount. And then uh, we, can, we can get the side effect and uh, side effects will be transient. Then uh, magnesium sulfate, it is, it, is a, uh, it is a very important drug. You know that we, we have to give salbutamol or at the same time, we, we, uh, I will discuss uh, about the uh, ipratopium. Uh, if, if a child has uh, acute CVSM, we give salbutamol or salbutamol plus uh, ipratopium uh, nebulization. And uh, that, that is to dilate the away. Then, because we are we are buying our time to uh, to steroid act, to steroid uh, that we are the steroid action is pending. And then uh, we uh, waiting for the steroid action. That say that at the same time we are giving bronchodilatation to get, improve uh, improve this uh, uh, bronchodil bronchodilatation. Then uh, therefore uh, bronchodilators. Uh, we have to give then uh, if we if we can get the cannot get uh, uh, desired effect with salbutamol uh, inhalation then we have to give IV form there is uh, uh, first uh, drug of choices IV mag magnesium sulfate the that is again uh, this calcium channel blocker and activation of this uh, pathways then they can get some some uh, bronchodilatation and uh, bronchodilatation then uh, there, this 
this causes uh, relief of uh, this resistance then uh, at the same time it will cause uh, respiratory muscle stabilization as well because you know that with this uh, uh, with this uh, exacerbation uh, respiratory muscles uh, that exhaustion of uh, respiratory muscle and uh, child will be exhausted therefore uh, we have to stabilize respiratory muscles as well. And magnesium sulfate will, uh, the, in one hand, it will co it cause bronchodilatation. In the other hand, it, it other 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 side, it cause bronch uh, respiratory muscle stabilization. And uh, this uh, dose is usually 25 to 50 uh, kilo, uh, milligram per kilogram. Uh, we, we can go uh, go uh, can give over 30 30 minutes, and uh, we can even administer even every four hours. Uh, or we can go with continuous uh, impulsion in ICU setting, but uh, in ward setting, usually we give boluses. And then uh, actually, if we give a self magnesium sulfate, you have to wait. And if you, this, this is a ill child, you know that uh, you can't give this uh, even even nebulization. You have to, you can't give nebulization, and you can go go home or go outside because this is ill child. You have to make sure that this child is you are looking after this child and uh, to get some improvement then we when we get in some improvement then you can uh, go to another child but uh, but you have to wait and you have to see what is what is happening with this child if there is uh, if there is some uh, uh, this thing uh, some uh, uh, some some form of uh, uh, non improvement we have to we should not wait if we have to give magnesium sulfate that means uh, there is uh, there is no improvement that not uh, that in, not improved with uh, nebulization therefore if you give magnesium sulfate that's again very ill child then uh, that means you have to wait with this child you can't give magnesium sulfate and go out and you have to you have to wait with this child and you have to monitor uh, and that to if you come into this stage if you no, there's no improvement with uh, 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 nebulization and we, we go for magnesium sulfate then we have to monitor this child at the same time if we, there is no improvement with nebulization you have to inform your seniors you have to inform your superiors in uh, this this child we are we are in trouble because this child is deteriorating gradually you have to monitor this child you have to uh, look after this child monitor this child and uh, if there is uh, the child is deteriorating then at, at the beginning we have to inform your seniors this child is deteriorating and we have to get some give some another action therefore we keep them informed and uh, side effects of magnesium sulfate is high we can get hypotension even uh, respiratory depression and respiratory muscle weakness and therefore we have to monitor this child then uh, Methylsaxanthin or the IV aminopilin that uh, this actually again uh, promote uh, uh, relaxation of bronchial smooth muscles. There is, uh, but in uh, that exact mechanism is not known. Controversial that it is controversial, uh, and uh, there that that is uh, then other thing is that uh, oral things oral th theophilines are not. It is not for the uh, stasis. Some people, I, th I, it is not for the stasis. But, but we should not give those things in 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 stasis asthmaticus. But we can give IV aminophilin. Then uh, problem is that is uh, then very low narrow very very narrow therapeutic index. Then uh, as there is narrow therapeutic index, we have to see whether child getting some toxic level. Therefore, drug level should be monitored. Drug level should be monitored. Therefore, uh, we have to get uh, drug levels. And we have to uh, monitor this uh, child's uh, manipulating level because that can go into toxic level because the therapeutic index is low. Or it can get into uh, subtherapeutic level. Then we have to maintain the th uh, therapeutic level. Uh, uh, in either either side is not good. Therefore, we have to get drug level. Uh, drug, it is ideally drug level should be monitored in uh, But in Sri Lanka, we have we don't have drug level at the moment. Uh, then another next uh, thing is anticholinergics. Uh, you know that ipratropium bromide. We can uh, combine this thing with salbutamol and nebulize. That is uh, again important drug. It is uh, you know that uh, promote bronchodilatation uh, without inhibition uh, uh, mucociliary clearance. Then uh, we can give it aerosol form or MDI at the beginning at the uh, initial phase of uh, mild to moderate exacerbation. But in a severe or a severe exacerbation, we have to give uh, 
as a uh, nebulization form then uh, that uh, ipratropin has poor uh, poor systemic absorption because of very big molecule therefore uh, that uh, it is poor systemic absorption therefore uh, minimum side effects then again i am going to uh, that i can just remember just just uh, remind you this poisson uh, equation there is poisson equation you have uh, that is uh, the resistance inversely proportional to viscosity and length then if we can reduce viscosity then again we can uh, reduce some amount of resistance because our aim is to reduce resistance here the main thing is uh, imp improvement of the uh, improvement of the uh, radius if you can increase the uh, radius then uh, there is improvement in the uh, improvement definitely reduction of the resistance with the significant reduction that is the main goal but the, uh, but we can reduce uh, viscosity and we can reduce uh, reduce the resistance as well to that uh, there is people use different different things that uh, uh, then uh, helox is the uh, thing we can use uh, uh, use for uh, helium oxygen we can use for reduce the lower the viscosity but it is uh, actually clinical impression that uh, theoretically it is correct but in clinical impression and in clinically is uh, clinically ill child with status uh, it is not proven if there is no improvement then uh, we have to see some of this is very important because if the entire some children we, we may give we give uh, this uh, medications and we can give uh, the nebulization we give iv methylprednisolone the we oxygen uh, uh, nebulization then uh, uh, steroid at the same time then if there is no improvement even we, we may we may try methylprednisolone even even we, we even before we try and for methylprednisolone uh, iv magnesium sulfate sorry iv magnesium sulfate we have to think uh, why this child is not improved first we have to think whether it is complication of disease there will be some few things one thing it could be a it could be a wrong diagnosis we had we this it could be something else it could be a, a something it is uh, we are we are not given appropriate management or we are there is complication of disease or there is some comorbidities therefore we, if we address those things then if it is a uh, complication of disease we have to think about pneumothorax the child may have pneumothorax then we can detect it by when we say the air entry there's uh, one side there is no air entry air entry reduce in one side and another side is entry there then you know that there is there could be due to pneumothorax then you can percuss and see whether it is uh, pneumothorax whether it is uh, percussion not is resonant hyper resonant percussion not then we can see whether it is pneumothorax then we can get the help of uh, your superiors then at the same time it could be due to uh, other comorbidities like uh, exacerbation may be due to pneumonia infection may cause exacerbation therefore we have to think there is pneumonia then if, especially in when there is uh, right low low pneumonia uh, pneumonia then it is huge area then uh, they may get give uh, there is uh, minimum improvement that it will take some time to improve and we have to see whether it is Uh, due to comorbidity or that coexistence or uh, the predisposing factor problem with the predisposing factor at the same time we have to we have to see whether we are dealing with the correct diagnosis at the same time we have to see uh, whether we are giving correct management whether we are giving correct amount of salbutamol uh, whether we are giving salbutamol correct amount of salbutamol whether we have the steroid whether we have uh, given the correct amount of oxygen and we, that we have to see whether we have given correct diagnosis correct treatment and diagnosis wise is very important and we are once while we are doing these things we have to retake the history whether it is history and clinical evaluation whether we are doing the correct thing actually uh, i will uh, uh, actually i will give uh, next slide i will give uh, one s ray when we see s ray this there is uh, what you can see is that there is uh, hyperinflation of this area then uh, there is uh, there is uh, here there, there's inequal side both side can you send uh, can you type or can you tell some somebody can tell this what is the diagnosis here or what is the what you can suspect in this this patient can you type
the new one. Uh, it is new thorax. Here, this here you can see that uh, this not this uh, away markings you can see. You have new thorax. Uh, you have to have uh, the uh, uh, depleted lung part. You can, you can use your lung marking. You can see somewhere here. This new thorax in huge new. It should be huge new. Then you can see the lung marking here. But here we can see. Here actually uh, it's not new thorax. This is almost all. It's not bully rupture. Again, bully rupture again. Yeah, this thing, and you can see pre yeah, here, and uh, again uh, there you bully rupture again similar to. Yes. Why is this? Uh, why this is? Uh, uh, why this is a uh, uh, inequal both side? In uh, this, this is this side actually there is no pneumothorax, but here because of air trapping, there is this uh, this the part is hyperinflated, hyperinflated left lung. There is uh, collapse, so this normal uh, collapse, so normal right lung. Then uh, what? What would be the reason? It could be the reason is reason could be there is something obstructing here. You know the ball L effect. Uh, ball L effect. Then uh, uh, therefore, yeah, trapping in this area. Uh, yeah, trapping in this area. Therefore, uh, therefore you. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, there is. Uh, Stagnation of the air, trapping of the air, this part, and we get hyperinflated of this part. It's due to actually this child, this this particular patient is due to pneumothorax, but it could be due to again due to mucus plug. Mucus plug can be obstructed in uh, this uh, airway and it may cause as a uh, foreign body and ball valve effect, then uh, may cause this same scenario. But if they, you have inequal both side, inequal hyperinflation, then we have to uh, we have to get the proper history. And the, here actually they get, get, they get, get, give it proper history. Then uh, we uh, child may uh, proper history. Um, child has get some uh, nothing. Then they have to, uh, aspirated uh, uh, put particle. Uh, that causes this uh, hyperinflation. This is very important. Uh, good history. At the pneumothorax, actually, you have to. You can one thing is you can uh, uh, you can differentiate pneumothorax. Due to one reason, one thing is uh, that uh, inequal uh, chest movement. Other thing is uh, um, hyper resonance. Other thing is uh, AI entry will be low. It, uh, it could be there in this patient as well. In chest X-ray, in pneumothorax, you can see uh, actually pre AI yeah, and uh, actually this. Uh, this uh, this contour of the lung will be missing. There will be uh, contour of lung will be missing, and uh, you can see that lung contour is not there because this lung, lung is no more there in uh, this periphery. Therefore, contour is missing. Other thing is, you may get uh, depleted lung part in this part. So, okay. Then we mo may move into next part. Then. Uh, then if we are no improvement, then we have to go for uh, mechanical ventilation. Then uh, you have to definitely get genius uh, uh, input before going to this step. Then uh, even uh, you may go into uh, nebulation, but it is uh, uh, intubation. But intubation is very, very difficult uh, in this season because uh, in, uh, you because uh, lung is uh, it's not uniform, uh, it's heterogeneous disease. Therefore, uh, there may be more and more problem, and uh, that uh, it is we should not uh, go for those uh, level. Actually, we have to uh, prevent uh, going for men mechanical ventilation because mechanical ventilation very problematic in a patient with uh, asthma. Actually, uh, therefore, uh, we have to because this this is the earlier uh, sac this uh, uniform uneven distribution. So some alveoli are fully distended, some uh, collapse, some. Uh, Partially uh, distended, therefore, it is very difficult to uh, give, give go for intubation. Then we should we should uh, we have to give go uh, if there is no uh, other option. Then, but we, we it is easy easy if we can manage before going to intubation. And uh, for indication for intubation, is child is having uh, hypoxemia despite high very high concentration of oxygen. Then uh, child is having. Uh, Unrepeated work of breathing that enable to speak and severe and uh, life threatening attack, then altered uh, altered mental status and cardiorespiratory arrest. But uh, then 
we, we have to uh, go for uh, intubation if there is uh, this side. This. But if in, when the intubation, it should be done by the most experienced, skillful and experienced person in the team. Because uh, this uh, intubation in the asthma is very, very dangerous, very, very dangerous. Therefore, it should be done by the most skillful, most experienced person in the unit. Therefore, uh, we have to, uh, at the initial case, we should not go for this thing, but uh, we can give, go, we have to, if there is uh, other, no other option, we have to go for it, but uh, we should be uh, done by most skillful person and action should be taken by most skillful person. Then uh, if there's intubation, we should not give uh, attracurian or morphine because uh, there is a problem with these things. Ketamine is the drug of choice for intubation. Then uh, to uh, give you an uh, overview that uh, we have to give uh, initial uh, mild and moderate, uh, mild attacks of bronchial asthma, uh, mild attacks of exacerbation, we can even manage at home. And in his moderate and severe form, we come to the emergency department. We have to uh, give early uh, action and early nebulization, probably uh, preferably by bo using both uh, salbutamol and ipropopion along with the usage of uh, steroid. And uh, usually we can get improvement with these actions. But if we fail, we can go down the ladder. We have already discussed these things. Uh, then, uh, 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 then as uh, this has to, uh, finally, actually, this we have to. Uh, this is the message you have to uh, go home. This uh, this early identification and prompt action is key in the management of uh, uh, asthmaticus. We have to pick them early, uh, give the treatment early, uh, and get the solution early. Then we have to early and quick prompt action is important. Then uh, next one is oxygen driven nebulization is important. I uh, again again uh, I will stress this out. Oxygen driven nebulization is important. Then uh, magnesium sulfate should consider early, but you have to make sure that you are you give for the correct patient with the correct diagnosis, and we have to monitor this child throughout uh, this this thing. It is very important. Then uh, intubation and ventilation should be kept for last resort. It should be the last resort. Thank you very much. Questions? You have any questions? Uh, so uh, can we can we really use repeated cycles of magnesium sulfate? We were thought it's not only uh, no. Actually, we can use it uh, repeat boluses. It's actually, it, we, we before giving the repeat bolus, we have to make sure that we are giving the correct diagnosis, and that it should be uh, decided by uh, expert. Uh, we can give second bo second or third boluses. We have given it. Uh, but uh, it should be decided by uh, the experienced uh, person and uh, it is it is, uh, it is clinical decision actually uh, ketamine actually we can give uh, uh, but uh, it is we should not give uh, up to that stage uh, before going to that stage actually uh, some of the senior should intervene Yeah. yeah uh, say so low dose of uh, low dose prednisolone or steroid inhaler increase the risk of acquiring COVID. No, actually, uh, the, actually that that those are that there's no uh, uh, when we give the uh, steroid for uh, low dose steroid means uh, I know that uh, inhaled steroid no there's no risk of COVID in with the inhaled steroid because if their child is asthma. We have to give uh, continuous continue. We have to continue uh, prevent the medication. That is one. So, um, I have seen some of the parents. Uh, they have uh, they have uh, stopped this uh, in uh, prevent the medications. Prevent us, but we have to continue prevent us. Actually, we should not. So mild to uh, mild to moderate exacerbation. Actually, uh, 
in home actually uh, if we have we can use it very frequently as well but if we, we if it is more than if we use it more than four hourly uh, then uh, we have to come to hospital actually may, most important thing is uh, we have to uh, most important uh, important thing is we have to uh, we have to use prevent the medication and uh, it, it now actually now world is going for towards different direction then that actually uh, uh, cell bottom alone may not be helpful then we have to use some uh, steroid as well as cell bottom uh, and we can use cell bottom even for hourly we can use yeah any questions <laughs> Yeah, today time is uh, this. Uh, we are going. Yeah. No questions. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, sir. thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next. Uh, Rajita. Sir, can you Ilan Kaudi? Sir, sir, already online. Right. Oh, oh, sir. May sir, may lecture may sir forty minutes thirty minutes forty minutes thirty minutes. Sir, eighty percent answer. Eighty percent answer. Answer. Thank you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Rajita, can you hear me? Yes, yes, catch. Yeah. Okay, then I, I, I hope uh, you can see the. Uh... Yes, can see, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, we'll start the uh, presentation. Uh, so, yeah, just give me a second. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, good afternoon. I am Dr. Asanga Rajapaksha. I am uh, the consultant pediatrician at Base Hospital Galgamo. So, in the next 40 minutes or so, we will uh, uh, focus on the circulatory issues in a critically ill child. Uh, so, this is basically about management of shock. Uh, and uh, during the presentation, you can use the chat box to post any questions. Uh, and also at the end, I'll give a give some question time for you to ask questions. Now, as you know, uh, circulation is an extremely important part in newborn, uh, sorry, newborn and pediatric care. And in a critically ill child, you will see during your intern period, so many cases of uh, impending shock as well as uh, established shock. So you have to know very well how to manage these patients uh, and how to identify. Now, if you look at uh, a critically ill child, you look at the ABCD approach and uh, some people use this uh, triangle. Now, you one, one, one line of the triangle is the airway and breathing, which we have so far discussed. Then another line is circulation and organ perfusion. Then the other one is appearance and the brain perfusion. So in this lecture, we are going to focus on uh, the circulation. Now, the objectives of this lecture is assessing the circulation in a critically ill child uh, 
compensated versus uncompensated shock then some case discussions of different types of shock and then we'll recap the general principles all right uh, i'll try to keep this as simple as possible and you can as i said before post questions in the chat box so how do you rapidly assess the circulation of a child now when you get a critical ill child uh, so you first assess the airway and breathing and then you look at the circulation so you check the pulse rate and you can check the pulse volume you can feel the volume whether it's low volume pulse or normal volume pulse then you uh, look for the capillary refill time so what you do is you press for 5 seconds you say 1 in 1000 2 in 1000 3 in 1000 4 in 1000 5 in 1000 then let it go count again 1 in 1000 2 in 1000 3 in 1000 like that so if it fills up within 2 seconds that is normal but if it hello hello excuse me yeah uh, give me one second it's an urgent call sorry yeah very sorry about that uh, sorry about the interruption okay so you uh, you check for capillary refill time now uh, when you check for the capillary refill time uh, make sure that you press on a place where you can see because in a older child especially dark skin child uh, you might have to press on the palm or the nail bed okay you you won't be able to see it like this in a in a dark skin child then check the blood pressure uh, then you can look at the skin color whether the skin color is pale and uh, whether the skin temperature is uh, cold whether the child is periphery is cold okay so those these are the things you assess in a uh, child to assess the circulation now yeah now uh, what is the physiology behind this why, why do you check all these things now i'll go through this briefly now the delivery of oxygen to the tissues do2 depends on cardiac output the hemoglobin and the arterial oxygen saturation now the cardiac output and the total peripheral resistance determines the mean arterial pressure so the mean arterial pressure you can get an idea of the mean arterial pressure by checking the blood pressure then you can get an idea about the peripheral perfusion by looking at cold peripheries and capillary refill time then the cardiac output as you remember in your physiology uh, equals uh, it, it is proportionate to heart rate and stroke volume so heart rate you can check pulse rate you can check the pulse volume also and the stroke volume you can assess by preload because stroke volume depends on the preload afterload and the contractility of the heart so the the uh, preload if the preload is increased the jugular venous pressure will be increased the central venous pressure will be increased uh, and the, there will be hepatomegaly paop is a pulmonary arterial occlusion pressure which we will only assess in a certain icu settings then the contractility of the heart if the contractility is impaired you will see uh, gallop rhythm uh, like in heart failure and you will also see preload feature now when you look at shock there are two types of shock uh, compensated and uncompensated shock now the differences are very important in compensated shock uh, you can see the extremities are cold usually the child will be pale the child will be tachycardic peripheral pulses will be weak 
capillary refill time will be prolonged. So these are the main features. But if you look at the central pulses, the, that means the, the, the femoral pulse or the, the, the carotid pulse, they will be more or less of normal volume still. Blood pressure usually will be normal, but you have to diagnose, you have to detect uh, narrow pulse pressure, which is very important because if the pulse pressure is 20 or less, that means the child is going into show. So that is the first feature, feature about blood pressure, Na narrow pulse pressure, you have to detect it early. Then the child will initially be agitated when he's becoming hypoxic, he'll be agitated. Uh, and if you look at the urine output, it will be reduced. So this is compensated shock. So during this period, the body will use the compensatory mechanisms and uh, it will try to preserve the blood flow to the vital organs like the brain, heart and the kidneys. So that is why the peripheries are getting shut down. But there will be a situation where the shock is progressing. The compensatory mechanisms are not good enough to provide uh, adequate perfusion. So therefore, it becomes decompensated. So now the peripheries will be cold, extremities will be paled and mottled, pulse rate will so, show severe tachycardia, the peripheral pulses will be weak, and the capillary refill time will be prolonged, uh, the central pulses will be, uh, now even the central pulses will start feel weak, and now the blood pressure is crashing, both the systolic and blood pressure will start falling. The child may be uh, uh, unresponsive, comatose, and urine output will usually be absent by this level. And that now the child is developing a metabolic acidosis so that breathing pattern can become acidotic. So now if the child is showing this level of shock, especially the BP is coming down, that is quite severe, uncompensated shock. So you have to act very fast to save the child's life, okay? So now uh, the principles of initial stabilization, whether it is compensated or uncompensated shock, the most important thing you have to get IV access. And if IV access is not uh, possible now, if the child is seriously collapsed, if the vessels are collapsed, you can't get IV access. Uh, so then in, in, uh, you will have to try and get intraosseous access. Intraosseous access. And uh, uh, then once you get access, then you have to take blood for the basic investigations. You can do a capillary blood sugar immediately, full blood count, blood culture, electrolytes and blood gases and grouping. But again, the investigations depend on the, the condition and the suspected condition of the patient. So you may not do all these things on all occasions. It will depend on the situation. But the most important thing is, as soon as you get IV access, you give a fluid bolus of normal saline. So normal saline uh, is the first fluid we will give because that will open up the microcirculation. You give normally 20 milliliters per kilogram. There are a few ex exceptions, which I will tell you later. Uh, now, there are situations where you get IV access, you just get in the uh, cannula, but blood is not coming because the child is in severe shock. So in that case, don't waste time trying to take blood for a long time. Just give the fluid bolus. The circulation will improve. Then you can put a second cannula and take blood. Okay. Now we'll uh, go for some case discussions. All right. Uh, now this case, okay, these are common cases you will get in, in when you're doing your clinical practice. So this is a child, let's say a three-year-old child admitted uh, with shock to ANE. And when you look at the child, you see the child has a erythematous rash. So these are several pictures of several children. Uh, erythematous rash, which is itchy and blanching. The child may also have some facial swelling and swelling of the lips. Uh, so the child is also in shock. Sometimes the child may have abdominal pain as well. So what do you think is the condition? Yes, it is anaphylactic shock, isn't it? So you have the, the typical urticarial type of rash. 
sometimes you don't get the urticarial rash but you get this edema this is due to angioedema which occurs at a relatively deeper levels and the child is in shock so this is anaphylactic shock okay so now this child is here so you have to assess the child with a b c d approach so the child may have strido right so whenever you have a child with shock if you are there you have to call for help because this is an emergency and if possible raise the foot end of the bed because the child is in shock so you keep the airway open the airway opening uh, positioning you were told in the morning i think you look at the breathing now there are recessions respiratory rate is 50 saturation is say 88% so what do you do any critically ill child you put high flow oxygen with a face mask 10 to 15 liters you connect the child to a pulse oximeter check the saturation right so if it is anaphylactic shock before you do anything else the first thing is i am adrenaline so you uh, sorry uh, you check the circulation also uh, so the pulse is 190 per minute uh, the blood pressure is 80 by 40 capillary fill time is 4 seconds so child is in shock so the first thing is even before you try a cannula you give i am adrenaline so that adrenaline dose is 0.01 mg milliliters per kilogram 1 in 1000 okay so the 1 in 1000 means it's undiluted you take it directly from the vial uh, so if the child is like 10 kg you give 0.1 ml right uh, so even if the child has strido a child with anaphylaxis has strido again the strido will settle with your im adrenaline right so that is the most important thing don't hesitate you give the adrenaline first and uh, put iv cannula as soon as possible take you can take blood for the basic investigations and you give a fluid bolus of normal saline 20 ml per kg in anaphylactic shock you can just give 20 ml per kg and now you reassess so when you reassess sometimes with the first dose of adrenaline and first fluid bolus the child will improve then there's no problem but if the child does not improve you will have to give it every 5 minutes you can repeat your im adrenaline okay Uh, and always remember in any child with shock so you get your first cannula in you get your give your fluid bolus and as soon as possible uh, you get in a second cannula as well because any emergency you ideally need two cannulas because one may go out you might have to transfer the child so you need two working cannulas right so once you so look at the circulation and take the corrective uh, actions you can look for disability avpu uh, i think you know all these things because you don't have time to go for the uh, glasgow coma scale so you look at the avpu scale to see whether the child is alert responds to verbal stimuli responds to pain or unresponsive and in anaphylactic shock it's always important to look for the allergen if the child still has the allergen now say the child has uh, spread some perfume mother's perfume on their body and is anaphylactic to that then of course you might have to wash it off right so you remove the allergen if possible and you keep reassessing repeatedly all right uh, so that is how you manage anaphylaxis so i am adrenaline i told you now you can get use this rough guide like a one year old child like 0.05 ml of 1 in 1000 adrenaline 10 years like 0.5 uh but again better to like estimate the child's weight and then go for 0.01 mg uh milliliters per kilogram all right so that is about anaphylaxis if you have any questions please please put the questions on the chat box i'll answer them at the end of the lecture so the second case the second case is a child who is admitted with shock uh this time again with a rash this child has a history of fever the child is ill and has a they has this type of rash so this rash you can see is sort of a, uh, a non blanching rash you can see when it doesn't blanch with the glass so it's a hemorrhagic rash uh non blanching type of rash so this what do you think this yeah why do you what do you think this this rash is yeah this looks like a meningococcal rash so this is a meningococcal septicemia coming with septic shock so if a child comes with with a shock like this so what will you do again you look at the 
airway, make sure the airway is open. So child is in shock. You call for help, make sure the airway opening manuals are done. If necessary, you might put oral airway and basically secure the airway. They look at the breathing. So child is having recessions, uh, tachypnea, saturation is 96%. So again, you put your high flow oxygen, monitor saturation. Now you come to the circulation. So the pulse rate is 190, tachycardia, blood pressure is 80 by 30, cap refill time is five seconds. So child is in shock. So again, as soon as possible, you get a cannula in as quickly as possible. You check blood sugar, take blood culture, uh, blood CRP and full blood count. And without delay, you give your first fluid bolus again, normal saline, the okay, isotonic saline, 20 ml per kg. Septic shock, it's 20 ml per kg. So then you reassess. So you give the bolus, you reassess. If the child improves with the first bolus, fine. But if the child does not improve with the first bolus, you can give a second bolus. Now, a child with septic shock, if the child does not recover fully, uh, the circulation doesn't recover fully after two boluses, then of course it's time to consider intubation and starting inotropes. By this time, you should have taken senior advice or the consultant's advice. You may have contacted the ICU because this child needs proper care like most likely need ICU care. Uh, then you look at the disability, make sure the airway is protected. And again, as soon as you have, you are, you have given your fluid bolus and the child is uh, circulatory wise stable, you give your first dose of IV antibiotics because this is septic shock. Now, the, usually the first antibiotic you will give is a third generation cephalosporin like cephotaxine or cephotaxone. Then you give the fluid bolus and you repeatedly reassess the child. And then uh, you go back to the airway, breathing, circulation, reassess the child and stabilize the child, and then transfer the child to a proper care, uh, maybe HDU, maybe ICU, depending on the situation. Okay. Right. Now, again, if you have any questions, you can uh, put on the chat box. I will answer at the end. Case number three. This is a five year old child admitted to a &E with five days history of high fever. No fever since yesterday. Child is ill and child is drowsy. Child has complained of body pains and muscle pains and there's a particular rash on admission. So a child like this who had high fever, who has body pains, muscle pains and fever settled since yesterday now coming in shock. So what do you think this is? Yeah, this is most likely most likely dengue shock. So in the, so we look at the child, what are the features? So look at the airway. The child is drowsy, but the airway is open. You call for help. Look at the breathing. Uh, there are recessions. Uh, respiratory rate is 25. Saturation is 95%. Uh, any critical ill child, you put high flow oxygen with a mask. You check for the, uh, you connect the saturation probe. Now the pulse is 190, it is thready. BP is 70 by 60. You can see the pulse pressure is 10. It's narrow and the pressure is actually starting to drop. And the cap refill time is three seconds. So this child now is going into shock. So what you do is you get a cannula as soon as possible. And again, you try and do an inward PCV as soon as possible. Now, when you go to wards, either medicine or pediatrics, you will see there are these uh, hematocrit machines in your ward, so you have to learn how to use them. Uh, you put the IV cannula, you take blood for, you can take check a blood sugar, uh, full blood count, you can do a CRP grouping uh, and clotting studies and SGPTOT if you get enough blood. But sometimes in a patient with shock, you actually with the first cannula, you don't get a lot of blood, difficult to get, the child is in shock. So in that case, don't waste time, you can just take whatever is coming, maybe before the full blood count, maybe grouping. Grouping is important here because you might have to give blood. And then you give your fluid bolus. Now in dengue shock, remember the bolus is 10 ml per kilogram. A normal saline bolus, 10 ml per kilogram. So if it is compensated shock, you give it a little slowly over one hour. But if it is uncompensated shock, like if the blood pressure is crashing, uh, the pulse is like not palpable, uh, then of course you have to give a rapid bolus. Uh, 
in that situation uncompensated shock we might have to give 20 ml per kg up to 20 ml per kg until the pulse and the circulation is improved now if the child does not improve with your first bolus you can give a second bolus again 10 ml per kg but if the child does not improve again then you can go for your next strand boluses your colloid boluses that will always be 10 ml per kilogram over one hour uh, and see but remember as i told before the first bolus is always saline not colloids because uh, colloids do not they, have, they are large molecules they no, do not open the open up the microcirculation so to open up the microcirculation you have to give normal saline then depending on the situation you might need to give a blood transfusion again uh, that will have to be discussed later because there will be a separate lecture on dengue right then you do these things and you go back we assess the child and uh, decide on continuous management now remember you will also see dengue children purely with dehydration so they are they can be dengue fever they can be dengue hemorrhagic fever but no shock they just have dehydration so these children uh, will complain of reduced urine output you will do a pcv and the pcv might be high due to the dehydration but that doesn't always say that the child is leaking so the circulation you check the pulse the bp the capillary field time type will be normal maybe mild tachycardia that's all and the wbc and platelet count will show either normal or maybe dropping because even in dengue fever the the platelet count may drop a little wbc may drop less than 5000 but the circulation is normal so you can have a child with dehydration with high pcv but you have to identify a child with shock with the features i told you before then in dengue what is really important is once a child is admitted to the ward now, now if a child is admitted without shock child is in the ward you have to identify when the child starts leaking that is the most important thing so how do you identify the point where the child starts leaking is when uh, if you take x-ray recubitus you might see this lamella effusion now you know the child is starting leaking or in a dengue hemorrhagic fever child platelets go below 100,000 generally that is the time the child will start leaking uh, if the pcv starts rising like if it's rising more than 10 percent from the base value or goes to 20 percent that means the child is definitely leaking and you might have pleural effusions you might have uh, SITs. so uh, nowadays in many hospitals the doctors in the ward are trained to use ultrasound abdomen to detect the beginning of leak so once you know the child has started leaking then you can go for your management of the leaking phase actually what you want to do is prevent this child from going into shock all right so the pcv will be rising so now in dengue fever in dengue hemorrhagic fever now the child is in the ward you identify the child going into leakage phase from any of the things that i mentioned before so then you have to manage the leakage phase by matching the amount of leaking the child is having so you give your iv fluids to match the amount of fluid leaking out so you calculate the fluid quota uh, maintainers plus five percent deficit that will be given over 48 hours so adults it will be different so now this amount how will you give you can start from like 3 ml per kg per hour uh, and gradually increase if the child is showing evidence of fluid leaking like increase pulse rate or reduce in output or raised pcv but actually some authorities say you can start at even a lower even at a lower value like 1.5 ml per kilogram per hour right uh, I personally start at around 1.5. Then if the child is stable, you keep at, keep the fluid at that level. If the child is showing tachycardia, reduce urine output, then of course you can gradually increase to like 3 ml power. Uh, and uh, yeah, like this, so you can start like 1.5 ml per kg power. Then uh, like you can go up to 3 ml per kg power, 5 ml per kg power, up, like up to 7 ml per kg power, you can go if the child shows evidence of increased leak. But if the child is improving at any point, the pulse rate is stabilizing 
urine output is normal, you can actually immediately go back to your low rate. Uh, now, while you are in this, while you are in this, child might actually go into shock. So then you will realize the pulse will become weak, extremities become cold, the pulse pressure becomes narrow, the urine output will be low, okay, less than 0.5 ml per kg power, and the PCV will be rising. So if these things are happening, you know the child is going into shock. Now this is compensated shock because the, still the BP is normal within normal limits, but the pulse pressure is pressure is getting narrow. So now what you do is compensated shock in dengue, you increase your fluid to 10, 10 ml per kilogram over one hour. So usually they will improve in this, right? Right. So here we go, the, you start increase the fluid, child is in shock, you give 10 ml per hour, 10 ml per kg power. And then once the child uh, improves, then you can cut down on the fluids again. So there will be a period of equilibrium and there will be a period of reabsorption, right? So if the patient in shock, you give your fluid bolus, but the patient is still not improving, then what will you do? Now there are four things which can make the patient not improve. It can be acidosis, bleeding, uh, internal bleeding. So acidosis you can detect by venous blood gas, you can correct it. Uh, Bleeding, now it is very important. If the child is not improving with, if the shock is not improving with fluids, you do a PCV. So if the PCV is increasing, you can say that the, the leaking is increasing. But the, the child is in shock, PCV is dropping. Now that means child is bleeding inside. So that is an indication to give blood. Uh, and child may not improve due to hypocalcemia. So doing calcium is very important. Electrolytes are important, important because hyponatremia can cause poor improvement. Then of course, hypoglycemia. So these are correctable things. So it's very important. When a child goes into dengue shock, you check for these things, all right? Uh, so I have told these things before. Uh, now, uh, yeah, now again, these few slides I'm going to skip because uh, the, you will get a detailed lecture on uh, dengue fever and dengue hemorrhagic fever, I think by Dr. Nalin Kitulata. So you will uh, get these things in detail during that lecture. All right. Now I will move on to the next topic. Now, uh, now we have discussed uh, anaphylactic shock. We have discussed septic shock. We have discussed dengue shock. Now you can get shock from cardiac causes or due to an obstruction in the circulatory system. So this is called obstructive shock. All right. So you can get a obstruction of the circulation of a child due to cardiac tamponade, maybe due to a cardiac contusion in trauma, maybe an effusion, right? Then you can get a tension pneumothorax as was mentioned in the previous lecture so you can get a tension pneumothorax it can shift the media steiner and the, the the great vessels can get obstructed or kinked then you can get a pulmonary a large pulmonary embolus or other structural obstructions like especially coarctation of the aorta or aortic valve stenosis uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome especially neonate so these things will cause obstruction to the circulation and will present with circulatory failure you can also get a cardiogenic shock, purely heart failure, failure of the pumping action of the heart and child is going into shock because there is inadequate pumping of uh, uh, blood into the systemic circulation. So you can get myocarditis, cardiomyopathy and arrhythmias, right? Both tachyarrhythmias and radiarrhythmias uh, like complete heart block can uh, present with cardiogenic shock. So the clinical features of cardiogenic shock are different from clinical features of other shocks. Now that is very important. At presentation, you have to identify whether this is a cardiac shock or some other shock. Now, if you look at the other shocks we described before, septic shock, dengue shock, anaphylactic shock, they have certain common features, but in ca cardiac failure, these things will be there. 
you will have a hepatomegaly, right? The child will be too ill to ask whether it's tender hepatomegaly. If, if the child is responsive, you can ask whether it's tender, but definitely you will have a hepatomegaly. And in heart failure, you might get a gallop rhythm. And uh, now in certain, if, if, if it's an obstructive, obstructive lesion, uh, there will be very poor output and uh, femoral pulses may be absent. And in certain cases, there will be cardiac murmurs. You might check for hepatodiangular response, it may be present. So the primary, really, the most important thing is hepatomegaly. Uh, and of course, it is not mentioned here, you can look for crepitations, uh, crackles in the lung fields uh, uh, in heart failure. So if these things are there, you know, this is a heart failure. Now, another thing you have to uh, think about is now you have a child in shock. You don't know whether the child is in septic shock or cardiogenic shock. It, it, it is not clear sometimes in the history. So you give your first fluid bolus. So after the first fluid bolus, if the child develops hepatomegaly and develops crackles in the lungs, which are not there before, that means it's most likely a cardiogenic shock because with the fluid the child deteriorated, right? So you have to suspect this. So how do you manage cardiogenic shock? You can't give a lot of fluids. So your fluid bolus should be quite cautious, five to 10 ml per kg. Uh, and for look, look for aggravation of heart failure after IV fluids, whether they are uh, developing hepatomegaly, development of new respiratory crackers. So, and then if it is a cardiogenic shock, you can't give too much fluids. So you have to decide uh, to use inotropes fairly early. So you might use adrenaline, you might use robutamine, but again, as intern house officers, you leave these decisions to the seniors. So your main thing is identify shock, suspect it is cardiogenic shock, and give a cautious fluid bolus while informing your seniors of what to do because cardiogenic shock always needs expert opinion. Okay. Right. So now we have gone through our scenarios. Uh, now I will go through the general principles. So generally, in most shocks, you give 20 ml per kg fluid bolus. In compensated shock, you might give it slower, but in uncompensated shock, it's always a rapid bolus of 20 ml per kg, right? Uh, but I told you there are certain exceptions. Now, there are certain situations where you give only 10 ml per kg boluses. You don't just give uh, 20 ml per kg. So what are these options? What are these situations? In a newborn baby, in a newborn baby, you don't usually give 20 ml per kg uh, as one go. So you give 10 ml per kg and reassess. Under one year, uh, like in an infant under one year, again, give 10 ml per kg and reassess. Heart disease I mentioned. Diabetic ketoacidosis, it's, it's a small bolus, 10 ml per kg. Dengue shock syndrome, 10 ml per kg. And trauma patients. Again, you do, don't give a massive bolus, right? So you will get... These other topics, they will be covered later. So again, some general principles. So you have a child with shock. Again, ABC approach, positioning, keep flat, elevate the legs if possible, keep the airway open, give oxygen, monitor oxygen saturation. Uh, and then you get IV access. If not possible, get intraoseous access, get blood, blood for investigations and give a fluid bolus, either 10 or 20 per kg. So then your fluid bolus is a must in every shock, but after that, it depends on the spe specific diagnosis. So if septic shock, you give antibiotics and you might give adrenaline or dopamine uh, as your, 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 your inotrope infusion, if not improving it to initial management. Uh, so there are things called warm shock and cold shock. Uh, uh, you can read them up. Uh, and finally, if, if not, none of these things are working, you might actually decide on a steroid infusion. But uh, basically, most important thing is suspect septic shock, give you fluid bolus, give you antibiotic and monitor. Anaphylactic shock, you give you adrenaline IM. Fluids, if not improving with your fluids and adrenaline, you might have to consider adrenaline infusion. Now, one more thing. Uh, I think we see we have a few minutes more, so I will uh, discuss this uh, because if you do pediatrics, you might see this type of patient. Now, you will 
you might see a newborn baby who was okay at birth then they will present in three or four days of life suddenly collapsed the circulation is collapsed child is in shock right so when a newborn baby comes to you like that there are three main possibilities one is sepsis septic shock one is a rare metabolic disorder which is very rare so the other possibility is this is a duct dependent circulation the child may have some sort of a uh, congenital heart disease but the systemic circulation depends on the functioning of the uh, duct ductus uh, arteriosus if when the ductus closes few days after birth the circulation collapses so if you get a child like this the only way to keep the child safe until somebody does the surgery is to start prostaglandin infusion so we use prostaglandin e1 which is also called alprostodil uh, you start the infusion and immediately contact pediatric cardiologist send send for echo and once they diagnose it they will discuss with the uh, uh, pe the this uh, pediatric cardiothoracic surgeons and will arrange an emergency surgery uh, you might see some children like that when you are doing your uh, pediatric internship right so you have managed the shock now uh, now once you have managed the shock what is the final outcome so the final outcome is you want to normalize the end organ perfusion so the urine output should be more than 1 ml per kg power the child's mental state will be normal there will be no hypoxia no acidosis good uh, tissue oxygenation uh, normal acid base balance and normal lactate levels uh, scvo2 is like central venous oxygen saturation if you have central venous access you can check that in icu setup that indicates if it's more than 70% that indicates a good balance between your tissue oxygen uh, delivery to the tissues and uh, the utilization of oxygen uh, right now that is the end of my circulation lecture this part of course was included uh, in a previous lecture uh, this is a snake bite case but i i saw in your schedule there is a snake management of snake bite lecture later so i think tomorrow so i'm i'm not going to do that uh, so we will skip this and you can ask questions if you have any so i'm going to go to the chat box and uh, see what the questions are uh, so also if you can if you have, want to ask a question directly you can ask by unmuting your uh, right here the first question how much time duration we should complete the fluid bolus i think i answered that question so in a like a dengue shock early shock like compensated shock you can give the fluid over 1 hour 10 ml per kg and monitor but if it is uh, uh, uncompensated shock on a, due to anything especially septic shock or anaphylactic shock it is rapid bolus there's no time you just put the cannula and give it as quickly as possible until you can feel the pulse until you can get the bp reading uh yeah so then someone has asked what is the maximum dose of adrenaline we can repeat so that is in uh, anaphylactic shock there is no limit like recently we had a child we gave uh, four doses of adrenaline four repeat doses of adrenaline every 5 minutes uh, until the child improve right uh, and actually now the thing is if the child doesn't improve by like three or four doses of im adrenaline and about two fluid boluses you will have to consider starting adrenaline infusion right uh, right yeah so about, there somebody has asked about colloids yes i have mentioned if you first always we give you a normal saline isotonic saline bolus maybe after like one or two boluses you can consider colloids right uh, yeah somebody has asked in compensated shock when do we give dextran 40 now in compensated shock i told you uh, normally so first bolus is with normal saline so if the normal saline bolus 
give 10 ml per kg and usually the child will improve so you give the first bolus and at the second bolus also you can give normal saline because you have only given 10 ml per kg then the second bolus you can give 10 ml per kg child doesn't improve in dengue shock then as a third bolus you can give dextran okay So somebody has asked in dengue shock, uh, if the child is bleeding inside, can we try blood before trying dextran? Yes, perfectly. Because if you give the first bolus and yeah, dengue shock child, uh, the child is uh, in shock, you give your normal saline bolus and meanwhile the child doesn't improve and you check the PCV, the PCV is dropping. So you know the child is bleeding. So the best thing to give is blood. But I think you will discuss this in uh, more detail in the next lecture. Right? Uh, yeah, many of them are about dengue, so that will be covered in the next lecture. Uh, yes, so now um, some person has asked in shock, do we need to give fluid through central lines? No. Now, now, if you are in the ward or in the ETU, when the child comes to you, you will just put a peripheral cannula. So you give your fluid bolus through the cannula you have, right? So central lines will be put in the ICU setup. So to send the child to ICU, you have to resuscitate the child in the ward setup or in the ETU setup. So it's always in the peripheral cannula, you give your bolus. So in children, remember, I told you, try to have two cannulas in every circulatory emergency. And always try to get a large bow cannula. In children, the large bow cannula is a blue cannula. All right? Uh, yeah. How do we manage hypovolemic shock in a case of diarrhea? It's the same. So you can get a uh, child with diarrhea with shock. You can get a child in shock. So it's simple. So again, you uh, it's just like septic shock. So you put in the cannula, you take the blood investigation, and you give your fluid bolus. Right? And if you think it's an invasive diarrhea, you can give an antibiotic as well. Right? So the principles of the management will be same. It, it doesn't change. Uh, right, and I think the last question is uh, in DK, diabetic ketoacidosis, giving 10 ml per kg rather than 20 ml per kg, what is the reason? Yeah, I think you might have a lecture on that. Basically, if you give too much fluids in the diabetic ketoacidosis, you might develop cerebral edema, which is a very dreaded complication. Right. So also, I think, yeah, uh, last question. Uh, how much fluid we give following hypovolemia secondary to nephrotic shock? Yes. Yeah. So children with nephrotic syndrome uh, can go into shock. The child is edematous, but the fluid has leaked out of the system. So the intravascular volume is very little. So they can go into shock. So again, in that type of situation, you, you can give fluid very quickly. Uh, 10 ml per kg, but I think the more important thing is we have to give human albumin at that situation because you have to uh, prevent the leaking and get some fluid back into the circulation, right? Okay, I think my time is up now. Uh, I will uh, finish the presentation here. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your participation. I think we'll hand over to the next presenter. Thank you very much. Right. So we'll start the next lecture. So just after the uh, shock lecture, so it's easy for me to uh, do this. So uh, the next one is early detection and management of dengue hemorrhagic fever. Uh, we are going to discuss about the current uh, concepts. So uh, before starting, 
so this is the uh, the national guidelines on the management of uh, pediatric dengue patients this was published in 2012 still valid we haven't got a, a recent uh, the, the new update so we are following these guidelines so when the when you are managing dengue heavily fever the first thing that you have to understand is management of dengue is not try to give minimum amount of fluid so that's a, a misnomer and it is not somehow try to give only maintenance plus 5% fluid during the critical phase again it's a misnomer and uh, the management of dengue is maintaining the hemodynamics with minimum amount of fluid so i think you can understand the difference between the first two slides and this so uh, uh, we are not interested about the amount of fluid that we are giving but we have to maintain the hemodynamics if you cannot maintain hemodynamics child will die if you can maintain hemodynamics child will survive so it's very important to maintain the hemodynamics but not like septic shock not like uh, anaphylactic shock we are trying to do this with minimum amount of fluid so this minimum amount may be maintenance may be half of the maintenance may be maintenance plus 20% so i don't know depending on the patient's condition depending on the uh, patient's uh, the hemodynamic status you may have to use small amount or a large amount of fluid so that depends on the hemodynamics not just because the diagnosis of thing because i'm i'm emphasizing emphasizing on this because a uh, lot of time in sri lanka what happens is we are trying to give very small amount of fluid when you diagnose dengue so that is not the case that you have to understand right so this is the take home message so we are trying to give minimum fluid in febrile phase this phase as of course we are going to elaborate in a minute uh, just sufficient fluid in critical phase again minimum fluid in uh, recovery phase but don't give unnecessary bolus so these are the uh, summary in this lecture so by doing this we can treat shock and we can avoid uh, organ damage because we are treating shock and we can prevent fluid overload also because we are giving just sufficient fluid to maintain the hemodynamics so we are treating shock we are preventing fluid overload so these are the main causes of death in dengue so if you can prevent these two definitely we can prevent the death and remember you, all of you know about the gaussian distribution or the normal distribution term. so dengue also will behave or distribute uh, the normal so you will have uh, main uh, there are a lot of patients who are in the middle so basically about 68% who can manage with maintenance plus 5% fluid guidelines district hospital and you will have uh, another small proportion sometimes even with maintenance fluid you can manage but remember there's another proportion another part of it uh, you need huge amount of fluid interventions thinking beyond guidelines tertiary care hospitals and sometimes needing icu so this is very very important so how can you diagnose dengue early that is very important because if you diagnose dengue early the management is very simple you can treat very easy but if you don't diagnose dengue early the management will be difficult so the other important thing is you know when you are diagnosing a disease but you usually what you are doing is uh, history examination and investigation but in dengue history and examination will not give you any clue sometimes so depends on the investigation the most important investigation here is full blood count so it's a very simple full blood count but if you, but you have to do it in day 3 that means after 48 hours of fever if you are doing a full blood count if the full blood count shows white cell count less than 5000 platelet count less than 150000 unless proven otherwise that is dengue in sri lanka so i am emphasizing day 3 full blood count white cell count less than 5000 platelet count less than 150000 that is dengue in sri lanka and these are the criteria for admissions in pediatrics so if your patient is having platelet less than 150000 you have to admit so what about this ns1 antigen lot of emphasis lot of people are doing it uh, so you know now because of this covid uh, you are discussing about the antigens 
So antigen is a part of the virus. So NS1 is a non-structural protein one. So it's a part of the virus. So we are trying to detect this with this test. So obviously this virus particle should be there for you to detect uh, this test to be positive. So NS1 will be positive on day one to day three, obviously, because when the, when the patient is developing antibodies, so this antigen will disappear. So it should be done early. So uh, the, if you are doing it, best results, best positive rate will be on day one. So that is important. So this is antigen. So now think, if you are getting antigen, your body will produce antibodies. First IgM, then IgG. So this is the first attack. So first thing, you are getting antigen. Your body will produce antibodies. Uh, then when the, the disease is cured, you know, most of the time, first attack of dengue is like any other viral infection, no big deal. So they, they will recover. But if the child develops the attack second time, now this antigen is coming to the body. But you have the memory cells. So body will produce IgG antibodies in large amount. We call it antibody surge. So if you're having antibody surge, then this antigen will be disappearing from your body very quickly. So what I'm trying to say is in secondary dengue, sometimes this antigen will be not in the body, even day one, day two, because this is very uh, quickly happening. So antibodies will come and neutralizing these antigens. So your antigen test will be negative. So that's the theory. So I am not going to go into detail. So you know better than me about this antigen antibody. So this is important. NS1 in primary and secondary dengue. In primary dengue, NS1 positive rate is more than 90%. So you can understand that. And in, but in secondary dengue, uh, the NS1 positive rate is only 55 to 70%. So it's about 50%. So that means 50% will be positive, 50% will be negative. So it is very important if you are doing this antigen, to remember this, you may miss 50% of secondary dengue if you are doing antigen. So be careful because in Sri Lanka, what matters is the secondary dengue. You should not miss secondary dengue because all the problems are with secondary dengue. So remember, if you're doing antigen, that's okay. Remember the, the, the problems with antigen. Right, so dengue and uh, dengue fever versus dengue hemorrhagic fever. Again, uh, this hemorrhagic nomenclature in this uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever is a misnomer. So uh, there, you don't have to have hemorrhages to say it's a dengue hemorrhagic fever. So difference between leak. If you have plasma leak, that is DHF. If you don't have plasma leak, that is DF. So difference between DF and DHF is plasma leakage. Then the clinical course of dengue. So we will have three phases, febrile, critical, and recovery phases. Febrile phase means it's like any other viral infection. We'll have high fever for two to three, seven days, facial flushing, for positive tonic test, uh, hemorrhaging that is, is uh, in large so they are there. Then you have critical phase. This is usually after three to five days of fever. Rapid drop of temperature, increased capillary leak. Uh, usually that uh, lasts for about 24 to 48 hours. You will have abdominal pain, hematocrit will go up, platelets are going down, liver derangement, clotting profile problems, bleeding, hyponatremia, hypoalbuminemia, respiratory failure, with all. You name all the problems in dengue are in this critical phase. Then you have the recovery phase. Don't worry, so we can deliberate on these things. So recovery phase, itchy recovery rash, pericardia, platelets are going up, uh, hematocrit becoming normal. So basically uh, the child is improving. So you can see the problem is critical phase. We are not worried about the febrile phase. We are not worried about the recovery phase. The problem is in the critical phase. So in dengue fever or DF, we have febrile phase and recovery phase, but no red area no uh, critical phase, but in DHF, we have febrile, critical, and recovery phases. Since we have a critical phase, that is the problem. This red area is the problem, right? So who are the high-risk patients? Infants, obese patients, prolonged shock, bleeding, encephalopathy, underlying diseases, pregnancy are high-risk. So if 
your patient belongs to this. So obviously, you will have infants less than one year, obese, prolonged shock, bleeding, encephalopathy, underlying diseases. So if they are there, those are high risk patients. So you have to be more vigilant about managing these patients. So be careful. These are the problematic patients. Then uh, this is about the prolonged shock. This slide is from Thailand. But they say if you have more than 10 hours untreated shock, death is inevitable. That doesn't mean after 10 hours, child is going to die. They will develop liver failure, renal failure, multi organ dysfunction, and die uh, after about two weeks or one month in ICU. So that the beginning of the beginning is there. Beginning is there. So more than 10 hours untreated death, untreated uh, the, the shock, death is inevitable. More than four, four hours untreated with liver failure, prognosis is 50%. With liver plus renal failure, prognosis is 10%. With three organ failures plus respiratory failure, prognosis is a miracle. So that is very, very important. That's why we have to detect shock, if possible to prevent shock, to avoid organ dysfunction and death. I know uh, you may not talk about the shock. Shock is inadequate tissue perfusion. So earliest sign of shock is uh, prolonged capillary refilling time. If your capillary refilling time is more than five seconds, that means uh, uh, it's a shock. So if you keep this level, so that is what we want. If it is uh, capillary refilling time is prolonged, you need to uh, treat. Right. So then major causes of death. So as I told you, if you give more fluid, the child will end up with uh, uh, fluid overload. But if you give less fluid, the child will end up with prolonged shock. So both are bad. Don't give more fluid, don't give less fluid. Because both are bad. Fluid overload as well as prolonged shock can cause death. So what you have to do is sufficient fluid in critical phase. If you give sufficient fluid in critical phase, you are not causing fluid overload, you are not causing prolonged shock. So obviously you can, should be prevent death. So that's the key. So if I want to prevent death in dengue, you should not give more fluid, you should not give less fluid. Right, so what about the fluid management? So here, the principles are minimum fluid in febrile phase, minimum fluid in recovery phase, but just sufficient fluid in critical phase. So that's the key. The danger is in the critical phase. You should not give more fluid, you should not give less fluid in critical phase. So how can I do that? So theory is very simple, but how can I do that? So these are the four things that you have to do to uh, achieve this goal. So identify the beginning of the leak, predict the end, try to give only maintenance plus 5% fluid, and match the leak. So these are the four things that you have to uh, do. So we'll go one by one. So identify the beginning of the leak. So this is how we identify. If your platelets are less than 100,000, if your PCV is rising towards 20%, if you have pleural effusions, ascites, low albumin, low cholesterol. So if you have these six things, that means the child is in uh, child is in uh, critical phase. In other words, the child has developed leaking. So these are the features of leaking. Platelets less than 100,000, PCV is rising towards 20%, pleural effusion, ascites, uh, low albumin, low cholesterol. So those are the features of uh, fluid leaking. Then this is very important graph. So concentrate about this. So this is my febrile phase. This is my critical phase. This is my recovery phase. So first look at the platelets. So during the febrile phase, platelets are dropping, dropping, dropping. So when the platelets are going below 100,000, that means patient is entering in the critical phase. So even in critical phase, platelets are dropping. And during the recovery phase, platelets are rising. So this is the uh, platelet graph. Then look at the white cell count graph. So white cells initially dropping, but when the patient is entering into critical phase, white cells are rising. So if you have serial white cell count, you can say platelets are dropping, white cell count initially dropping, but now rising. So if you can detect this point, you can easily detect the uh, entry into the critical phase. So that's the entry into the critical phase.
Right, sorry about that. So uh, anyway, so that's the, uh, the important point. So if you can uh, detect this platelet dropping for the visceral count is rising, so that's the point of entry into the critical phase. So if you can detect this, so that's very important. So as pediatricians, we are so happy because now uh, the, the parents are so worried. So they are doing these uh, visceral counts very frequently. And uh, so you are having frequent visceral counts. Sometimes they're doing BD, sometimes uh, even six hourly. So you have to, in front of you, uh, various counts are there. So you have to just elaborate on uh, these things, critically evaluate these uh, counts. So, so you can detect this uh, platelet dropping, but the visceral count is rising. So that's the end point of entry into the critical phase. That's very important. Right, then, so this is the second step. So predict the end. So this is the natural history. You are starting the leaking here. Gradually leak will go up. So maximum leak is around 24 hours. Then leak will go down and leak will stop by 48 hours. You are starting leaking. Maximum leak is around uh, 24 hours. Up to that point, leak is increasing. Then leak will go down gradually and the leak will stop by 48 hours. So we call this as a ascending limb and we call this part as descending limb. So this is the maximum leak. So we are starting leak, ascending limb, maximum leak is around 24 hours where yeah, patient can develop shock. Then we have descending limb, gradually leak will go down and leak will stop by 48 hours. So this is the natural history of the disease. So now think if your child is developing shock Today at 12 noon, we know till tomorrow 12 noon, the patient is in ascending limb. So tomorrow 12 noon, we are expecting some problems. So you can develop shock, you can develop various problems tomorrow 12 noon. Then after tomorrow 12 noon, till day after tomorrow 12 noon, you are in the descending limb. So amount of fluid should gradually go down. So that's what the natural history says. So you can predict this. So when you are managing a the dengue patient, this triangular shaped graph should be there in your mind when you are managing the patient. So then your management decisions will be very easy. Right, so then try to give uh, only maintenance plus 5% fluids during this time. So again, this try is very important because sometimes we may fail. So as I told you initially, your aim is not to give minimum amount of fluid. Your aim should be uh, maintain the hemodynamics so that uh, you are avoiding organ damage. So that may be maintenance, maintenance past 5, maintenance past 20%. So we don't know. So amount is depend on the patient's clinical condition. Right. So uh, for do this to the give only the maintenance past 5% fluid, what you should do is calculate the fluid for ideal body weight in the obese children. Because we know that in children, we are calculating fluid according to the body weight. So in obese children, uh, you have to calculate the calculate for the uh, ideal body weight rather than the real body weight. Then give only the amount needed to maintain hemodynamics and frequent monitoring and adjusting to it. And please don't give unnecessary boluses. So that is very important because we are talking about a leak in bucket. So if you fill this bucket very rapidly, you will have more and more leak. So then you have to manage uh, the plural effusions and SIDs later. So if you are uh, filling this bucket rapidly, so boluses should not be given unnecessarily. Then match the leak. So that's the very, very important thing. So if you are having leaking about 500 ml over one hour, if you are giving only 500 ml over one hour, that means basically you're matching the leak. So you're not causing fluid overload. You're not causing uh, the fluid depletion or you're not causing poor organ perfusion. So that's the key. If you can match the lead, you can win always. So how can you do that? So for that, you have to monitor these parameters. So you're monitoring urine output, PCV, pulse volume, peripheral coldness, capillary refilling time, and blood pressure. So six parameters are monitored because uh, by, by monitoring only one parameter, you, can get not, you cannot get any idea. So don't go by one parameter. Monitor all these six parameters. So then you can have some idea about the intravascular volume. So if your urine output is less than 5, 0.5 ml per kg power, your PCV is rising, the pulse volume is low, peripheral coldness is there, capillary refilling time is prolonged, uh, 
uh, and blood pressure is low, you know that the child's intravascular volume is not enough. So that's the key. But having said that, you may have done these things uh, uh, now. So uh, you know about the PCV, you are pricking the child, taking blood to the capillary tube and put some clay on either side. And then you're putting in the machine. Sometimes half of the thing is uh, machine will evaporate and you are having some number at the end. So what, the, what do you mean by this? I don't know. Pulse volume, as an intensivist, I will come and say, okay, pulse volume is adequate, but for a junior doctor like you, pulse volume may be absent. Peripheral coldness, same. Capillary refilling time, same. Blood pressure, whenever you see a low blood pressure, the next option is that you are changing the monitor. That's what we are doing now, because now it's a digital era. So you are changing the monitor. So the second one also low, then you are trying to measure this blood pressure with a manual pump. So now we have three readings. Which one is correct? I don't know. Again, what I'm trying to say is most of these parameters are subjective, depending on how experienced you are, depending on the, which country the, the, the machine is uh, produced by, whether it's Japan or German or for that matter, China. So various things will happen. But only objective parameter you have is urine output. So if you have a catheter, if that catheter is not blocked, if you have 5 ml as a urine output, so that's 5 ml should be 5 ml for me, 5 ml for you, as well as even for the bystander, it should be 5 ml. So that's the only objective parameter that we have. That's why we are going behind this objective parameter. So monitoring urine output is very, very important in dengue. That's what I'm trying to say. So why, why you are measuring urine output? To get an idea about the tissue perfusion. So if you're having a good urine output, that means renal perfusion is good. So you cannot have isolated good renal perfusion. If your renal perfusion is good, that means your uh, cardiac, your brain, your liver, your uh, other organs, perfusion should be good. So basically, if your urine output is good, that means your cardiac output is good. That's the key. So when you're having low urine output, you have to increase the IV fluids. So most of the time what happens is when you're having low urine output, you are giving full semen. So please don't do that. So low urine output means low intravascular volume, low cardiac output. So if you are giving full semen during this time, one thing, the kidneys will somehow produce some urine. So already, uh, already low uh, intravascular volume will be further lowered with this uh, full semen. So the second thing is, um, wasting about one or two minutes during this lecture to, to uh, tell you how important this uh, urine output is. But if you give frusimide, after that, this very important monitoring, pa pa monitoring parameter is lost. If somebody says, Nalin, okay, I had problem with dengue and uh, initially the urine output is low, now I have given some frusimide, now everything is all right. Now urine output is good. Am I happy? No, because I, uh, I know this is due to full right? Now I have lost my very important monitoring parameter. So please don't do that. Whenever you have low urine output, increase IV fluid. Don't give fluzimide. It gives you a false security. Right. So we have put the indications for urinary catheterization uh, into the uh, these uh, guidelines. So because this is very important. So all high risk patients during the critical phase, you need a catheter. Patient with first shock. Patient with complications, patients with platelets less than 50,000 needs get it because these are the high risk patients. So you have to monitor the urine output very carefully. So all high risk patients means we are having a one year child, below one year child, infant. Having DHF, you need get it to monitor the urine output very carefully. Right. So then the plasma leakage in dengue. It's very, very dynamic process. I'm just uh, uh, going to that. It's very dynamic. So you cannot generalize. So you cannot have a flat trade. So you can't say, okay, my fluid is now maintenance was 5% is 2000. So I have to give this 2000 over 48 hours. So I can give 1000 over half of the time, 1000 over uh, 24 hours. So in that case, I can give. Uh, 500 ml over 12 hours, 250 ml over six hours. That's not the business because it's very, very dynamic. You have to monitor the patient. 
depending on the patient's need, you have to adjust the fluid rate. So otherwise it's very easy, right? So you should not give fat rate. The fluid rate should be decided by patient's clinical condition and natural history of the disease. So I told you, this is the natural history. So you are starting leaking here, gradually leak will go up, maximum leak is around 24 hours, then leak will go down and leak will stop by 14 hours. So may, may the, you can develop, the patient can develop shock around 24 hours. So if you are matching the leak, this should be your fluid chart. So initially you need a, a small amount of fluid, gradually leak will go up. So you are matching the leak, your fluid requirement also going up. So maximum amount of fluid is around 24 hours. Then fluid rate should go down. And at the end of 48 hours, the fluid rate should be minimum. So basically you are simulating the natural history of the disease. So you are having, this is the natural history and this is the simulation. So gradually increasing, then it's coming down. So that's what happened. So if the child present with shock, you are worried about shock now. So usually shock occurs around 24 hours, you know, somewhere here. So this part has already occurred at home. So you don't have to worry about this part now. So shock usually occurs around 24 hours. So this part has already occurred at, uh, at uh, home. So now we have to monitor or manage from this point on. So on admission, you need huge amount of fluid. So shock management we'll discuss in a minute. So anyway, so we have to manage shock. We have to give huge amount on admission. Then fluid rate should be gradually come down. So if you give the shock, this should be your fluid chart. So you are giving huge amount of fluid somewhere here. Gradually fluid rate should come down. So after 24 hours, fluid rate should be minimum. So on admission, you, you need huge amount of fluid. Then it should come down. Then the after 24 hours, it should be over. So basically we have to manage about 24 hours. So again, you are simulating the shock. So this is the beginning, this is the, the admission. So it's like this. So dengue is very simple disease to manage if you are doing it properly. However, can you manage dengue like this? You are giving very small amount of fluid over 48 hours. No, because dengue is a very dynamic process, dynamic disease. So you cannot manage dengue like this. Right. So what are the fluids that we have to give? So always remember it's isotonic crystalloid for infusions as well as boluses. Nothing else. You're giving normal saline. If you want, you can use uh, the heart melts, but nothing else. It's normal saline or heart melts. You can give as infusion, you can give as bolus. Then uh, you are using hypertonic colloid. This is only for boluses. So yeah, now you are using hypertonic colloid, uh, the next strand. 40% uh, dextran is the only hypertonic colloid that we are using. So this is as bolus. So you are not using as infusion. So this is a drug. So if you want, give as a bolus. Indications of colloid. So if you're having a shock, you're treating the shock first. After two crystalloid boluses, you have to think about colloid. If you're having a shock, already having fluid overload, again, think about colloid. If you're having shock, you know, you're going towards fluid overload, think about uh, colloid. So these are the indications for colloid. So if you're giving colloid uh, fluid, so this is, it should be only during the critical phase, only as boluses, no infusions. So bolus is 10 ml per kilo. Somebody has asked that question during the previous lecture. Yes, so this is one indication to give 10 ml per kilo fluid uh, as a bolus. Giving shock. There are only four conditions that you are giving 10 per kilo fluid in shock as bolus. So one is dengue, DKA, neonate, and trauma. So just remember those are the four conditions in shock we are giving only 10 ml per kilo fluid for different reasons. Here, what we are trying to do is uh, that we are worried about the amount of fluid that we are giving during dengue. So you should avoid fluid overload. So if you can manage shock with 10 ml per kilo, you don't have to give 20 ml per kilo. That's a different story. So that doesn't mean that after 10 per kilo, you are just waiting uh, without doing anything. After 10 ml per kilo of fluid, the child is in uh, still in shock. So you have to give the second border. So that means basically after 10 ml per kilo, you are reassessing the child before giving the second bolus. That's all about it. So bolus is 10 ml per kilo. 
but after the bolus we have to reassess to see whether this child needs uh, any more boluses so maximum three boluses in 24 hours uh, uh, and uh, uh, 16 48 hours so this is about the quality administration so only during critical phase only as boluses no infusions bolus is 10 ml per kilo Sorry about this. So this is uh, this is a colloid administration. So I was discussing about the, the shock management initially. So this is colloid. Anyway, we had to be 10 ml per kilo. No, nothing about 20 ml per kilo. Uh, bolus is 10 ml per kilo. So you never give half bolus. There's nothing called half bolus. If you want to extend, give the full bolus. But if you don't want to extend, don't give. And maximum three bolus is in 24 hours and six in 48 hours. Right. So when the child is not responding to conventional IV fluid treatment, you have to think about these four things. Acidosis, bleeding, calcium and electrolyte, and sugar. We think it's A, B, C, and S. Acidosis, bleeding, uh, C is calcium and electrolytes, and then uh, sugar. So think about these four things. So whenever you are having shock, treat shock first. The shock management is 10 ml per kilo normal saline. You are giving the first bolus. Reassess the child. Still in shock. Give the second bolus as 10 ml per kilo normal saline. Reassess the child. If you're having the shock, persistent shock, the third bolus should be dextrin. So that's the simple theory about thing. Right. So then about bleeding. What about bleeding? So bleeding in dengue uh, may be two different uh, scenarios. One is overt bleeding. You can see the bleed blood. It may be uh, the hematomesis, malina, some kind of that type of bleeding. You can see the bleeding. So most of the time it's concealed bleeding. You cannot see blood outside. So what we are thinking is this bleeding is in tissue level. So how can you detect this type of bleeding? So management of bleeding always blood transfusion. You are giving pack cells no other blood products. That's again a common mistake people are doing. No place for FAP, no place for platelet, no place for anything. So if you see bleeding, if you are suspecting bleeding, management is uh, blood. So these are the indications of blood. If you see significant over bleeding, you can give blood. And then if you are suspecting the concealed bleeding. In dengue, we know that when the patient is bad, that means this is due to the fluid leak. So if you're having a fluid leaking, the PCB should be high. So if the patient is bad, PCB should be high. So if you're having a very bad clinical condition with low PCB, that's not telling, that's not compatible. So that's the time that you have suspect bleeding. So if the child is not improving, but the PCB is low, that is bleeding. So PCV drops without clinical improvement is one indication of bleeding and shock net not responding to crystalloid and colloid. So I told you shock management, first bolus normal saline 10 ml per kilo, reassess, second bolus 10 ml per kilo normal saline, reassess, third bolus should be 10 ml per kilo dextran, reassess, even after dextran, if the child is not improving, this is the time to give blood. And endogen dysfunction, despite adequate fluid, again, we have to give blood early liver failure, you have to give blood. So this is the, these are the indications for blood transfusion in the How to give blood? It's always back cells. You are using 5 ml per kilo, no 3, no 5, no, no 3, no 10. It should be 5 ml per kilo or one hour. So usually 5 ml per kilo back cells will increase your hematocrit by 5 points. So that is also important because now see, initially your PCV is now 35. You decided to give blood. Now we have given blood. After the blood transfusion, now the PC we are giving 10 5 ml kilo blood. So your PCV is now 55. So can that happen? Yes, if that happens, can this be due to uh, the, the blood transfusion? No, we know with 5, 5 ml per kilo blood, the PCV should go up by 5. So 35 should be 4. The PCV is 55. That means you are having a leaking, significant leaking in addition. So this is leaking plus bleeding. So definitely you need uh, to increase the fluid also. Then hypocalcemia. So it's common cause uh, for a conversion in dengue. So you are using empirical calcium in complicated DHF or dehydrating DHF. 
uh, again, not for all. We have seen even a little bit, even at very uh, the, the early stage of dengue, some people are using oral calcium. So that's not the key. If you're having a low calcium, that's a different story. But uh, empirical calcium is needed only for complicated DHF and treated DHF, not for all. So those is 10 ml per kilo, 10 ml, 10% uh, calcium gluconate, 1 ml per kilo. 10 ml is the maximum. You have diluted in equal amount of normal saline. You can give it over one hour. So six hourly, we are going to give this. And hyponatremia, so again, is a common condition. Uh, cause of conversion in dengue can cause cerebral edema and pony. And so that is the one reason that you should use only isotonic fluids in the agent. So no place for N by 2, no place for hyponatremic solutions in dengue. So this is my natural history. We are seeing this slide again and again now. This should be the fluid management ideally. If the child present is shocked, this should be the fluid management ideally. But most of the time, we are seeing this type of fluid charts in Navas. And I thought I have to think about why this is happening. What is the reason for this type of fluid chart? So we are giving only 2 mm per kilo of fluid because some people believe that you should give very minimum amount of fluid during the uh, critical phase. So you are giving only 2 mm per kilo of fluid. All of a sudden, you need a bolus. What does that mean? The child develops shock, you need a bolus. What is the reason for this shock? inadequate fluid. So after the so after the fluid bolus, child is improving. Now, urine output is good. Capillary repeat time is now improving and clinical condition is improving. You think that you have done a marvelous job and you are cutting down the fluid. You're going back to the tube. So this is not rational at all because this 2 ml is not enough. That is why this patient is entering, the, the, this patient is developing shock. So uh, the reason for this shock is inadequate tissue, inadequate fluid. So now after the bolus, at least after the bolus, you have to increase the amount of fluid. So uh, you are continuing the same thing. After two, three hours, second shock, then you are giving the extend. Again, do the same thing. After two, three hours, again shock. Now the normal saline, blood, and MIC. This is what happens usually. Please don't do that. So that's why I'm telling management of dengue is not try to give minimum amount of fluid. It is not somehow try to give maintenance, main, uh, try to give only maintenance plus 5% fluid during critical phase. It is maintaining the hemodynamics, but with minimum amount of fluid. We are very happy to see this type of fluid charts. So initially small amount of fluid, gradually increasing and in the middle, in the middle you are giving huge amount of fluid, then gradually you have to come down. So this is one of the child that we have managed. This is a YCU. So I don't know that you can see this child is having a PG tube, two IC tubes, two PD catheters. So respiratory failure, uh, renal failure, and two organ involvement with respiratory failure. The outcome may be, the, the recovery may be a miracle. We know the are going to die, but we are trying our best to do everything possible. So we want to avoid this type of situations. So very briefly, two, uh, two cases. So this one is a uh, uh, 40 kilos ch child admitted with district hospital on day two of fever. NS1 was positive. First shock detected on day four. Child had melanin and pancreatic bleeding. Transfer to LRH on latter part of day four. So this is how they have managed. Normal saline in 5% dextrose, 2 ml per kilo over 11 hours, 2.5 ml per hour, 9 hours. Dextran, so-called half boluses, three, and dextran full bolus, one. So I have put this into the chart. This is what has happened. Look at this, a very small amount of fluid. You can see that the PCV was 70, 37, 48, 47, 50. And look at the urine output, 1.1, 1 .1, 0 0.6, 1, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, no, 0 0.3, 0.4. And the heart rate, you can see 150, 130, 137, so pulse rate is high. So you are giving small amount of fluid. PCV is going up, urine knob is coming down. You don't have a big brain to understand that this fluid is not enough. So they are giving half bolus to extend to them. Again, coming back to the two ml per kilo, half bolus to extend again, coming back to the two ml per kilo again. So now I have told you. So if you're having more than four hours untreated shock, outcome is very, very poor. So uh, shock means uh, if you calculate for the urine output, uh, less than 0.5, we, are, we want at least 0.5 ml per kilo urine 
So one, two, three, four, five. Five hours. Shock outcome is very, very good. So not catheterize, not match the reek, ignore the pulse rate, you didn't put in um, the, the you now put in pulse. So this is what happens. So this is what happens uh, on admission, saturation of spatify, this link, peripheral is cold, tachycardic, blood pressure low, PCV is 42. We try our maximum. So what look at this. SGPT on that, on the initial it was 67, goes to 7,000. Or COT 41 goes to 28,000. So this child died with fever failure after about two, up, two, year, two weeks. Another child, five years. Uh, this one was directly admitted to ICU because this son's mother is a uh, dermatologist. So we have managed like this. So we were given three ml per kilo of fluid, but we are more monitoring all the parameters. You can see the unit now put 1.8, 1.5, 1.2, 0.75, So now you can see initially you are given three ml per kilo of fluid. Child is producing 1.8 urine. Now with the same amount of fluid, the child is producing only 0.71. So again, you don't have to wait to this. A magical mark of 0.5 ml per kg per uh, hour. So we thought the fluid is not enough. So we have increased it to 5. But after starting 5, 1.2, 2.6. Now you can see this 5 is maybe a little bit more because now the child is producing more urine. So we can come down to 4. Even with 4, 1.4, 1.7, 1.8. So we try to come down with a 3. Again, 0.9. So by doing this, now we know that this child's leaking is between three and four. So it's very simple. So we have gone up to four. So managed like this. And child needed the, the, the blood, dextran, another blood transfusion. So depending on the clinical context. And then look at this. HGPT 49 to 103, SGO 210 to 225. So this child went wrong. So now I'm telling the difference between the death and the survival in dengue. Hemorrhage fever is urine output. If you have a good urine output without fruzimide, you can go home. If you don't have urine output, then you may die. So common pitfalls, not simulating the natural cause of the disease. Try to give minimum amount of fluid. Cutting down fluid just after borders. Not try to prevent shock. Not giving blood early. Not sending the child to ICU early. So if you want ICU, send to the ICU early. Because we are doing intensive care, not the the permanent care. So take home messages, minimum fluid in febrile phase, just sufficient fluid in critical phase, minimum fluid in recovery phase, please don't give unnecessary boluses. By doing that, we can treat shock, avoid organ damage. We can uh, prevent fluid overload also. As I told you, these are the two main causes for death in dengue. So if you are pre preventing both, the child should go home. We want this type of patients. So thank you very much. So I'm trying to answer some of the questions. The child is presented with uncomplicated shock after giving 20 ml per bonus. The child comes to compensate shock. Then how much can we give 10 ml per kilo per So I, I have I think I, I have answered that question. So uh, in dengue, what we have to do is first bolus if the child is in shock compensated or uncompensated, the child is in shock, 10 ml per kilo has a bolus. Then free assess, if the child is still in shock, second bolus 10 ml per kilo. Uh, if the child is still in shock, after second bolus, give dextran. So even after giving dextran, uh, if the child is in shock, think about A, B, C, and S. So suspect bleeding, how much PCV should be reduced? So there's no magic number. What you have to do is, uh, uh, you are suspecting, I told you, now when the patient's clinical condition is not good, we are, we are thinking that the PCV should be high. So if the child is having low PCV with uh, poor, uh, poor uh, circulation, or poor pop, the, the condition is not improving, then you have to suspect bleeding. Other than next hand, what are other colloids uh, can we give if the patient is leaking? So nowadays we are using only dextran. Earlier we were using hydroxyl ethyl starch, we call it heta starch. Now please don't use it. There are so many problems. So I'm not going to go into detail because uh, lack of time. So remember, in dengue, 
colloid is 10 uh, the dextran dextran dose should be 10 ml per kilo uh, so bolus as a bolus you have to use so no other colloids think about dextran there are so many reasons if a patient comes with dhf total effusion can we give dextran 40 initially so any dhf patient you say it's a dhf you need fluid leaking we know the fluid leaking in dengue is accumulated in mainly in two places, pleural space and peritoneal space. Invariably, if your child is having DHF, they will have pleural effusion and ascites. So that itself is not an indication to give dextran. So as I told you, those are the, uh, the indications of dextran are shock, not uh, shock after two pistoloid pulses. Then, if you think the child is in fluid overload, because now, especially for us in ICU, we know that uh, the, we are getting patients uh, by, uh, who are managed by the other, other people. So then uh, sometimes on admission itself, they are on fluid overload. Fluid overload, still in shock, then you can't give more fluid. So the, the, then you can give uh, dextran. So just because of total effusion, it's not an indication for uh, dextran. So should we calculate minimum fluid in febrile and recovery phase? If not, how do we advise patient on fluid intake? So what should happen is uh, the children are not taking more fluid, even you ask. So you can ask the patient to get liberal fluids without anything. Don't force the patient to, child to take fluid, but whatever the amount the child can take, you can take. So that's the minimum amount. So you're not going to huge amount. You are not going to give, if you are, if you are giving IV fluid, if the child is vomiting and if you are, the child is not, uh, taking only then you can do about 2 ml per kilo of weight but other than that uh, if the child is tolerating oral allow them to take whatever that is as you said uh, if patient present to hospital at the highest uh, rate of leaking 24 hours after starting leaks do we have do we give only half of the maintenance plus five percent dose again so don't go by these arbitrary numbers so what is important is uh, the child is uh, child is at home for 24 hours so you have to start with a huge amount of fluid because the child can go into shock. So then gradually you, shall, you can come down on the fluid depending on the hemodynamics. Don't think about the sapling number, just so ideally you should manage, manage with half of this uh, fluid. But at the same time, if the child has not taken any fluid during the first 24 hours, so for the treatment of shock, you may have to use huge amount of fluid. So that's this, don't go by this sapling number. Always respect the patient's clinical condition. Then the problems are very minimal. How do you calculate ideal body weight uh, if using H plus 4 plus 2 formula or does the formula changes with the age? So go by the Holiday and Sega <coughs> method. So usually uh, first 10 kilos, 4 ml per kilo. Second 10 kilos, 2 ml, uh, 2 ml per kilo. After that, 1 ml per kilo. That's how you calculate the, uh, the sorry, ideal body weight. Yes, ideal body weight uh, should be calculated with the, uh, ideally by the chart. So we have a height chart. So go to the your BNF or uh, the, all the words, pediatric words are having uh, this chart. So go by the, the height. If the child develops shock during leaking phase, do we need to reduce the resuscitated fluid from quarter to eight quarter? Again, so don't go by this quarter because that's the main problem. So quota is just for the, uh, take some idea. You may manage this patient below quota or above quota, that doesn't mean. So, but you, when you are giving fluid bolus, uh, you are treating the shock. So after the shock management, the amount of fluid should depend on the patient's clinical condition. So I'm not uh, trying to give only the quota because if the child develops shock or if the child is clinical condition is uh, not good, we have to give more and more fluid. Frequency of full blood count to check for entry into critical phase. So usually, the, the, the usually what should happen is uh, uh, until the full blood count is 50%, uh, the full blood count is 150, until about platelet count is 150, you can do daily counts. If the yeah, below 150, you can do BD counts. And if the child is having bill, uh, the below 100,000, usually you need about 670 PCV and twice a day count.
for leakage can we detect by gold bladder thickening yes and the th leakage uh, the, you can detect leakage with various means so you can do ultrasound scan and uh, detect uh, as you as somebody has mentioned but ideally you don't need ultrasound scan to detect leakage so if you are with the patient if you know what is happening uh, i have shown you uh, how to detect it so you can do it yes uh, if you have that some pet sound facility you can do it but uh, that's not the indication to go hourly ultrasound scan just to detect it if ns are negative how we identify the secondary dengue episode so if the ns are negative if the platelet count is less than 150000 so anyway you have to manage like dengue. so if the child develop uh, the platelet less than 100000 that means the child is entering the critical phase so you have to manage like dhf Is NS1 positivity specific for dengue? Yes, NS1 positivity is specific for dengue, but uh, there are some plus reactions with the, the, the COVID also. Uh, but don't think about these small, small, small things. So NS1 positive, unless proven otherwise, that is dengue. Is there any rough amount of IV fluid that we could increase with reducing urine output? Is there any rough amount of IV fluid that we should increase with reducing urine output? The thing is now, if you are monitoring the patient, you should not have 0.1 ml per hour urine output because it will not happen all or like all. Uh, suddenly, right? So as I shown you, the proper management, proper monitoring, the urine output is gradually coming down. So it, it will not happen. 5 ml per kg uh, in first hour, the second point one. So that should not happen. If you're having point one urine, that means the child probably in shock. So you will assess the child. You will see that other parameters. So depending on the parameters, you are deciding. Just because you're having point one ml per urine, it may be several things. Your catheter may be blocked. Uh, the child may be in shock so you you should know what is the reason so then you can de decide so if the child is in shock we know how to manage it right so how much pint of blood we can give so again i told you it's 5 ml per kilo uh, so um, blood, the dose is 5 ml per kilo, you have to give 5 ml per kilo over one hour uh, if the child needs that. Right, we we'll stop that. So next is uh, 20 minutes lunch break. Uh, so we can uh, go to lunch and come back in 20 minutes. Thank you.
Hello, I hope you all can hear me. Yes, madam. Yes. Right, okay. So, uh, we are going to discuss mm -hmm. about fluid management. Uh, so, I hope all of you all know, have had some experience in fluid management. So this is unfortunately not an interactive session because with 480 people, it's a little uh, impossible. But of course, you can always put your options in the chat option where I can see it and I can answer it. So this is actually a, uh, actually a, uh, uh, this is actually a session which, uh, which we do. Uh, uh, as an interactive session. Uh, however, um, I would uh, make it possible whenever we discuss a case scenario, when we ever discuss a basic principle, you can put up uh, the questions or the problems you had uh, in the chat option. So I will try to answer them as much as possible. At the end of the presentation, I would give you my email address where you can obviously uh, send me an email if you have any issues, right? So we are going to discuss uh, uh, a managing of a seriously ill child. I'm Dr. Amali Dalpatadu, consultant pediatrician working at University Hospitals, KDU. I'm also uh, a senior lecturer in pediatrics at KDU. So manage, managing a seriously ill child, the fluids and electrolytes play, plays a vital role. So it's very important that you are aware because it's slightly different from what you would do in adults because everything comes per kilo and fluid amount of fluid amount, the, the amount of electrolyte or the fluid loss varies from one child to the other. I know after the uh, lunch, perhaps it's a little uh, now, the best of the time to study uh, a topic like fluids and electrolytes. But if you're doing pediatrics or dealing with ill children, I hope all of you would do if you're in a clinical job, which will actually save your life as well as the patient's life if you know how to manage the fluids and electrolytes in a child. So it's the bread and butter of pediatrics. And unfortunately, I'm given the opportunity to talk to you after the very interesting lecture uh, by Dr. Nalin Kitulvatta. So let's hope that you all uh, are able to concentrate and be able to uh, be with me this uh, short period. So we are going to discuss... Uh, next, uh, the normal fluid and electrolyte requirements in childhood. So what is normal fluid requirement? So in a child who is uvolemic, who is not having any electrolyte or fluid disturbances, these are the patients that we are going to talk about in this context. An assessment and management of a dehydrated child. Dehydration often very happen, happens uh, in children uh, very often because uh, the amount of fluid is lost easily and the amount of fluid per kilo in children is relatively small compared to an adult. And even a small, uh, relatively uh, minute loss, which may be comparatively in an adult, would be significant in an inner child. So therefore, we are going to discuss. I think this is probably goes, takes you back to the time where you were discussing your uh, second MD. Uh, now, there is a thing called extracellular fluid, the plasma, the intracellular fluid. However, what we worry most of the time, the reports, the numbers which come up, most of the numbers which we see are the plasma. So we are looking at the plasma sodium. We are looking at the plasma potassium. You can see the 140 in red and calcium in red, the, the line in red is what we are most of the time concentrating on. However, it's of utmost importance that you have reserves of electrolytes in the intracellular spaces, right? As well as you know, interstitial fluid. 
so therefore in in uh, in uh, fluid losses or electrolyte movement from one space to the other like say for an example you have uh, uh, situations like dengue where the fluid movement there's a shift of fluid from one space to the other and there's electrolyte movement uh, with dka and administration of your insulin there's electrolyte movement potassium movement into the cells so in circumstances like this it makes it a little easier for you to understand therefore you have a relatively a relatively very small amount of sodium in the intracellular fluid so it's most of the sodium is in out, is in is outside the cell right whether it be the plasma or interstitial spaces however it's on the vice versa in so in potassium it's four in the plasma and the interstitial spaces where you find the in, intra a uh, cellular fluid you have a significantly high level of potassium sometimes you may have seen reports saying it may be a hemolyzed sample when the fluid comes out of the cells the potassium is rising so it may be the reason that we are going to talk about so there is a high amount of potassium inside the cells and high amount of sodium outside the cells so this is the key to the life the sodium potassium pump right so basically this is what it keeps us from uh, this is what uh, actually keeps the equilibrium in life so this is very important to understand that and again calcium also relatively high in the extracellular spaces compared to the intracellular magnesium also relatively high in the intracellular spaces bicarbonate relatively high extra cellularly and the ph also uh, there's a subtle difference it's more alkaline i think it's a normal range still but more acidic in the intracellular spaces osmolality remains the same so that actually keeps because osmolality has to remain the same otherwise there's a net movement of fluid so there's if there's osmotic gradient between the cells and the extracellular space there will be a net movement of fluid so that you have to maintain otherwise you will not have be, uh, be you will not be having your equilibrium right so i think one of the uh, very uh, veteran professors who taught me in the medical school in kalambu some time long time ago i suppose now so taught us the key to the life is the sodium potassium pump professor colvin gunaratna i think i still remember the word we are uh, maintaining life we are maintaining all what we have to maintain the sodium potassium pump so sodium is more extracellularly and less intracellularly potassium vice versa so that's the take home message of this slide so going into the next slide so basically you have huge amount of intracellular fluid but which is not used say you have a lot of money in the bank you can't use it right so in a child you have intracellular fluid but you can't use it when a child loses the intravenous fluid which is about 3.5 liters most cases interstitial fluid also can be a little high so for an example in a child with nephrotic the interstitial spaces rise right. so, so how how much fluid you have in the interstitial spaces or intracellular spaces you can't use those hence it's very important that you maintain the intravenous fluid amount so the kidneys the gut the skin and the lungs help us to maintain the fluid volume right so therefore it's very important that the extracellular fluid is maintained and of utmost importance to maintain the intra venous fluid which actually maintains your life vitals going to the next slide normal fluid requirement so this is i think something you need when you first start your residentship or your internship as a doctor this was the first lesson i received from my registrar as a intern in palambu south the provisorial unit is uh, our registrar said so the first 10 kilos you need 100 ml per kg uh, and the second 10 kilos 50 ml per kg subsequent kilos 20 ml per kg what is this 
So it's a fluid requirement to maintain the normal uh, requirement, the ongoing losses, whatever the, uh, to maintain the balance of the patient, to maintain the, whatever we showed in the previous slide, the intravenous volume to maintain it, this is the basic requirement. So for an example, you have a child who weighs 30 kilos. For the first 10 kilos, you calculate 100 milliliters per kg, which comes to about 1000 ml. That is for 24 hours. And for the second 10 kilos, say child is 30. So first 10 kilos, 1000 ml. Second 10 kilos is 50 ml per kg. Again, 50 multiplied by 10 equals 500. So 1,500 altogether up to 20 kilos. So subsequent kilos, it's 20 it's ml 14, per kg. 30. So 20 into 10 is 200. So you have about 1,700 milliliters for 24 hours in a child who weighs 30 kilos. So that should be divided by the number of hours per day, that is 24. So you get a rate per hour. In fluid requirement per hour, I think it is used more uh, diversely by the anesthetist and the intensivist. So you use the meals per kg volume per hour. So for an example, again, a 30 ml per kg child, first 10 kilos, it's 4 ml per kg per hour. Second, 2 ml per kg, second 10 kilos, and subsequent kilos, 1 ml per kg. If the child is 30 again, so first 10 kilos, 40 ml, second 10 kilos, 20, 2 into 10 is 20, so 60 ml. Subsequent 10 kilos, 1 ml per kg, 1 into 10 is 10. So 70 ml per hour is the rate. It comes to the same, but this is hourly, hourly calculation of fluid. Okay, so for you to just to practice, can you just write in the chat box how to calculate the fluid for 24 hours in a child who is who weighs uh, shall we take 25, 25 kilos? I will give you just one minute, put in the chat box so we can see how much fluid this child requires for 24 hours. Right, okay, we have a few answers. So 1,580, 1,600. So 25, again, first 10 kilos, 1,000. Second 10 kilos, 1,500. You have another five. So five into 20 is 100. 1,006 is the answer, okay? Right, very good. So let's move on. Actual volume of insensible losses related to the caloric content of the feed. So if you are giving a high caloric diet and the ambient temperature, say for an example, you are living in a area, north central, northern provinces or dry zone in, in the southern province uh, with a less humidity, high temperature, you lose more flow. And presence of pyrexia, so if the child is febrile, any child who is febrile loses more fluid by insensible losses. Therefore, it's very important that you maintain the fluid hydration in a child who becomes uh, febrile. And usually, you may lose about 10 ml per kg per day in stools. But however, in a diarrhea, especially a viral diarrhea like a rotavirus, you may lose a significant amount of volume, up to 300 ml per kg in a diarrheal stool. So urinary losses are usually between 1 to 2 ml per kg per day, approximately 30 ml per kg per day you would lose. So uh, that is the uh, norm, uh, 
patient, I think you may have understood by listening to the uh, dengue lecture, if the patient is in a euolinic state, having a normal urine output, this is what you would lose in a normal day, provided the child does not have any renal diseases like DEI or any other circumstances. Okay, so that is about the basic requirement of fluid. This is about the basic requirement of electrolytes. Again, you have for sodium and potassium, the basic requirements, two to four millimoles per kg per day in sodium, 1.5 to 2.5 of potassium. Again, subsequent kilos, the per kilo requirement of millimoles per kg reduces. This is not so in an adult. So uniformly, you have about a milliequivalent or a millimoles, per millimoles requirement in an adult. But in a child, you calculate everything according to the weight. This is important because if you're specially managing a child with diarrhea, they will lose a lot of potassium. So if you're having a watery diarrheal stool about 10 to 15 times per day or 12 hours, then you are thinking you probably might need to add on a maintenance in the maintenance group. So you should know the requirement a child usually will require if they are, uh, if they are probably prone to lose electrolytes. Again, this you must be familiar with your medical student days. This is the WHO classification of dehydration. We are going to talk about dehydration because dehydration is very important. Uh, there were days that a lot of children died of diarrheal illnesses. I think uh, uh, during our father's and grandfather's days at LRH. So those were the days that a lot of children got admitted. There were separate diarrheal wards where they... Uh, most of the children died due to this infective diarrhea and they died because of the dehydration. So it's very important. Nowadays, the parents are more aware of this. So they usually, they don't really come with a severe dehydration unless it's a very spurious or very, um, you know, significant volumes are being lost. But however, still you will face children with dehydration. It's something that you will face more commonly than in an adult. So if you're managing a child, this is very important. So for the, uh, for the probably the convenience of management, uh, they have divided the mild, moderate and severe. So mild saying that you have lost less than 5% of fluid. Moderate is between 5 to 10 and severe is over 10% loss of fluid. It's just an arbitrary value. It's just not really tell you whether you're going to lose this amount exactly. It's very difficult because most of these um, parameters, we're thinking about the decreased urine output, dry mouth, decreased skin turgor, sunken anterior fontanelle, sunken eyes. Out of these, the only reproducible uh, factor I could think of is the urine output, right? The rest of the parameters are really very subjective because dry mouth for one person may not be dry mouth for another person, right? Again, skin turgor. It depends on your experience. What a consultant might detect may be different from what an SHO, what an SR, or what a professor. I mean, it may differ from one to the other. Even between people of same education level, same amount of experience, it might differ. So sunken anterior fontanel again, I mean, it's obvious when it's really bad, but it might be a little difficult again. It can be subjective one from one person to the other. But uh, sunken eyes again, there may be like, you know, uh, there may be actual anatomical variants. It might be difficult to assess. And in the fontanel also, uh, sometimes in a child who is septic and ill with a raised intracranial pressure, that might be a difficulty in predicting. Again, skin turgor in malnourished children who might present with dehydration very commonly, and especially with hyponatremia, again, it's going to be a little difficult. Again, all these are just arbitrary values, but however, it helps you uh, to come into a, come into a, some sort of a conclusion and helps you to uh, plan your management, which is the most important. Okay, fluid and electrolyte formula for calculating the deficit. So everybody knows this, I think, if you have done an internship in pediatrics and also your medical student days, you might have been taught. So you get 
the formula for deficit. So you think the patient is 5% dehydrated and you calculate the percentage, uh, percentage deficit or the amount, the deficit amount in milliliters by getting the percentage dehydration, say 5%, 5 into the weight of the child. So weight is say 20 kilos, five into 20 multiplied by 10. So why this 10, where does this 10 come from? So percentage dehydration means the number of grams of fluid lost per 100 gram of body weight. So if you have lost five milligrams per 100 grams, then to convert it into the milligrams loss per kilo, so there are 10 of 100 grams per kilo. So there are 1,000 grams per kilo. So there are 10 uh, components of 100 grams. So you have to multiply by 10, right? And I think they take the specific gravity as one. So therefore, the weight equals the volume. So percentage multiplied by 10 converts the volume into milliliters per kilo, the milliliters lost per kilo. So to calculate the whole amount which is lost, you have to multiply by the number of kilos the patient weighs. So the percentage dehydration multiplied by the weight of the child multiplied by 10. So you multiply by 10 because you take the percentage loss per 100 grams. You multiply by weight because the amount you get from multiplying by 10 is the amount you lose per kilo. Right. So in degree of dehydration, I think uh, this is just an arbitrary value. Now, this, I mean, you say in a mild dehydration, it's, I think, in the previous slide, it shows up to five, right? So less than five. So in a mild dehydration, usually you can take 4% loss. So four into body weight into 10. That is the number of milliliters you have lost. That is the deficit. So moderate dehydration, it is between five to 10, can be six or 7.5, just again, arbitrary figure, can be up to 10. So you have to keep in mind it can be up to 10 because it's between five and 10. So deficit usually six or 7.5 or whatever the amount you take into body weight into 10. And severe dehydration, you take as to eight or even up to 15% if you are really shocked and dehydrated and you have lost a lot of fluid. So the deficit body weight into 10. So again, for practice purposes, a child comes with a moderate dehydration. Just take it as, um, I think for multipli uh, multiplication purposes, seven is fine, 7.5 might be a little difficult. So, so take seven as the percentage dehydration, it's a moderate dehydration, child is 20 kilos. So calculate the deficit. You can put again in the chat box.
uh, I'm sorry. I think the host is not allowing host is not allowing me to unmute myself. So therefore, I uh, was sort of got myself uh, muted by accident and couldn't unmute myself. So yes. So twenty kilos, twenty into seven is one hundred forty. That is the deficit. Let's see how we can plan the management of these patients. Now, the concepts. It's for team 45. Dehydration does not cause death. The patient is severely dehydration does not cause death because it's just a slow loss of fluid over a period of time. And shock occurs when there's a rapid loss of fluid, 20 mils per kg from the intravascular space where you cannot maintain the vitals most of the time. So it may be a compensated shock, but however, in an uncompensated shock, you have lost a lot of volume rapidly. So you're not maintaining your vitals will cause death if not treated promptly. In dehydration, you can even lose over 25 ml per kg without affecting the vitals or having shock. So dehydration does not essentially mean that you are in shock. So it is possible to be shocked and not dehydrated. Think about a child who is having dengue, comes in shock, and not dehydrated. They are euvolemic. They have not. They're not having a deficit. They're dehydrated and not shocked. Think about a child who is having severe malnutrition and is not shocked. And they can be both dehydrated and shocked. The same example you can take. A child who is having a severe diarrhea or malnutrition, about 20 times tools per day, comes in shock and they're dehydrated as well. So these can coexist together. They can exist on their own as well. So I think we are not going to discuss the cases, but just going through a few clinical examples. Now we have this patient, we are not going to give you the cases, but I will just explain them a little bit. This might be a little too much for you, but just going through the possible clinical uh, pictures that you might come up with. It's a four-year-old child who's already have a chronic renal failure, admitted with nausea and vomiting, and be, being treated for a urinary tract infection. He's being ventilated and associated with a pneumonia. An ECG has tall T waves and prolonged QRS complexes. What, are, what, is, what is the reason for the tall T waves and prolonged QRS complexes, according to your understanding? Okay, hyperkalemia, right? So in this case, the, it's initially a patient who is having chronic renal failure may have gone into an acute and chronic because of the exacerbation of the UTI, right? And because of that, the patient has developed tall T waves. And mother says he has been unwell, so that may be the reason for the tall T waves. Additional information shows that his potassium is high. Right. What are the other abnormalities you see in the in investigations? Yes. Oops. Okay, hyperchloremia, not so much. I think it's normal. I think it's mostly the hyperkalemia. Right? Glucose is normal. Chloride is within the normal limits. 
sodium is low normal rest of the things are normal management so in managing hyperkalemia or high potassium you have to stop all the exogenous potassium if you are already giving potassium in a fluid if they are taking oral potassium you have to stop everything and first of all because it has already gone for tall t waves and prolonged qrs complexes you have to stabilize the myocardial membrane for that you give the calcium gluconate you don't have to know you don't need to know the doses unless you are really managing them these things you can refer and you have to decrease the serum potassium levels so as we discussed there's more potassium in the cells compared to the extracellular spaces and remove potassium from the body so you can remove the total out of the body you can push the potassium into the cells or other spaces so that's what we are going to do dextrose insulin is going to push the potassium into the cells against albutamol and correction of acidosis does the same again removing the furosemide the loop diuretic calcium ricinium and any type of renal replacement so you can either first thing is to stabilize the cardiac membrane if you already have cardiac defects you have to avoid any arrhythmias for what whatever it costs so then you have to reduce the serum levels by doing the measures by pushing into the cells and remove from the body or together by the last slide so again there is another case where you have a 2 year old who has diarrhea and vomiting and cap refill time 4 seconds what is the abnormality you see in the report yes okay yeah there's a hypernatremia okay yeah hypernatremia and patient may be in shock true good right what would you do what would you do if you have a high sodium level what would you correct it with A hypernatremia. What would you correct it with? Would you correct it with N by two, N by five, or normal saline? There are three options. You can put it in the chat box again. Yes. Yes. You don't use N by two. you use normal saline whether it's hypernatremia or hyponatremia you correct with normal saline iso or smaller fluid and you correct it gradually because if you correct rapidly because osmolality is equi equivalent and in, uh, inversely uh, it is it is a uh, proportionate to the sodium and the glucose so if you already having a high sodium content in the intravascular fluid your osmolality is slightly high so the brain has also developed the same sort of equilibrium and if you rapidly drop the uh, extra cellular sodium and hence the osmolality your osmolality is going to be low in the tissues or the vessels surrounding the brain tissue therefore there might there will be a net movement of fluid moving into the brain cells causing cerebral edema right so it's very important you bring it down slowly not rapidly so this movement should happen uh like say 0.5 per hour so very slow rate now we have a patient recovering from varicella developed a seizure with a 15 kilos of weight
Again, his capital time is three seconds. Pulse rate is 120. He's tachycardic. He's having a prolonged capital time. Is he having shock or not? Yes or no? Yes or no? Is he in shock or not? Shock. Shock, yes. So he's also hyponatremic. He's also hyponatremic. And therefore, he's also having a seizure. And just when you're reading this, he was started on N by 5 saline dextrose. We do not use N by 5 anymore, nor, the, nor do we use N by 2. Rarely, very rarely, except for when you're pre preparing these cocktails. But still, even for that, we don't use it now. We use normal saline, right? So he's symptomatic and he's hyponatremic and the sodium level is less than 125. So you have to correct that because he's symptomatic. You have to correct it immediately. Otherwise, you would correct it slowly if it's above 125, between 125 to 135, which is the normal range. Okay? But if it's below 125, and especially if it's symptomatic, you have to do a rapid correction. You might use your... 3% saline for this case. Uh, so this one we will skip. Right. So this is a two-year-old child who is being unwell with a flu-like illness and with the increased respiratory rate. With clear lungs. He's having a tachypnea, but with clear lungs. So therefore, the cause for the tachypnea is not respiratory. He's acidotic in the blood gas. What other abnormalities do you see in the blood gas? What other abnormalities do you see in the blood gas? Yes, you can put it in the chat box. So he's having a low bicarbonate, that is a metabolic acidosis. Rest of the electrolyte seems normal and a high blood sugar. So this is a diabetic ketoacidosis. Again, we are not going to talk about the details of management. Here again, you have to calculate the deficit, fluid deficit. If the patient is in shock, you need boluses. You have to replace the fluid deficit over a long period of time to avoid cerebral edema again, right? They might present with a hypernatremia as well. In this case, the potassium is in the low normal. It's slightly below the normal, low normal cutoff, 3.4. But once you start the insulin only, the potassium will start to drop. Therefore, you might need to replace the potassium in this patient. Okay. Right. So I'm not going to talk about the details. Again, I'm going to talk about the concepts. The treatment of shock requires a rapid administration of bolus of intravenous fluid. The electrolyte content that approximates plasma, so that means normal saline. So whenever you are giving a bolus, whether it be a newborn, whether it be a pediatric patient, up to 16 years we do manage, it's only normal saline. You don't give 10% dextrose boluses. You don't give Hartman boluses. You give only normal saline boluses, except for cases where you would give a dex dextran 40 bolus in a dengue patient. Right? So the treatment of dehydration requires a gradual replacement of the fluids. And you should not abruptly correct the deficit over two hours or one hour or so. It should be at least occurring through a 24-hour period. If the sodium levels are very high, you might take more than that. 
and the total body electrolyte content also should be replaced slowly. However, in the cases where, as we discussed, in the patient who is hyponatremic and symptomatic, you replaced it quickly. So the patient is seizing at the moment. So the damage of electrolytes abnormalities is related to either extreme levels or rapid rates of change. It's 15 hours. So either you can do the damage or the, rap the very low levels, extreme levels can cause the damage. So for an example, you have a patient who is having a hyponatremia, say 160 or 165 or 170, you replace it rapidly and the patient develops cerebral edema because of the rapid correction. You correct it with N by five or N by two, which is not the management you should do. And then suddenly the sodium drops to 130 or 140. You are happy because the report is normal, but then the patient develops cerebral edema. So therefore, it's treatment causing the damage. So you have to be careful. So the replacement, either in deficit of fluid, either in deficit or extreme levels of electrolytes should be corrected slowly over time, unless it's causing symptoms and uh, very extreme. Right, so any questions? Uh, if you have any questions, you can post it in the chat box. There is another... Um, Thing. Might like to discuss one case here. Sure. Do you have any questions? Do you have any questions? Okay, somebody is asking why we are using uh, normal saline to treat hyponatremic dehydration. So we are using normal saline to treat hyponatremic dehydration because if you use N by 2 or N by 5, what would happen is you would rapidly drop the sodium, which will result in uh, an immediate change in the sodium. So the patient will have uh, initial, say, 160 or 65. You're giving an N by 2 with a low sodium content. You're not giving any, you're hardly giving any sodium. And the sodium will drop rapidly because you are expanding the volume while not giving the isosmolar fluid. So the sodium concentration, the total sodium may, you know, may not drop, but you're diluting and you will have a relative uh, drop in the sodium, which will result in cerebral edema. It happens vice versa. So if you're changing the hyponatremia rapidly by giving your 3% or you're rapidly increasing from 130 to say uh, 120, 125 to one, uh, say uh, 40, so that's a 15 incre increment, immediately within four or five hours, again, you will that will result in cerebral pontine demange. So therefore, extreme levels should not be corrected immediately. So why we corrected the 110? Because if it's less than 125, you have to correct, especially in this case, the patient is symptomatic. There you correct it. After that, the correction should be slow. And it's between 8 to 12 millimoles per 24 hours. So it's about 0.5 per hour. So going back to the previous slide, 
there's one case I would like to discuss with you. I think this was already discussed with you, perhaps uh, in your uh, dengue lecture, but I will just share it with you so that we can do some. this one. So this is a four year old child with a dengue shock. Now dengue shock, they come in with features of shock, right? So features of shock would be prolonged capriful time, your tachycardia, your blood pressure may or may not be affected, depends on the compensation. They have given two boluses of normal saline and one bolus of dextran. The circulation is not yet stable and he is on a maintenance of N by 2. Name one wrong thing they have done. Yes, giving in by two. Uh, I would just answer a question in the chat box uh, because now one person has asked whether uh, do we add the insensible losses to the maintenance fluid? No. If you're just replacing the urine output, say, sometimes you do in a case of insufficiency, there you would add the insensible loss, but not otherwise. Because this maintenance includes your losses as well as the normal maintenance. So insensible losses are not added to the maintenance I discussed. Uh, in the formula. However, if you're just replacing, say, a child has passed 400 ml over four hours. So the next four hours, if you're just replacing 400, then you have to take into account the insensible losses, but not otherwise. Okay, so n by 2 giving n by 2 is wrong. Definitely in a dengue, the fluid of choice is normal saline. Even not in dengue, all the children, it's not n by 2. We don't do it. Then his respiratory rate is 16, pulse is 120, capricule time is three seconds. So what do you do next? So you have given two boluses and an extra. Child is tachycardic, child is unstable. What are, what are the things to think about at this point? There are four things we think about. One, two, three, four. Yes? Yeah, you can check the PCV. Very good. Well done. Uh, well done, ABCS. Right? So you have to check the PCB again, well done. So acidosis, yes, of course you do check the acidosis. That is part of your ABCs. Whenever a patient is deteriorating in dengue, you check for acidosis, you check for bleeding, you check for calcium and the sugar, right? Uh, so therefore, these four things you need to check. So we have done so. Sodium is 120, potassium is 3.8, glucose is 2, which comes to about uh, 
slightly low normal. Serum calcium is again low. PCV has dropped from 42 to 30. Now imagine with a, with a, a, a crystalloid bolus, you drop about two to three in your PCV. And with a colloid bolus, the maximum drop you would expect is 10. If it's over 10, nor close to over 10, nor 10, it's equals or more than 10, then you have to suspect the possibility of concealed bleed. Okay, so that's a PCB drop. Patient is unstable despite your crystalloid and colloid infusion. Hence, it's very important for you to think about a possible bleed. What is the treatment? What is the, what is the ideal fluid at this point, this one point? One, two, three. You give normal cell and you give dextran, another bolus. You give FFP, you give uh, heta starch, you give albumin, you give blood. Yes, what would you give? Let's see what you said. Yeah, you need you need red cell replacement, pack cells. I think everybody is very uh, confident about it. There are no, oh, somebody says normal cell. And yes, probably not, right? I wouldn't give normal cell at this stage because you have already given, uh, uh, I mean, unless your blood takes some time, you don't have your, uh, you know, DT done or whatever the other circumstances you are unable to get it done then you probably you buy time with another uh, bolus but however uh, you would immediately give blood in this case would you correct the acidosis with bicarbonate at this point this particular point you would not yes you would not because the fluid will, once the fluid is corrected, it should correct on its own. Even the sodium you expect after giving the proper normal saline, you would correct it. Somebody has asked when to give N by 2 and N by 5. I think there are N by 5 is almost, you know, out of stock, OS, as you commonly call it in the words. So we don't give N by 5 anymore. I have hardly seen N by 5. Um, uh, saline bag or whatever you call it, available in the wards these days. N by two, again, I mean, I have not used in ages. It was, when I was an intern, there were times that we used to use N by two, but now we don't use N by two. There are hardly any recommendations, right? Okay, uh, this one, I think, uh, this is the one that we discussed, the DKA. Uh, just a little bit about the DKA, there, there are managements in the first hour and the second hour. DKA, there are few take-home messages. In the first hour, you give your fluids. In the current, the latest guideline, you, if you are in shock, they say to give a 20 ml per kg bolus. And you always use isotonic fluid, no hypotonic fluids, no colloids, no bicarbonate. Right? You, are, you are having acidosis, but you do not correct it with bicarbonate because there's a reason for that as well. You replace the fluid slowly over 48 to 72 hour period. And uh, there are few schools of thought whether you actually reduct, deduct the resuscitation fluid or not, but you don't have to know the details of it. As of now, if you're in shock, you don't deduct the boluses. So you start the insulin, the sliding scale in the second hour, no boluses, you do not give any boluses. The sliding scale should go on until the blood gas normalizes. You, you treat the acidosis to have a diabetic ketoacidosis, to have, have the di diagnosis of uh, diabetes, Uh, you have to have a di diagnosis of diabetes. You have to have the ketosis and the acidosis. So you correct the acidosis. And once the sugar falls below 14 millimoles per liter, you add your glucose to the fluid, right? Okay, uh, in the summary, uh, normal fluid and electrolyte requirements we discussed. 
we assist and manage the dehydrated trial. Thank you very much. If you have any uh, questions, I will uh, give Rajita my email uh, address. You can get it from Rajita and you can send it to me, right? Wish you best of luck in uh, your internship. Hope you'll manage your patients very well, especially your pediatric patients. Thank you. You can send your emails to this email address if you want. Thank you. I already shared my address. Rajita, can, uh, uh, can you pin me to the slides? Sorry, sir. You, yeah. So, can you pin my video? Yeah, yeah. Slides. Right. So, uh, can all of you all hear me? Am I audible to all of you? Yes. Okay. So, I'm. I was waiting for an answer. Right. Uh, my name is Dr. Krishant. I'm the pediatric neurologist at uh, Kurunagala. Uh, I will be uh, speaking to you about assess how to assess a unconscious child or a child with neurological issues that come, come, uh, that come to you. Now, uh, uh, you, uh, uh, now uh, you have all been wait uh, working as uh, interns, I suppose and uh, you have been uh, working under guidance or supervision of seniors a senior house officer or consultant so you are basically all, uh, all of you have some cover at the moment uh, but for the lucky few of you who uh, you know uh, get posted to peripheral stations uh, maybe working by yourself or maybe working in a group of few uh, medical officers in a rural station or working in the OPD uh, and uh, for those of you who haven't done pediatrics I know there are people who only do medicine and surgery well uh, uh, you will get children who will land in your workplace unconscious now uh, imagine this situation a child who has been playing, crying, uh, doing his normal thing, suddenly becomes unconscious or suddenly gets a convulsion. Now imagine how the parents feel. They are anxious. They are frightened. They know they don't know what's happening. So you have a very highly emotional environment there. And then when the child is brought to you or brought to the brought to your station uh, the your co-workers the nurse the attendant they expect you to lead now lead the resuscitation of this child 
now as a young doctor you know sometimes they will uh, check whether you know things and whether you can do things properly so they will you know uh, try to uh, not help you as well now you are a team leader if you don't have these core skills or core competencies in assessing a child who is unconscious or how to uh, or reviving a child who is having a convulsion you are in a great deal of trouble I'm, I'm suppose I'm correct if I say that and uh, now you have uh, 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 you are after a hefty meal uh, you have had a big dose of pediatrics from morning so if you fall asleep during my lecture and you wake up after 45 minutes and learn nothing if you go to a station like this and find a child unconscious coming to you Remember the paper stories that are there. The whole village comes to assault a doctor who has not uh, uh, not revived the child uh, who is having convulsion. The child has died. So I my my only hope in doing this lecture is to make sure that you get these competencies so that you save yourself at least till the child is you know recovered and you can transfer this child to a better station for further management. Now, having said that, th there are three things that I want to uh, teach you today in this lecture. One is the disability assessment. What are the neurological things you are going to assess in a child who's, uh, who's unconscious? That is the first thing. The second thing is, if the child is having a life-threatening intracranial, uh, high, uh, high uh, raised intracranial pressure. What are the few things that you can do in your station to quickly bring down the raised intracranial pressure? And the third thing, if you are seeing a child with convulsions, how can you make sure that the convulsions are controlled for at least for a few, uh, uh, say half an hour, one hour, for you to stabilize the child and transfer this child to the uh, bigger station. So these are the three things that I'm going to t uh, try to uh, give you some knowledge on uh, during the next next uh, say half an hour, 45 minutes. Now this is a slide I'm sure you have seen before, uh, shown to you several times over the lectures. Uh, so the first things first, you know that uh, APLS is a structured assessment. Hello. Hari daru, hari, hari, hari. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, APLS is a structured assessment, and that uh, uh, even if you see a child, you think, ah, oh, this child is having a neurological problem. You do, or oh, this child is having a convulsion. You don't rush in to manage the convulsion straight away what you do is you uh, make sure the airway is patent you make sure that the air is not obstructed then you go for the circulation you make sure the child is not in shock or if the child is in shock you try to manage the shock and revive the circulation and then only you go and deal with the disability aspect so make uh, remember airway breathing is first circulation is second uh, disability is third. Now we have that because uh, if you have a child with a say a convulsion, the convulsion is not going to kill the child uh, first. It is the airway obstruction, it is the uh, say if the child is hypotensive or having some problem with the circulation, that, that those are the things that will kill the child first. So we have the respiratory failure, secondly we have the circulatory failure, and thirdly only we what we call what i like to call brain failure uh, that is the third thing that is going to kill the child in a sequential order all right now disability assessment now when you look at this uh, slide don't you know uh, uh, feel frustrated there's a lot of things to learn now you can summarize this slide into three things again First one is 
uh, you assess and rate the conscious level. Second thing is you look at the eyes. And third thing is you look at the arms and the legs. That is all you have to do when you assess your disability. So very easy. And with that, you can come to, you can gain a lot of information about the child's neurological issues with all these three assessments only. And you can initiate your quick management or your basic management just by these three things. Okay, so we will uh, go into uh, each component uh, quickly. Now, assessment of consciousness has, uh, again, uh, there are two ways you can assess. One is the AVPU and the second one is the modified Glasgow core muscle. I'm sure you know this. Uh, AVPU is, uh, stand, A stands for alert, B for voice, P for pain and U for unresponsiveness. And this is, uh, the importance of this is, this is a very rapid assessment. So you don't need to remember a lot of things, uh, you know, a whole chart to do this. And anybody, uh, even a nurse can do this. You just see whether the child is alert, whether he's, he's not alert, then you see whether he's responding to pain or responding to words. Now, that is the crucial point here in this assessment. Is he responding to words or is he responding to pain? If he is responding only to pain, you know that his airway is not secure. And you can, you know, on the right, side, right hand side, you can see some numbers. Those are the corresponding numbers for the Glasgow Coma Scale. And you, you can see that P stands for, uh, Glasgow Coma corresponds to a GCS of 4 to 8 or less than 9. And here is the point where you know that the airway is not pay, uh, secure. You need to do something to make sure that the airway is secure. I do the oral airway or you need to incubate and ventilate. That is the crucial point in uh, differentiation in the ABPU scale. But the, you know, on the downside of the ABPU, you now you can see that, you know, if you say is alert, that is 15, but if he's responding to voice, then the GCS will range from 14 to 8. Pain 8 to 4. That is a wide range. So, this is not a good assessment for you to monitor small changes in consciousness. So, if you need to monitor a child over a long period to see whether the child is deteriorating or improving, then this is not a good scale. So, then you need to go for the Glasgow Coma scale, which is a 15 point scale. Uh, you have uh, 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 and it is, uh, you know, broken down into three main segments. First one is the eye opening. Second one is the verbal response. Third one is the motor response. And each is, each component is scored. Uh, motor response, you get six points. Uh, verbal response, five points. And eye response, four points. Now, I can't remember this chart. You know, it has, uh, it has a separate section for a child, it has a separate section for a less than one year old. So it's difficult to remember all these things. So I don't try to remember this. But what I do is um, uh, I uh, tell my junior doctors to have this chart at the bedside. Bedside in the a and &E, bedside in your OPD or admission table or even your PICU or your, you can have a small chart here like this. And you can look at the chart and score. So what you can, uh, and uh, common mistakes that you do here is, when you uh, assess the GCS, you just take, you know, a broad assessment. You don't assess all the components. You take a broad assessment and say, ah, GCS is 11 out of 50. That re really does not mean anything to me. If you tell me uh, GCS is 11 out of 15, he might, you know, have uh, low components on certain aspects such as the uh, uh, eye opening or the verbal and have a high, higher, he might score high on the motor response. So you need to break down each, uh, the, uh, the individual components and tell this to the, uh, the, uh, the senior doctors. Say eye opening is 2, verbal response is 3 and motor response is 5, something like that. And then you give the total score total score is this much out of 50. 
that gives more information than just telling uh, uh, GCS is 11 out of 50. Uh, that is uh, one important thing that I wanted to stress. And the other thing is how you elicit the GCS. Uh, you can see even in the GCS also there is uh, uh, voice responses, uh, pain responses. Now when you give pain, don't uh, give pain over the eyeballs or the sternum. That really eyeball pressure might harm the eyes. Uh, when you give the give pressure over the sternum, you cannot really uh, decide whether the child is withdrawing or localizing. So what uh, uh, is recommended is you give pressure over the th nail bed, over the thumb. You can give deep pressure and cause deep pain here. Now, if the child uses the other hand to push away your hand, then he is definitely localizing. But if he's just you know pulling like this, then he might. It's mostly when he is trying to withdraw, and uh, uh, you score according to that. Uh, the other thing to remember is most people you know touch like this and ask baba 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 to home something like that, you know, uh, or nimal to home. So if you know he has had a fracture here, when you touch, he, uh, you are eliciting pain as well as you are giving a voice command. That is two stimuli at the same time, and then uh, your you know assessment becomes uh, uh, it is not reliable and then uh, it is not reproducible as well. So make sure that you give uh, if you are giving voice, just give voice commands, or if you are giving pain, you give just a uh, pain command. Yeah, you uh, give pain, uh, pain stimulus. Uh, so that is an important uh, another thing that you need to remember. Now, uh, this is, uh, I'm uh, uh, going to go through this quite quickly because otherwise it's going to take time. You know, this is a small case where I, uh, we, uh, a, a seven year old child had come and uh, his uh, responses are put down. He's responding to verbal stimuli, he uh, withdraws to pain, and he's disoriented and conversive. Can you quickly in your chat boxes uh, write down where in the AVP skill where he uh, where he is? So AVP skill. Just write whether is it at A, V, P, or U. Now, I'm hoping that you all are there and not, you know, gone somewhere keeping the computer on or you all are not fast asleep and I'm not talking to myself. Right, good. So, you're answering. So, somebody said alert. Is he alert? Uh, he's responding to verbal stimuli. Sorry, he's responding to verbal stimuli. So, that means he is not definitely you know fully alert so uh, he is not fully alert so you can't say a and uh, avpu scale uh, i agree with your comments uh, somebody says uh, he is uh, uh, somebody says p so uh, he is responding to pain now uh, yeah, uh, uh, motor response withdraws from pain you ask for us what uh, you put uh, what you score is the highest that he can do uh, your highest observation that you get so he is responding to verbal stimuli and that is the highest response so pain is uh, a response that is less than verbal so <coughs> you can't say so uh, uh, in the avpu scale you don't uh, classify him as uh, re responding to pain because he is responding to voice only and you have to uh, a score what is the uh, the highest response that you get now quickly so he, he is responding to voice now quickly can you put on a uh, 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 type in the gcs and uh, type in the gcs the way i uh, told you to do uh, uh, and you can you know the gcs as i said i have put the chart on the uh, corner of the slide 
yeah so people are you know uh, i'm sure uh, uh, dushanti dilini uh, farhan they have uh, xiaomi they have not listened to what i said chamini vikram ratna as well so you are not putting just a score there that's what i said you have to break it down into each individual components so uh, you just uh, you don't say uh, uh, gcs is 12 you have to say how much b how much m how much uh, e so that is the way to you know communicate gcs so if you look at uh, his verbal uh, um, uh, response i responses he is responding to verbal stimuli that is uh, he is eye opening is to speech that is three motor response is withdrawal so that is four and uh, verbal responses are he is dis disoriented but conversive that means he is confused so four and you get a total of eleven there all right and uh, now we go to another you know uh, the uh, the same child few hours later can we do the same exercise quickly uh avpu what is the avpu yeah so you say as uh, correctly uh, uh, in avpu now he is responding only to pain and you can see i response to painful stimuli now initially it was to verbal stimuli and motor response is again withdrawal to pain now uh, he is scoring only to pain not to voice so you say his uh, uh, verbal uh, his abpu is p and now i want you to tell me uh, the gcs somebody said gcs two is two uh, if you uh, know uh, gcs cannot be less than three because each component gets at least one mark okay so uh, gcs how much is gcs i response to pain is two motor response is uh, uh, still four well uh, in, now his verbal response is incomprehensible sounds that is two that so gcs is eight now you can see this uh, the same child initially responding to voice gcs is 11 now responding to pain gcs is uh, eight so yes uh, definitely deteriorated in both scales and uh, the scales are corresponding and complementary to each other and uh, what is the important thing now that you have assessed the gcs in this child for the second time what is the important thing that you uh, identify i said this earlier as well the important thing to identify is that his uh, because his GCS is eight and eight or less, his airway is now uh, not safe. And uh, as some of you have co have commented, he needs to be intubated uh, and ventilated because you need to secure the airway. So very good. Now we move on to the pupils. I said. Uh, the second component of assessing GCS is uh, looking at the eyes. Uh, uh, now there's a saying in English that you know, I, uh, I don't know whether you know, that eyes are the window to your soul. But you know, for a neurologist, uh, I, uh, the pupils are the window to your brain. Now why do I say that? Just by looking at the pupil, you can... Uh, uh, identify a number of different conditions so just by looking at the eye, eyes you can tell this child is having this problem in the brain so it's a window to your brain just by looking at your pupil uh, you have uh, you basically look at the size of the pupil uh, the shape of the pupil uh, the symmetry the reactivity a lot of things but all you need to do is basically to identify three patterns so what are these three patterns that you need to identify by looking at the pupils one is whether only one side is dilated second thing is whether both sides are dilated and fixed and the third uh, pattern is whether 
the uh, pupils are pinpoint or small than usual. So that is the only three things that you need to identify. Can you know check one side, the other side. You see the consensual direct, uh, you know, uh, direct uh, reflex. All these, you know, various things you can look at. But at the end of the thing, uh, end of the day, you are identifying three patterns that you need to remember. So very easy. So neurology is, you know, very it's very uh, logical and uh, pattern recognition. So easy things. You uh, only a few things you need to remember to identify a uh, so, uh, lot of things. Now you can see a whole lot of conditions here. Now all of these conditions can be grouped into the three patterns that are on your left hand uh, side. So let's do that as an exercise. Now tell uh, you uh, type in the chat box uh, uh, where uh, you know, a third nerve lesion would uh, you know if the child is having a third nerve lesion, what would be the eye sign? Yeah, you can uh, one two. You can uh, one two out of one two three. Uh, type in what you want. So third one, good. So it will be unilaterally dilated. Now organ phosphate poisoning. Yeah, uh, somebody said two bilaterally fixed dilated. First one, yeah. So correct. Uh, Correct, first one. Pin, you, so you get pinpoint pupils. There are only two conditions you get pinpoint pupils in. So one of those is organ phosphate poisoning, and you will get another one later on. Hypothermia. Hypothermia. Not sure, anyone? Okay, so I, I mean, if I was, if I were to guess, now I had one condition on the, uh, uh, one was third, one was uh, first, so I would put, I mean, if I don't know, you know, MCQ, next one I would put as the second, no? So it is uh, fixed dilated with I, I put the anticholinergic drugs. Example of an anticholinergic drug. Anticholinergic drugs, you get uh, fixed dilated pupils. Remember that uh, uh, not the first one. I said there are only uh, organophosphate poisoning is one. Yeah, atropine, uh, yeah, uh, correct. Atropine is an anticholinergic drug. So when you go to your eye, eye surgeon uh, to get your eyes checked for anything, they put atropine uh, to your eye on one side to dilate that eye. You can get anticholinergic, you can, I mean, some, we give anticholinergic drugs to children for various reasons as well. And the, these can cause dilation of both sides. And you know, it's some, I remember once when I was working as a registrar, a patient came with a unilaterally dilated pupil. Uh, this was an adult patient when I was doing my adult uh, appointment. Everybody body got excited thinking it was a surgical uh, uh, you know surgical third nerve like a third nerve uh, lesion I rushed to do, uh, do a CT only to find out the CT was normal and the, uh, the patient on the previous day had gone to the eye surgery so all that trouble for nothing just uh, you know brief history would have uh, saved a lot of uh, trouble for everyone barbiturates what will barbiturates do Yeah, barbiturates remember uh, gives you a, a dilated pupil a tentorial herniation uh, a tentorial herniation you are you know uh, the, uh, we, uh, there's a small part called the uncus which herniates down initially on one side and when it does that it will press on the third nerve and you will get a unilaterally dilated uh, pupil first but when the herniation progresses both sides starts to dilate and the whole brain uh, goes down, uh, cones downwards and when you uh, and then the brain then gets compressed uh, 
at the foramen magnum and when that happens uh, you get a bilateral fixed dilated pupil and then uh, there is no point uh, in uh, doing anything for the child because the child is now brain dead. Uh, during a post seizure you can get a bilateral dilated pupil and during a seizure you can get a unilateral dilated pupil. So you know if you are a child with a history of seizures well, is on anti-epileptic drugs comes to with a unilateral dilated pupil again uh, like you know that patient I was talking about don't uh, think now this child is having a uh, you know a brain tumor or whatever or is herniating or whatever because uh, that might be the only sign that the child is having a seizure unilateral dilated pupil so everything is normal then you might do a EEG and then find uh, epileptic activity on one side Severe hypoxia, we know that causes dilated pupils. Medallion lesion, anyone? What does that cause? Anybody? Medallion lesion? Wait for a few more answers. Okay. Uh, medullary lesion, med medullary lesion uh, also causes pinpoint pupil uh, pupils. So remember, these are the two only two things the, that will cause pinpoint pupils. So if you have pinpoint pupils, it can be either something that is happening in the medulla, uh, it can be a stroke, it can be a, a tumor, whatever, or it can be that the child has just uh, taken something atrogenic. Or, uh, something uh, toxic like organic phosphate poison. Okay, rapidly expanding its lateral lesion. We talked about that. Focal seizures, we talked about that, causes dilated pupils on one side. And yes, so as I said, all these conditions are now grouped into only three patterns for you to remember. And remember the say. Uh, remember what I said uh, that you know I saw the window to your soul or whatever. So don't go and uh, go looking at uh, everybody's eyes now. Uh, uh, but remember that when you see a child, uh, first thing is the consciousness. Second thing is the uh, examination of the pupils. Try to identify, see whether it fits into these three patterns, and then you look at the last component of the disability that is looking at the arms and the legs when you look at the arms and the legs what you need to do again is pattern recognition you identify whether the child is posturing posturing is uh, keeping arms and legs in a certain way so there are only two postures for you to remember first one is uh, the corticate posture uh, try to uh, imagine uh, you know a rugby player uh, catch, uh, you know uh, holding uh, the rugby ball and running something like that so upper limbs are flexed lower limbs are extended then you have the decerebrate posture second one where both upper limbs are extended like this and the lower limbs are also extended uh, decorticate is better than decerebrate but both conditions uh, indicate something is you know has been on the background and has been increasing gradually over a period of time so that again uh, uh, something has been going on it's not something that has happened you know like this something has been going on for some time in the brain uh, again an indicator of something happening and there's raised in the penal pressure in your brain so those are the three things that you need to do in your disability assessment so very easy for you to remember now we go through a small case so this is a uh, uh, boy who had come with drowsiness and had convulsions you can see that uh, he is drowsy uh, his uh, respiratory rate and uh, pulse rate are normal uh, 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 the basic uh, causes for this would be either electrolyte imbalances something arthrogenic uh, such as poisoning uh, something acutely happening inside the brain such as a stroke uh, 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 and the metabolic things are hypoglycemia, hypoxia, electrolyte imbalances, 
or the child might have had a convulsion and then this is the postictal phase so if any child who comes to you with the acute drowsiness think about infection think about uh, uh, metabolic conditions think about something ingested that's quite common in the rural areas so think about something suddenly happening inside the brain and uh, think about uh, other things like such as arrhythmias which are very uncommon so i'm just going through this quickly because you have time uh, you can type in anything you want somebody asks so are pinpoint pupils in contact yeah so somebody is asking pinpoint pupils in pontine hemorrhages yes so the, the answer for that is yes so the things that you need to look at are in the skin uh, try to see whether there's a rash that might indicate you know uh, uh, something like a meningococcal septicemia bruising uh, uh, non-accidental injury uh, you need to look at the pupils and breath uh, the, sometimes the breath might you know have a various uh, orders that suggest that the child is having a metabolic condition lacerations indicate again an unaccidental injury uh, csf or blood from the nose and ears indicate there has been uh, trauma to the base of the skull breathing patterns chain strokes uh, apnea these are uh, uh, basically uh, signs of raised intracranial pressure and the abdomen you look at the rigidity for set, uh, features of sepsis a bruising again for bleeding uh, and an unaccidental injury posturing we talked about uh, now signs of raised intracranial pressure i know uh, uh, you might be familiar with these they are either uh, they are deteriorate uh, so if you when you do the gcs and when you monitor the gcs gcs is rapidly going or uh, gradually going down if the child has an open fontanel uh, less than one year old or infant it will be very uh, you know full it will be tense it will be bulging and when you touch the child it will start to cry uh, abnormal posturing pushing striatus hypertension bradycardia uh, and the abnormal breathing patterns these are late signs and these are there you are you are you know you know that basically in a few hours you are going to get into a, a, a big big trouble so you need to make sure that you you do something before you get the pushing start or the decod or decelebrate posture. Uh, causes of raised ICP are uh, similar to the causes of drowsiness, infection, uh, metabolic, uh, something happening inside the brain such as stroke or hemorrhage. Uh, I'm going rushing through because of time. Uh, now, if you know uh, you get a child, he's uh, having reduced conscious level. Uh, uh, GCS is deteriorating gradually, and you are the uh, doctor, uh, doctor in charge of the hospital. So your first you know, I'm, I'm instinct is to uh, you know transfer this child. Uh, to the uh, to the next uh, better station but until you, you know get the ambulance ready until you uh, uh, prepare the child you need to make sure that you stabilize the child then uh, the, here is where your APLS knowledge is important so you uh, uh, make sure that the airway is uh, protected you put on high flow oxygen you make sure that the circulation is all right by uh, putting white book cannula, you take the bloods that you can do at that station. You, uh, the causes were discussed for you to remember that you might want to do a, at least the blood glucose. If you can do electrolytes, that's good, but you might not be able to do. If you can do a culture that's, uh, that would be fabulous, but you know, it, uh, it might not be possible, but you might have one or two blood culture bottles there, you can, which you can send off with. And, but if the child is hypotensive and in, in shock, you have to revive the circulation. Then you come to the uh, the disability or the central nervous system. He is unconscious. GCS is low. Uh, he might be posturing. You might identify some of these, you know, pushing strides or abnormal breathing patterns. And uh, the problem is, even though you are planning to transfer, he might not survive the journey. So you are traveling with him uh, on that uh, ambulance. Uh, several you know 30 50 kilometers to the next station 
so what do you do now so you have to make sure that uh, whatever is causing this problem in the cns or in the inside the brain you uh, try to uh, at least get around it till you you know arrive at that station now the main problem why you get deteriorating conscious levels is as you know is raised intracranial pressure raised intracranial pressure remember now the uh, uh, skull is a thick rigid box inside what you usually get is the brain and the blood vessels and the ventric ventricular system but if the you know the brain is swollen then there is no if the brain is swelling and you know coming in the matters this rigid box is not allowing the brain to expand that is one re, uh, one cause or if the blood you know there's a hemorrhage and the blood is leaking out again you there is no space for the blood to you know uh, blood is taking up the space of the brain or if there is uh, say something ex outside these two like a tube again there is raised intracranial pressure now how do you and uh, what you need to do is you need to manage this raised intracranial pressure at, uh, uh, with some medical management so what are the principles in managing the raised intracranial pressure uh, basically the general there are general principles and there are specific principles general principles is trying to keep the child's metabolic rate down try, uh, trying to uh, keep the child quiet those are the general principles so how do you keep the child you elevate the head then make sure that noises and disturbances are as are low as possible if you can have a, a dark environment make sure that the sugars are treated if the hypoglycemia is it's going to worsen this uh, if the child is convulsing you have to make sure the convulsions are under control so these are these are, these are the basic general principles targeting to make keep the child quiet and targeting to reduce the metabolic rate inside the body and then you uh, go on for specific management so specific management one is you intubate the child and uh, uh, you uh, when, when you intubate and ventilate you can uh, hyperventilate the child until the carbon dioxide come down you might not have this facility of uh, you know uh, blood gas but when you hyperventilate when the carbon dioxide go down uh, there is vaso constriction you do not try to uh, over reduce the carbon dioxide because too much vaso constriction is going to cause hypoxia to the brain uh, that is one uh, thing uh, you might remember you know your physiology from your medical student days uh, mean uh, the cerebral perfusion pressure is equal to mean arterial pressure minus uh, uh, intracranial pressure so uh, the uh, the point is you need to keep the cerebral perfusion pressure going you do that by uh, keeping the mean arterial pressure uh, uh, so uh, without letting the child becoming hypotensive uh manage the circulation by giving fluids or inotropes that is one thing and then the second uh, one is you try to get the intracranial pressure down the two drugs that we use are mannitol and 3% sodium chloride both have their own advantages and disadvantages we prefer so 3% uh, sodium chloride because it does not cause a massive diuresis and cause a drop in the blood blood pressures but mannitol is might be useful if you think you know this might be a decay or something and you cannot cannot think about giving sodium chloride when you know the so, uh, sodium might shoot up and become you might become hypernatremic or something and then uh worsen the condition so if you are thinking about electrolyte imbalances then mannitol might be better than three percent sodium chloride so it, it has to be decided at the bedside depending on the patient but remember there is a limit that this medical manage your general management your medical management can go and if it's not improving the child's condition the child is united pupil on one side uh gcs is dropping uh, uh, gradually with even with your interventions uh then the medical management is not going to work it's not going to work and what you will end up losing this child 
and it's important that you uh, get the neurosurgeons involved here because now you need to now break this rigid box take a flap out so that your brain can expand out that will dissipate the pressure and here what you uh, what you need to do is you need to contact the station that you're going to and tell them uh, that he might need neurosurgical intervention i will answer your questions at the end right because uh, of time i will answer all the questions in the chat box at the end uh, and once you reduce the increased intracranial pressure, you need to find out the cause, obviously, and treat the cause as well. They can it's an infection, give broad spectrum antibiotics, looking about encephalitis, give acyclovir. Uh, if you are thinking about poisoning, you might need to think about the specific antidote, uh, something like that, right? Okay, now uh, I want to do the convulsion lecture as well because there, there are a few things that have. Uh, that has changed in the algorithm and you might want to remember this uh, uh, when you go to the stations and have some of these drugs in with you available uh, now we know that uh, uh, a status is where a convulsion that is going on for more than 30 minutes or when you know you have you have short convulsions without the child regaining consciousness for 30 minutes but when you have that dis definition some sometimes uh, doctors become complacent that they can wait for 30 minutes to initiate drugs that is not the case at five, uh, five minutes you have to start your algorithm uh, in uh, controlling the drugs uh, controlling the seizures sorry the causes are similar to uh, what you get for uh, what you get for uh, reduced uh, consciousness now if the child is having a fever and a rash and a convulsion you have to think about meningitis it's rabbit very rapid tonsil you know his child is you know uh, well one minute next minute he is having a convulsion catastrophic convulsion then you think about something uh, happening inside the brain such as a stroke or hemorrhage or he has something he has ingested if it's vague history the history changes from one day to the next day if you ask the history from mother mother tells something father tells another thing and the grandmother tells a whole different thing then you think uh, there are something fishy about this whole thing then you need to think about an unaccidental injury uh, blood pressure can cause uh, seizures hypertension and uh, when you manage a child with convulsions make sure that you do the glu uh, glucose because uh, all your drugs will fail if the child is hypoglycemic and if you don't correct the hypoglycemia so always 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 remember I will not forget, ever forget to do a glucose in a child who is convulsing. So when you go on to the algorithm, there are a few things that you need to remember. IV drugs are better than oral or what you call buccal or you know PR drugs. That is one 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 concept or one thing that, that has come out of from, come out from evidence. So you have diazepam PR, you have midazolam PR, uh, and you both can be given IV, but IV drugs are better than uh, the other, you know, other routes. So that is why the algorithm says you need to cannulate, uh, at, uh, you know, uh, during that first five minutes. So you, you initiate your drugs at five minutes. But sometimes you might not be able to cannulate. So we, uh, we understand that perfectly. So if that happens only, then you can, you know, uh, go on to other drugs. But always remember, to control the seizures, IV drugs are better. Or if you take the drugs, midazolam versus diazepam, what is better? Uh, midazolam is much better than diazepam uh, for mainly two reasons. One is it has less respiratory uh, you know, side effects. Now the problems the peripheral doctors have faced, where then the whole village comes and attacks the doctor when the child you know, collapse, uh, gets a respiratory arrest, is where the diazepam has been given uh, too quickly, too much. Medicinam does have the same complication, but at a you know lesser incidences are reported. So it's much better to give medicinam, and uh, you can give buccal medicinam if you cannot uh, IV cannula as well. So remember that. And the next uh, reason why it's better is buccal uh, medicinam has a uh, faster uh, onset of action. So I mean, if you give uh, uh, one, uh, if you give uh, medicinam to one child. That's spam to the other child. 
the child who got uh, got the diamidazolam will uh, 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 the seizure will stop quickly than the one who got the diazepam and it's shown that the midazolam lasts longer inside the body as well so things to remember now uh, the first uh, <coughs> at five, first five minutes you give midazolam then you wait for another five minutes to give your next midazolam dose second midazolam dose so what do you do during the five minutes you again go and re reassess the airway breathing circulation if you had forgotten the glucose at the first five minutes our uh, ear is again hello Hurry, right? Thank you. You, uh, you, uh, then you uh, give the, uh, you uh, do the glucose here as well, and you uh, you make sure that the airway breathing circulation is stable. So the second uh, step is giving another uh, midazolam or diazepam, depending on what you have. Uh, again, IV drugs are much better than oral drugs. So make sure if you haven't put the cannula in at the first five minutes, the second five minutes, use that time to put at, make sure somehow you get a cannula or intraosseous line in. <coughs> and the third step is you make sure that the seizure is going on. Third step here. Now the previous algorithm said phenytoin of phenobarbital. Now phenobarbital is now going out of fashion in, um, in managing status uh, epilepticus. So now we are thinking of more on uh, phenytoin or levitrastam. Now levitrastam is not available in the government sector, but you know it's available outside in the uh, outside pharmacies as an IV preparation. Uh, levitrastam dose is 40 to 60 milligrams per kg. Phenytoin dose is 20 milligrams per kg. Hello, Hari, 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 Maminna. Right, thank you. Uh, Phenytoin is uh, 20 milligrams per kg. The thing to remember is Levitrastam has very few side effects. You can give it IV as a bolus, no problem. But when you give uh, Levitrastam, but when you give Phenytoin, you need to make sure that you uh, uh, monitor the cardiac rhythms because it can cause ventricular uh, uh, tachys like. Uh, is and you know arrhythmias certain complications that are there now if you have given for any time you wait for five minutes and then for the fourth step if the seizure is still going on you uh, think about giving uh any time so if you given the vitrestum you are the fourth step you are, you are giving any time if you are given any time for the fourth step if you have levitrestum you think of giving uh levitrestum but say you do not have levitrastam and then only you can consider giving phenobarbital. So phenobarbital has been pushed down to the fourth step only if you don't have levitrastam. Now if levitrastam dose 20 milligrams per kg, again once you give it you need to wait for 20 minutes. Uh, but if the child continues to seize, make sure that uh, you intubate and ventilate and you need to uh, fix this child to the ventilator and start giving him infusion, infusions of tarpenton, propofol or even midazolam of inibarbital and we are trying to induce something called a burst suppression inside the head not just intubate, ventilate, paralyze. So that is you know uh, if you are in a peripheral station these are the things that you will be doing while you transfer this child if you are in the PICU, pediatric ICU, these are the things you need to consider doing uh, as soon as you detect the seizure and by about 40 minutes you are intubated, uh, you have intubated the child and you have started your uh, 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 infusion of the uh, drugs that I talked about trying to induce a, a suppression for that you might need a continuous EEG monitoring. So those are what I want to talk about. Quickly, I will talk. Uh, look at your questions, sir. So, up in lateral to me, yes. Can you off the mics, please? So up on times. I talked about that. Uh, so slow pulse means bradycardia. So slow pulse can be, uh, you know, it can be bradycardia or bradyarrhythmias. Uh, I'm sure you might have a, might have had a lecture on cardiac problems, so I'm not a uh, you know expert on uh, arrhythmias and all that. But 
a slow pulse might mean either bradycardia or arrhythmia you know there are various bradyarrhythmias that are there please describe about decorticate and decerebrate posture it's very easy so decorticate is you uh, you uh, you know catch a ball like this so i don't have anything to uh, demonstrate you hold something like this and uh, think about a uh, rugby player holding a ball or whatever and uh, you the upper limbs are upper limbs are flexed lower limbs are extended lower limbs are like this that is decorticate for the ball right that is the easiest way to remember the cerebrate is when you have upper limbs extended lower limbs also extended like this and that is bad that is worse and if you see that in chinese you know at the end stages uh, avoid avoid opioids what does that mean who's taking opioids so please again tell how to decide to give mannitol or three okay so uh, uh, basically if you have three percent sodium chloride if if you know uh, if this child is not having a electrolyte you are not suspecting something like dk or something give the three percent sodium chloride but make sure that you monitor the sodium uh, periodically if the sodium is rising you know if the sodium is uh, when you gave uh, gave it was 130 when you gave the three percent it's 140 and uh, six hours later it's 160 now uh, child is still uh, showing signs of raised intracranial pressure now you can't give three percent at that point because if you give another three percent it will shoot up 180 then you have to think about giving manitol uh, because you, uh, it might, these drugs might be uh, you might need to decide to give them regularly at you know eight hours or whatever intervals but if the child is having an electrolyte problem make sure that you do not give uh, three percent you are giving manitol uh, if the child is uh, hemophilia and ICH and raised interfinal, what are the management points? So hemophilia, you, uh, you need to correct the, you know, the uh, deficit completely. There's a calculation to correct that deficit. I cannot remember that now, uh, but that is the specific management, but the general management remains same. So if the if a hemophilic child becomes unconscious and comes to your admission, you do the same thing airway breathing circulation then disability many you know assess the disability uh, if the child is showing raised features of raised intracranial pressure uh, intubate the child uh, think about the general principles think about the specific principles and then uh, in this case the specific management is you need to correct the uh, factor uh, defi deficiencies and if the, you know the uh, intracranial hemorrhage is increasing and increasing and increasing, you need to need to need to consider a, a neurosurgical opinion as quickly as possible with intracranial imaging, uh, neuroimaging. So is there are no place for rectal diaspam. So there is a place for rectal diaspam. There is a place for rectal diaspam. Think now uh, the child comes in. You try to put in. He is uh, put in a cannula. You cannot get the can, uh, get cannula in and uh, uh, then you need to consider parental roots such as uh, buckle or PR and sometimes mid in these peripheral stations sometimes we are you are posted to you cannot find midocellar you can only find diacepam and uh, in that case you have to use diacepam now uh, the important thing to remember about diacepam is that you give the correct dose in the correct uh, frequency so your rectal diaspam dose is 0.5 milligrams per kg uh, over about five minutes and IV dose is half of that dose 0.25 milligrams per kg. So think that you have put in a cannula now you are going to give diaspam because you don't have midazolam. If you rush in within about you know few seconds you are definitely going to get a respiratory arrest in that child and you will find the whole village below. You know, coming to bash you so that is not what we want to want to happen you give it as a slow bolus if you can't find uh, diazepam uh, uh, midazolam 
but uh, if you are uh, you can you mean if you don't have other options i mean these algorithms are all guidelines uh, what you do will depend on your local circumstances so if you can only find the diazepam if you can't put in a cannula yes there is a place for pr diazepam uh, can we have a timetable on the schedule upcoming lectures i don't i can't do that for you sir if you suspect increased icp do we give manitol and apcd approach directly no if you are uh, so all uh, apls is a structured way of managing patients so if you uh, if you sus uh, you can only suspect raised uh, you but when the patient rush uh, comes to examination table you don't uh, straight away think about raised icp uh, the child might be unconscious but there might be other reasons for the child to be unconscious now think about uh, there uh, in one slide i said arrhythmias and somebody has asked that question arrhythmias can cause a child to be unconscious a uh, uh, convulsion can uh, uh, post ictal drowsiness can be the reason the child is unconscious so you don't i mean don't have tunnel vision don't think about only one thing uh, uh, when you uh, when an ch unconscious child comes to your examination table go through the systematic approach airway breathing assess and stabilize circulation assess and stabilize then assess the disability if, and uh, you can you know on the side uh, get the nurse to take a brief history of what has happened and if things tally then you can you know after you uh, do that you can rush to or you can you can you know decide to manage the raised icp with the principles that i talked about so if we corrected fluid by normal saline in an increased icp does it become detrimental no so what you mean is you are correcting the hypotension because i said uh, cerebral perfusion pressure equals mean arterial pressure minus icp now your whole argument here is you need to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure so icp and mean arterial pressure are the two you know uh, think about a, uh, a weighing scale the two arms of the weighing scale so if both go uh, you know if the mean arterial pressure goes down uh, cerebral perfusion pressure goes down if the icp goes up again the cerebral perfusion pressure goes down so you are trying to balance this uh, you know scale so you have to balance both of both both sides to make sure that the perfusion inside the brain is okay so you don't just manage one arm so the question is if we correct fluid by normal saline in an increased icp would it become detrimental so you have to make sure that the arterial mean arterial pressure is managed by giving fluids giving inotropes you have to make sure that the raised icp is managed by the other methods maybe manitol uh, uh, sodium chloride uh, intubation and ventilation and things like that okay that's all for questions anything else yeah running out of time for 420 now uh, blueprint is something i hope that has been discussed because i'm not going through this uh, so thank you I will stop there. Uh, in summary, what I tried to do was to give you some basic ideas about the competencies that you need to assess an unconscious child or a neurologically ill child, what we call a child with brain failure. Remember the three things that I talked to you about, assessment of disability by look, uh, conscious level, looking at the eyes, looking at the uh, and then uh, uh, we talked about basically the management of ICP. We talked basically about the management of a convulsion. So those are the basic things that we managed. So thank you. I think Viraj is going to take over the screen. Are you, are you there, Viraj? Ah, uh, yes, Kushan. Okay, so thank, screen thanks, is... Thanks, right. Thank you. I hope uh, you can see my screen. Can you see, see it, Krishant? You are audible and your screen is visible. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so, um, what I'm going to discuss is uh, 
it's about structured approach actually so you all of you had uh, had so many lectures about the airway uh, breathing circulation and disability so i'm sure like um, i mean this is going to be a, a very easy lecture because you have already gone through it but i'll just take you through it about our blueprint and what we are going to do uh, so generally uh, the objectives of this lecture how to identify a seriously ill child and then how to identify how do you how will you approach this child and go ahead with the management so uh, that's basically what i'm going to discuss today and if you have any questions uh, uh, while we are going through it uh, you can put up in the chat box i'll be more than happy to answer um, so these are two objectives and um, right so uh, the right so uh, this is a very important slide that i want you all to remember now you, you all would have spoken about uh, you all would have heard about cardiac arrest in the morning so uh, there are like a major difference between the cardiac arrest in children and uh, cardiac arrest in adults so uh, because cardiac is like a periterminal event a terminal event actually if you don't uh, address properly uh, so in uh, adults mostly cardiac arrest is due to a primary cardiac issue like a massive myocardial infarction or maybe a cardiac arrhythmia right or maybe having a you know cardiac failure and you know going into cardiac arrest that sort of thing a primary cardiac issue whereas in children normally unless of course the child has a has a congenital heart disease uh, you know uh, otherwise of course their hearts are very young and healthy so most of the times they get into cardiac arrest because of a unresolved respiratory issue or a circulatory issue because most of the illnesses that affect children right are you know belong to one of these two parts either a respiratory issue or a circulatory issue right that's that means it's a shock so unless treated properly they will end up with cardiac arrest so that's what you need to remember so when you see a child with a cardiac arrest it's most likely due to one of these two issues so you will have to correct that underlying problem otherwise of course the child is not going to survive right now if, for an example if it's a child who's coming with uh, you know a very bad asthma right unless treated at home uh, acute severe asthma not treated or even a very bad croup or for a, or is maybe ongoing convulsion right or a raised icp as you would have discussed in the previous lecture unless properly treated would end up in respiratory failure which would cause a secondary cardiac arrest so but you would only see the cardiac arrest like you know as the main event but what preceded it was the respiratory failure which should have been corrected right so as you attend to this child you have to correct the respiratory component as well that's why we say airway breathing circulation so unless you treat the airway no no point treating the cardiac arrest right unless you correct that he's not going to come out of it right likewise a child with air dengue shock right full fluid maldistribution dengue or sepsis right coming with shock unless treated for a while uh, not treated for a while would end up with a cardiac arrest so that's what you need to remember right so any child with a cardiac arrest always think is there underlying respiratory issue or is there underlying circulatory issue that's why it's always airway breathing circulation right okay now so this is the structured approach or the blueprint right so what is a structured approach so when you have a patient a bad patient right a critically ill right patient who's fighting for breath going to get arrested in a moment right you, it's a very time critical event you have to do the right thing at the right moment right so if a, if a child is going to get arrested unless you support his airway and breathing or like say some a child is choking there is a foreign body obstructed unless you take it out in the next moment he's going to get you know choked and going to get arrested right so you have to do what is drawing that patient if you imagine like you are going to put a cannula and give him iv fluids right it's not going to help so you have to do the most important thing early right so that's why where the structured approach comes right so the all these time critical events are prioritized in a uh, in a life saving manner right so and when you are faced with such a bad patient you can't be thinking right okay Uh, this patient has a has a is in profound shock and also he is in respiratory failure. Should I put a cannula and give IV fluids, a bolus, or should I intubate him 
and uh, ventilating, right? So you can't be thinking. So because, because obviously you are you know, confused and you are in a state of panic. So uh, that's where the structured approach comes. So no matter whether the patient comes with, you know, patient comes with fitting due to ICH, due to poisoning or due to um, say uh, meningitis, you approach it the same. You first address the airway, the next the breathing, next the circulation, right? Then the disability, then you control the seizure, right? First, you give priority to the RV. So if you're going to control the seizure in a child whose RV is compromised, even though you control the seizure, he would have died of hypoxia, right? So, but the structured approach is made in such a manner where these things are prioritized. RV comes first, then breathing. So no point trying to correct his breathing if you are trying to give ambu breaths in a child whose RV is blocked with secretions. So you have to clear the airway first. So that's why it's very important. So if you are used to this, you don't need to think and work out what should I do first. Here, everything's in order. You have practiced it. You have a bad patient. It's like a drill, right? So that, that's where the structured approach is very important. Without thinking, you do the most important time critical thing. And a blueprint means it's the basic plan, right? So how, we, how are we going to go about it, right? That's what we're going to talk about. So there are five stages in the structured approach. So it's triage, triaging, then position in the child, right? So you triage and identify, okay, it's a bad, bad child, right? It's a, bad, it's a severe, serious, seriously ill child. Then you position the child properly in a proper place in the most appropriate position. You do your initial stabilization, go in the order of airway, breathing, circulation, disability. You correct them, right? And then after you do the initial stabilization, take a quick history and do a quick focused examination and then commence on specific treatment, right? And then uh, after you do all this, you hand over to the ICU or to the HDU for further management, right? So if I just quickly, um, quickly go, like we'll take an example, okay, child, so you are in the triage. That means triage means where are you? As um, like, you know, even at LRH, now there is a triage nurse uh, at the OPD who's seated there, who will go through each and every patient and see, okay, who is a bad patient, who is not a bad patient, right? So that's the basic triaging. So you, you categorize patients according to the severity of illness. So if you identify, okay, it's a child who is having difficulty in breathing, you identify, okay, it's a bad patient, get him to the resuscitation bed. So identify that it's a bad patient, get to the proper area to manage that in the proper time. So you don't wait until you see all the patients, you triage and prioritize this patient and see that patient turning. And then which position should I put the patient in? Okay, difficulty in breathing. So most of the times you prop them up for them to help, you know, for them to uh, breathe easily, right? Then you do your initial stabilization. He's having difficulty in breathing. The airway looks okay. And then you give him oxygen and look at, assess this uh, circulation. See whether he's in shock. Yes, he's in shock as well, right? Then you give a bolus and then you take a quick history. So you did your triage, you position the patient, and then you do the joint initial stabilization, airway breathing, circulation, visibility. And then you identified, okay, there was breathing difficulty, gave oxygen, and identified there was shock, gave a bolus of normal saline. And then your director history. So there are an examination. So you see that there is a bit of a articular rash on his body. So you think, okay, shock and difficulty in breathing, and there are there is an articular rash. Could it be anaphylaxis? Then you ask the mother, are there any, is there any previous history of? Uh, allergies or anaphylaxis, yes, then the mother says, yes, there is food allergy. Then you commence your specific treatment, which is IM mandatory. So that's the order that you will go in, go in, right? So triaging, positioning, airway breathing, circulation, disability, that is your initial stabilization. That's the third thing. Then a quick directed history and examination. Then you start your specific therapy. So those are your five stages of uh, your structured approach, right? So we go one by one now. So as I said earlier, sorting out patients according to the urgency of their illness. So imagine a child who's going to get arrested very soon, who is having a status epilepticus or impending respiratory, uh, respiratory will come in the red area. That is, it's an imminent life-threatening image. You have to give attention to that child then and there. Otherwise, it's, it's going to cost his life, right? So immediate uh, uh, management is required. Then you get a child who is breathing very hard, 
but not going to get arrested immediately. But sets are dropping 92, 93, but a very good uh, effect is there. It's an acute severe asthma, right? So this one is also is an urgent patient which you need to address very quickly, but not as bad as the one who was already in respiratory risk. So this one would go in the orange, like the traffic light system, red, orange, right? Prioritized, but not, you know, it doesn't need immediate treatment like the, the, the previous one. Then, of course, you have a child who is uh, having some amount of dyspnea, but sets are good. He can speak in sentences. He's very comfortable. Saturation is fine, but his breathing fast needs nebulization. But he's prioritized in the, uh, in, probably in the green uh, area compared to the other two. So red, orange, and green according to the urgency of the areas, right? So again, so the red patient, you get them to the recess bed, right? Then um, the orange patient got, get to the next uh, priority bed, right? Then the green one can wait for a while, right? So this saves lives because you, we would have heard those days when we had dengue epidemics, sometimes ill-looking patients wait in line to get the full blood count done not to be seen by the OPD doctor. While waiting in line, they just collapse because of shock, compensated shock, and then they are brought to the ETU. So that could be avoided by triaging the patient appropriately in your OPD, right? Then, of course, positioning them. So you detected it's a bad patient. Now you have to get them to the proper bed. So you now a child with breathing difficulty, a status asthmatic, a pneumonia, serious strido, right? And keep them propped up because the abdominal viscera, if you lie, make them lie down, the abdominal viscera will go up and obstruct the, the diaphragm, right? The, 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 it will uh, uh, impinge on the diaphragm and prevent free movement of the diaphragm. So that causes their difficulty in breathing to increase. But if you prop them up, all the abdominal viscera will come down and then you'll have you know, ease of breathing. Uh, but of course, patients with strido, you have to be very careful, especially with epiglottitis and even severe uh, croup, right? Let them maintain their own airway. Don't try to, you know, handle them too hard because all of a sudden, if they go into a laryngus passive, they could end up with a respiratory arrest, right? And then, of course, neurological patients, if they are fitting, put them in left lateral position, right? So a patient with a shock, you put them in uh, legs elevated position. Why? Because you want the blood to come to the vital organs like the brain, the heart, right, which are in the upper torso, not in the lower region, right? Not in, not towards the legs, right? So even without uh, a good blood supply, your, your lower limbs will, will uh, survive, but not the brain, right? So they'll end up with cerebral palsy. So you identify that this patient has shock, put them in a leg elevated position where all the blood will try to get pulled around your vital structures, right? Then again, I'm sure you would have discussed in the previous lecture, uh, how you keep a patient with raised ICP, you keep the head elevated. Why? Because you want the, the blood to drain quickly away from the brain, right? The, to help venous return. So if you keep them elevated at an angle of about 25 to 30 degrees, um, the, the, the venous drainage will be helped with gravity, right? You prop them up. If you lie them down, venous drainage is not good. So then there will be venous engorgement and uh, aggravation of uh, intracranial pressure, right? So that's why you do that. Uh, now we have discussed about triaging, positioning, and now you come to the pediatric assessment triangle where do you do your initial ABCD approach. I'm sure you'd have gone through all this in the morning, so I don't want to waste a lot of time, but just a quick run through. So any, any bad child, so let it be a conversion, let it be a child with breathing difficulty, let it be a child who is unconscious, right? Uh, let it be a child who is in shock, right? Any sort of a bad, serious ill child after you have identified in the triage and after you have positioned them properly, you go through in this fashion. So airway, quickly go through the airway, see whether there's any obstruction, any visible foreign body, any secretions, see whether the tongue is falling back, try to maintain the, the head in the, the airway in the best possible manner, say in an in a infant is a neutral position. In a bigger child, it would be the stiff in the rose position, right? Then after you address the RV, suck out secretions, clear the RV, or you might need to input oral RV, like a good RV. After you have done all that oropharyngeal RV, you have stabilized that then you, for breathing. In breathing, there are two main things. One is the work of breathing, you assess, depending on the effort and the efficacy. So effort is measured by the respiratory rate and the rhythm. So you, 
see whether there are recessions, whether he is having a gasping type of breathing, whether he is getting exhausted. That will tell you about the effect of breathing. And then, of course, the airway noises. You will hear the two or three important noises there. One is the grunt. So, grunt is when you are breathing against the closed glottis. Like, <coughs> like that. So, you are trying to close your glottis and exhale against a closed glottis so that at the end of the expiration noise, you try to maintain some amount of pressure inside the lungs. That is because lungs are good always liable to get collapsed when you have pneumonia or some sort of a issue in your lungs. Lungs are not good. They are all, always ready to get collapsed. But when you close the glottis and <coughs> breathe like that, uh, lungs are kept aerated even at the end of expiration. Right? So grunt is a very, very bad sign. You have to be very careful because any moment they could end up with a respiratory arrest. So you have to always be careful. This is a patient who requires respiratory support, maybe CPAP, maybe a high flow, maybe intubation, right? Uh, so you have to be very careful with that. And then of course, uh, strido, as we all know, it's mostly inspiratory strido that we come across. So these are obstructions in the large airways. So when you have, a, say, a croup, allergic croup, or a viral croup, language bronchitis, or even epiglottitis, right? They will breathe like, <coughs> like that. So it's a more of a you know, very coarse voice, right? And so, in that case, you have to be very careful again, because this is an imminent line. If there's respiratory distress also associated with it, you have to be very worried. Because now, in, in case this patient collapsed, uh, goes into respiratory arrest, intubating them would be a nightmare, because it's a, it's a, you know, it's not a, the upper airway is obstructed. That's why you're hearing this airway, and the patient, if there are recessions, and if he's getting exhausted, if he gets arrested, if he requires intubation, you will need an expert in intubation like an anesthetist, right? In the theater, probably with gas induction. So you have to be very careful in a patient like this. And the other thing, of course, is an audible voice where uh, you, even without the stethoscope, you hear wrong kind, right? And then, of course, flaring of uh, nostrils, LNS flaring is again indicative of pneumonia and child's position, like a tripod position, which is maintained in case of um, epiglottitis, right? Then, of course, coming to effect of breathing, um, chest expansion, right? See whether the chest expansion is good. And if the eye entry is not good, again, you need to worry. So, asthmatic, you don't hear the eye entry, then you need to be worried about that patient. Could be a silent chest. So, that means the obstruction is so bad, not even a bit of air is going into the lungs. That's why you're not hearing the wrong eye. So, you have to be a bit careful with this child. And then, of course, uh, the, 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 the most helpful thing would be saturation, right? So, uh, any saturation below 94% in air should concern you. Okay, This is a child who has a compromised breathing mechanism. You need to worry. And then, of course, the tracheal position in case of pneumothorax, right? Uh, effusions, you need to worry about that. Abdominal breathing, again, indicative of uh, diaphragmatic breathing, right? So, these all will tell you it's a child with uh, respiratory compromise. Then, of course, go into circulation. You will have a full lecture on this. So, I'll just touch upon the main things. So, uh, cold and clammy extremities. Uh, if you see in a child with shock, so you look for the cold line, right? When you have a patient, so you go uh, like this, feel for the, for, the, for the cold line. So, if the cold line is here towards the periphery, that patient is better off than a patient with a cold line somewhere here, right? So, uh, cold line occurs because... Uh, now, to preserve blood supply to the vital organs, um, the cutaneous blood supply is cut off. So, that amount of blood is cut off from the skin and given to the vital organs like the brain, the kidneys, the heart, the liver, right? So, that's why the, the peripheries are cold. So, if you have a child with cold peripheries, of course, with high VWAS, you can get that, but need to be alert. And then, of course, the pulse rate. Tachycardia would be the first thing uh, that would indicate it's a, a, a compromised circulation. And then the pulse volume again, uh, low volume pulse in shock. But of course, in cases of, uh, uh, say, anaphylactic shock and septic shock, right? Yeah, you would have uh, uh, a maldistributive shock. That is, the vessels are, the, the, the circulating volume is the same, but vessels are extremely dilated, right? So, vessels are dilated, but the blood volume is the same. So, the diastolic pressure drops. So, with such patients, you will go into what is called warm shock, where the blood pressure 
with the systolic pressure might be normal or slightly low, right? But there is a very wide pass pressure. So systolic pressure is generally on the lower side, but there's a very wide pass pressure and peripheries are warm, unfortunately. And pulses would be very bounding, bounding pulse, right? So bounding pulse, warm peripheries, systolic pressure is the only one which is low, but a wide pass pressure, think of septic shock, think of anaphylactic shock, right? So that is where you would miss shock because the only thing that will tell you that it's shock is the systolic pressure, which is lower than normal, right? Okay, so that is one thing which you need to be very careful about, warm shock, anaphylaxis and septic shock. Then of course, the capillary refill time, uh, when there is a cold shock, the capillary refill time will be prolonged. Cold peripheries, capillary refill, you count as 1 in 1,000, 2 in 1,000, like that you press for 5 seconds and let go of uh, 5, uh, let go and count how many seconds uh, it takes to fill the area which was blanched. So if it's less than 2 seconds, it's well and good, but if it's more than that, it's a prolonged capillary refill. Again, it's because of a cut of cutaneous blood supply. Cold line I have discussed. And then the blood pressure again, very important in case of uh, some types of shock, where the systolic pressure would be normal, but only thing is a narrow pulse pressure, right? The diastolic blood pressure is high, higher than normal, but systolic pressure is normal. So the, the pulse pressure is uh, exactly uh, less than 20. So what sort of a shock is that? Anyone can put up in the chat box, so if you see a patient, uh, no major cold peripheries, but a tachycardia is there and systolic pressure is normal, but uh, the diastolic pressure is higher than normal. So as a result, you get a narrow pulse pressure. What sort of a shock is that? Yes, exactly. So dengue shock. So remember, those are the, uh, those are the things that you need to worry about, the, the exceptions. So in case of dengue shock, uh, the initial bit, uh, uh, the, the compensated shock, there will be narrow pulse pressure, right? And in, in uh, septic shock and anaphylactic shock, you will go, you will see a warm shock where you will have, not, not always, but sometimes you can have cold shock as well with those types, but you could have warm shock where the pulses are bounding, a wide pulse pressure, warm peripheries, but the systolic pressure is lower than normal. So to look at the normal systolic pressure for that age, you will have to look at centile charts and a rough guide would be, uh, 70 plus age into two. So we'll say a six-year-old, uh, the lowest blood pressure for a six-year-old, according to this calculation is 70 plus age into two. So 70 plus age into two, six into two is 12. So that would be 82. So a six-year-old with a blood pressure lower than 80, you need 80 or 82, you need to be worried. So you better call your seniors and ask, is this normal? Always compare with the normogram for blood pressures, okay? And another question someone does, if a patient presented foreign body obstruction with hypoxia, but the foreign body is in area which we can't simply remove it, what should we do? So there is a, the foreign body algorithm. I'm sure you would have gone through it uh, in the morning. Uh, so you have to go according to that. If it's an unconscious patient with foreign body and hypoxia, you go ahead with CPR. And of course, if it's not hypoxia, he has in the effective cough, you let him cough it out. If he has an ineffective cough, you go ahead with back dose and chest thrust. Of course, that doesn't help. You have to get get in, get, get in the ENT guys and get it out. Okay. Uh, okay. Can't we take hypovolemic shock as an example for increase? That's uh, what is it? That's like blood pressure. Hypovolemic shock. Okay. Yeah. So any, any sort of a shock, the initial uh, bit would be the diastolic pressure will try to go up and compensate. Right. Uh, but dengue shock is the classic one. But of course, in other types of shock causes, that would be the first thing. But you know, it won't last long. So most of the times, you will see the systolic pressure also crashing. But of course, if the pass pressure is narrow, always take it as a compensated shock, right? Provided your blood pressure um, uh, measurement is correct, your 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 machine is right. Okay, right. So go to the next one. So you were, you had already discussed about uh, disability, right? Uh, so conscious level uh, posture, pupillary science, right? You had discussed about it. So you have to identify whether it's a potential respiratory failure, circular pressure, or, or a CNS failure. So depending on that, address the most important one first, right? Airway, breathing, circulation, okay? 
right now now just is going to be a bit interactive but unfortunately this video does not play in my computer so you will have to like sort of imagine things right so it's going to be difficult so imagine this baby so you are the sho in the, in the pediatric ward and you are called to the et to see this baby who is uh, who is having difficulty in breathing so there are recessions right so i'll say there are subcostal intercostal recessions uh, he's may largely managing the saturation right uh, with oxygen right uh, and you have to inform so it's a bronchiolitis patient right recessions are there he's managing a, a saturation of about 96 with 2 liters of nasal prong oxygen right uh, it's a bronchiolitis bilateral crepitations but there is one thing so now this is around 2 o'clock 2 a.m in the morning so you would want to call your boss your consultant and tell okay there's a patient like this now what should i do like i mean uh, so the, the, the consultant is also sleepy so when you are giving your your account of this patient there is one thing that I really want you to highlight after seeing this baby. So that thing will alert the, because I say saying that saturation is 97 with oxygen and bronchiolitis. That's a normal picture. The respiratory rate was not, might be fantastically high. But this one thing which tells you that this patient is very bad, right? I want you to see his face. And if you look at it, what tells you that this baby is like, you know, seriously ill, which would require either HDU or a, uh, sort of ICU care for this patient. When you look at the face, what can you see? What is the most worrying thing when you see this patient? Look at his eyes and see, and just put up in the chat box. What would you see? Bronchiolitis. Yes, someone had put it up. Cyanosis, sunken eyes. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something to do with the, the, the general condition. If you look at his face, so effects on other systems, hypoxia effects on other systems, drowsy, exactly. So that's what I'm looking for. Floppy, yours, yes, I agree. Those things are right. Not alert, drowsy. That's what I want. So there is a hypoxia which is affecting the CNS as well. So a drowsy baby is always ill, right? So always Ill. soon after conversion, of course, they can be drowsy. But this child with bronchiolitis, who is drowsy, you are worried. So when you tell your consultant is a drowsy baby with bronch bronchiolitis that will alert him and will get him up from sleep and would want to, to will give you proper instructions to go ahead with whatever you want. Okay. Then next one. Right. Okay. This, this baby again, a small baby, I will say less than a month, a, a three week old baby coming is in your HDU. And you want to again inform regarding this patient, right? And you see there are subcostal recessions, right? What one sign, right? Again, this video does not play. So what is the sign that you would look for? So recessions are there, but then you can't see in small babies. Sometimes recessions you won't see. But there is one sign affecting the head neck area, which would tell you this baby is using his accessory muscle very badly and will require support, uh, breathing support. What would be that? Like, can someone put up in the chat box? If you look at his head and neck area, any sign that would tell you, okay, this baby is like, you know, yes, head nodding or head bobbing. Very good. Yes. So always, if there is head bobbing, head nodding, right, even without proper decisions, be alert. It's a very bad patient. Good. Very good. Okay. Now we'll go to the next video. Unfortunately, they don't play, right? So this again, now you are called to the ETU again. You run and see this baby. And uh, you see that this, when you do the AVE, AVE is fine. But when you look at the breathing, breathing is a gasping type of breathing. Effect is not very good. Saturation is around 96, 97 with oxygen, but his breathing pattern is not good. It's a gasping type of breathing. What would you do? Will you call your seniors or will you give, uh, give a face mask oxygen? Will you... Uh, what is the what is the intervention that, that you are going to do immediately if it's a gasping type of breathing? Is effort respiratory effort is not good. So uh, can someone uh, think because you are the pediatric SHO and patient is gasping? What do you want to do now? Immediate thing. Okay. Airway protection. Okay. So what would you want to do? Check or so we'll say oh, no obstruction. We we'll say no obstruction. Yeah, is fine. So what is the most important thing that you want to do? What is the problem? He's not breathing. So what is the problem? Will 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 positioning him positioning might help for breathing. But, but here I would say he's gasping. Gasping means 
his 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 mechanical factors are failing his respiratory muscles are not working so even if you position him he is exhausted he is going to go into respiratory arrest so what would you want to do now what is the thing that you want to do giving oxygen will not help right okay checking pulse will not help he is not he is going to stop yes ambient ventilation that's the most important thing to do because his whole respiratory is is muscles are not working he is not air into the lungs so you need to give positive pressure ventilation ambient ventilation right you call your seniors and all that you ask someone as to do those are parallel processes but you go ahead with ambient ventilation that's the most important thing to do right very good okay now i'll run through the other slides slides quickly okay disability issue we have already discussed okay um, so parallel processes so as you are doing your abc and all that right you ask your nurses to check the blood sugar do the temperature connect them to a monitor pass oximeter ecg monitor these are parallel process so while you are assessing the airway breathing circulation you ask someone as do this thing so very important right and then of course you chart them in this chart um, these charts are age specific right so your normal values are according to the ages so you would know whether you are doing the right thing or not so you have a bad asthmatic you give a back to back name his respiratory rate is coming down sets are going up you are doing the right thing so you don't need to worry so much you go ahead with your plan but uh, you are asthmatic you have given your back to back name but the respiratory rate is still the same sets are not good you go to the next step you give iv magnesium sulfate so that this charts this charts will help you to decide whether to escalate or deescalate right and then these are the normal values according to the ages and of course history as i said earlier what sort of history to take ample is the pneumonic allergies medications past medical history last meal events surrounding injury right then your head to toe examination quickly right your secondary survey and emergency management right and then uh, okay as i said earlier a child who has come in shock strido you head to toe examination reveals urticarial rash okay could be anaphylaxis then go ahead with your specific management give im adrenaline right it's acute laryngotracheobronchitis give dexamethasone and uh, if it's epiglottitis get to get your anesthetic colics urgent intubation and gas induction right if it's a foreign body video laryngoscopy right so likewise snake bite until and anticipate snake venom anti snake venom is not good well right and this is how we are going to handle you have stabilized done your initial stabilization patient is stable now you want to hand over to the icu or to maybe a hdu in a ward so how you are going to do is call the is bar system i means you identify your assessor i am the pediatric sho dr so and so the situation is this is a child with anaphylactic shock who had come with strido and hypotension right and he also had a past history of uh, uh, food allergies uh, and one episode of anaphylaxis right and today when he came his blood pressure was this much right and his pulse rate was this much and we had given him i am madly now his uh, parameters are these his blood pressure is fine and our recommendations are to close him monitor him and repeat i am madly as and when necessary every 5 minutes right so uh, and and then you ask from the intensivist or the consultant on the other side is there anything else that you want us to do as your recommendation so it's a joint recommendation you do that and hand over the patient safely okay so that brings uh, uh, to an end of my presentation so are there any questions or are you i'm sure you are clear with it because this is the same protocol so don't forget the blueprint um, so triage uh, triage them position them your initial assessment is airway breathing circulation disability then you do a quick history and a quick examination head to toe head to toe examination then give specific therapy like anti snake venom i am adrenaline whatever iv antibiotics in case of infection right then after you do your initial stabilization hand over for ongoing care okay so thank you very much i'm sure you are very tired after a very long day and so tomorrow lectures will start again uh, so i'm sure uh, you will learn a lot tomorrow as well so log in around 8:15 please so uh, we close the session for today uh, thank you very much is there a question which one sir yeah so don't be you need to intubate but intubation we need to intubate a gasping child but 
first of all, straight away you don't because intubation takes time. You have to get your equipment. You need to get a laryngoscope, right? So first of all, you bag and mask. You when get your bag, the ambu bag and get the mask and you start bagging. So if you are having a good airway position and if you are bagging properly with the correct technique. It's good as into that you have intubated. So you get get them pre-oxygenated, get all the the equipment ready, right? Get an assistant, then you go ahead and intubate, right? So straight away you don't try to jump and intubate because the child will become further hypoxic. That's why you try to first bag and mask, stabilize, get the saturation, pre-oxygenate, then you intubate. Okay, I hope uh, I'm clear on that. So thank you very much. Log in tomorrow at eight fifteen. So have a pleasant day, right? Okay, thank you.